Sirius XM. Sirius XM. It's the best of the week. You're in mourning, though. Oh. We can understand. You're in mourning, yeah. Stel. You're no, 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 no I'm not in mourning. Man, everyone comes out to you and says, oh, what you did. Um, well, I mean, he was very important to you, yes. obviously, and uh, we heard the stories over the years. So when your dad passed, it was like, wow. A lot of people, a lot of people came out of the woodwork, and thank you both for reaching out. Yeah. Here's how it went down. I'm filming something in L.A., you know, some some pilot, and then um, got the call. Hey, uh, your dad's, your dad got a massive stroke. My wife called D call. She's like. Jim, uh, he had a massive stroke. I said, okay. He said, no, this one, he's, uh, you might want to come home for this one. So, you know, I come home. Yeah, he's mangled. He can't, he can't open his eyes or talk. However, and I'm really glad this happened. When I got there, he started, you know, I first looked at him and, oh, God, this is bad. Um, I started Busting his balls, like right off the bat. I said, so you can't talk, huh? And t- hearing my voice, he turned his head. And then I said, um, I'm going, Dad, you, you can't move your mouth or nothing? And he's trying to talk. No, listen, I don't give a shit if you can talk. Can you still use your weenie? And I swear to, God, I swear to God, his eyes opened up, and he started trying to smile. And I want to have a big whore coming, a fat whore on the way. And he started, his eyes opened up, and he started, like, trying not, trying to laugh. And try, uh, uh, uh. And I said, do you want black? Do you want Asian? Or a fat one? My problem is, if you have a fat one, I'm afraid she'll break your head. And he just, he, he was up. He was up and trying to move, but they said, listen, it's tube you can keep him on the tube for a couple months. But nah, man, no tube. He's done. Right. And so they said, uh, all right, put him in hospice. And we're not nah, bringing him to my house. They said he would never get better from there, right? Well, you know, he has dementia. He's 91. They said they'll give him this medicine where sometimes it works. It could take months. Like, you know, that's... No. Mm-hmm. Uh, and now he's a feeding tube. That's crazy. And I have to go in there and talk about whores and money every day as much as possible right. to keep them going. I mean, yes, we're done. <clears throat> so I bring him home, and this is, this is what I tell everyone. Uh, the ho- my whole life, my biggest, the biggest breakdowns you have and the biggest sob sessions and the fear is all leading up to that moment. And even even when it came time, like I was watching, and I, I knew it was getting worse, and and uh, you know, giving him the morphine, all that jazz. The breathing starts. You're you're watching him, and you know he's gonna die soon. I I didn't shower or nothing, so I just stayed there nonstop. I, brought, I got him home on Saturday night. Uh, he passed Monday night at ten, but. At Monday night, about nine o'clock, my nephew starts busting. My nephew's over there. He's like, "He's still, he's still alive because you smell. You need to shower." And like, everyone's laughing and joking. So I took a shower at uh, nine thirty and came out of the shower. It was like nine forty, and I just came to the kitchen. And my youngest daughter is like, "Oh, Dad's got it. Grandpa's got his eyes open." What up? Oh no! So I went in there, and this was the ver- this was the ending. And so, you know, I jumped in bed, and you know, held him, and talked to him the whole way through. And when he went, you sobbed for like thirty seconds. But I, I have to admit, a- after it was over, you get this. I had this calm of it's it's over. A relief. Yes, right. hundred percent relief. There, it was just. That's it. My whole fear, all my life, was so much worse leading up to that moment. So many times I, on the road, I'd, I'd sob, like, please don't let him be alone. Please, am I, am, I, am I away too much? Should I be around? Should I be at home? Is he all right with this, this lady that watches him? Please don't let him. I just want to be there. I just want to hold him. It's, it, it's terrible to say. Anyone else, I'm probably like, yeah, I'll take the phone call. Uh-huh. Where... With him, I just wanted that moment, and I got the moment. And uh, 
I, I'm really settled. Now, the it's it's interesting once that happens, how everyone else is. Mm-hmm. You know, he's he's got he, t- t- little drama. This one, <laughs> you start seeing. <clears throat> you know, maybe this guy only sees him once every three years, and he's the guy sobbing. Yeah. Uncontrollably. Uncontrollably. Bringing your sadness down to a, a lower level than where you were at. And I'm not, I never got sad. I still don't. Right. You know, once in a while, I, I thought I would never be able to look at a picture. I thought I, I was the one going, okay, we're going to use this picture and that picture. And we're going to play that video. Now, one, one cool thing, and I think I'm going to, I'm definitely going to put it out there. It was real, because everyone that watched it was really moved by it. One of his last moments, um, I didn't realize it. I was talking and bantering and getting heavy with him and being funny. <clears throat> I heard like a little bit of sobbing and turning on. My wife was videotaping on, on her iPad. I'm like, what, what are you doing? She's like, that was the most healing, beautiful thing. You just gotta put, you just gotta put that out there. I can't believe what I just watched. She's like, we should have, part of her is goes, I wish the whole world saw how you took that process to the end. It would have, because now more and more people coming up to me like, how did you do that? I'm going through that with my mom. I'm going through that with my dad. Mm. How did you go in the bed? It's it's not that. It's not bad. It's it's. Uh, I'd rather do that. You're right. gonna do what you gotta do. Yeah, I'd much rather do that. Right. Than get that freaking phone call. Right. Could he hear you when his eyes were open? You think? Oh, I think he definitely. He definitely. Because when, now when I look at the video, I see him. I see him locking in. And, and look right. in my way. And even when he'd smile. But towards the end, I learned so much from this. You know, I, I had these, I had these, uh, notions of, you know, when he's gone, I'm gonna take the ashes and I'm gonna fly here and all the places we've been. And <clears throat> the minute he was gone, I realized, man, all, all that stuff is just for us. It's just, it's just for us. Mm-hmm. It's just gone. He's out of here. It's in the abyss. As it's just, it's just for us. People get caught up in this whole like, oh, I got the ritual mm-hmm. of it. Yeah, I right. got to do this. I got to do that. I got to <laughs> go on the Empire State Building and let the ashes go. My father would have loved that. No, you would have loved it. Right. You're the one that loves it. I'm gonna go to Mount Everest and. I, I agree with you. You know, and I. Uh, you don't realize it. I I think that's more for people that are unsettled, that weren't there. That went, damn it, I should have, I should have. Mm-hmm. Oh, he would like it. And, you know, even going to a gravesite, it's all for us. I agree. It's just for us. Your mom so, is alive, right? Yeah, oh, my God. How did she handle this? <sighs> Boy, did I get some repercussions after the last time I was on here. Oh, really? Yeah, sorry. I don't know. I thought I had my ringer off. Sorry about that. From, um, from her? No. Sister. <laughs> oh, yeah, the rooster. <laughs> Oh, dude, I forgot I even did all that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I forgot that too. Well, let me... <laughs> I'm glad you smiled. Oh, man, come on. She's, uh, she's well, got to understand. Uh, well, she's got to have a sense of humor. That was, that was oh, hilarious. Oh, <laughs> what that oh, man, it was like the whole UN came after me. Mm-hmm. Um, For the people that weren't listening, you know, Jimmy came in here with some... <laughs> First of all, with some tapes from his mom. The tapes of the mom were heavy, right? It was amazing. And then you might have been since, saying some bad things about your sister. Yeah, since <laughs> since <laughs> since then, I forgot the whole rooster. I forgot. Every, I don't remember. I was just seeing red. I was just seeing red. Wine. Yeah, I was seeing red. Wine. Yeah, I was pissed. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so what, were that's the re- okay. what were the repercussions? Now, <laughs> since then, my mom is much better. She's in uh, assisted living. She's totally better. She's ninety percent there. You you so thought she, you thought at the time that she had a urinary uh, she did track infection that was causing a lot more she of the did. dementia. She did right. So now she's she's pretty much there and better. <clears throat> they have her on great drugs, great drugs. And now she's. She takes everything under control. Like she, she, everything makes sense. Yeah, no, that's no. You're here for this is it. You're here, but she's clear. Mm-hmm. She's she's clear. Maybe ten, fifteen percent uh, dementia now. Not bad. No, not at all. Not compared to the tapes we played last time. And then, 
the whole family came to me and they're like, listen, the radio thing was bad news. <laughs> 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 and I was still, I was still really mad. I'm like, well, you know, I I got mugged, and people don't like the way the mugger is reacting. What is that? All? Nah, he says some things. He says some things. We got some things. We got to sit down. We got to fix yeah. this thing. Disrespect him a little bit. Nah, he little said, bit, yeah, a little, little bit, bit, a little bit. Outside of family's one thing. Yeah, you gotta. Uh, so I apologized to. Eh, I mean, I went down the line. I went from. From nieces to nephew, you name it, I went to one, every single individual. Like, ah, I shouldn't have put that, I shouldn't have put that, and I shouldn't have put that. Um, so that was all mended. And then since then, mm. oh, dude. Remember I was talking about the other one? Yeah. <sighs> there, there was two, there was two sisters. One of my sister. Yeah. Uh, now we're not going to go into. Well, I shouldn't yeah. bring this because we're going to go into. I don't want keep this to become vague. a. Yeah, keep it vague. Do we owe you an apology? No. <laughs> okay. <'cause>, no. 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 Because <laughs> it was crazy. But radio. everything <laughs> happened after that freaking show. <laughs> about a week. About a week and a half later. Yeah. Uh, later, my mom's in the uh, assistant living, and she's okay. My one sister gets diagnosed stage four lung. The cancer's in her neck. It's wrapped around her. It's in her. It's on her spine. It's that. Yeah, she's it's, right. It's the blasting her with chemo and this and that. She just broke her hip. But we haven't told my mother yet. We're gonna. You know, we'll see how this plays out. Stage four. Yes, stage four. So that's that's heavy. How old is she? She's fifty nine. Oh. Yeah. You know, smoking, smoking. So it's one of those. Uh, wow, oh, sorry to hear, man. Well, you know, what do you, you know, what can you do? So you just sit there and go. Phew. So everyone's just grasping for straws. Like, hey, go see this guy in India. Go see. Uh, there's someone in Iowa that was this and that, and you know, you just do what you can. How's she handling it? She's phenomenal. She's got her hopes high, and she's gonna make it. That's her uh, thing, and you know that's the way everyone looks at it. Oh, people, stage four, you make it, you can make it. Um, so you know they're all, all that fell down after that. Jesus, yeah. <laughs> holy berserker! <laughs> wow, yeah, that so is heavy. Yeah, it's all heavy, but uh, I'm playing the Motorhead Cruise. No, dude, I'm looking for a laugh. That's very uh, funny. No, I'm actually <laughs> psyched to hear that. <laughs> you're, you're insane. You're fucking like, crazy. where do you go you're after crazy. that? crazy. Where do you go after that? No, seriously, don't no, sit. I was actually there. looking to see if that was on there. Yeah, no, 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 no. I, I thought yeah. it was a real thing. No, 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 no. It sounds like No, it is a real thing, but that's not what I'm... thing to do. Yeah, no, no, no. I'm not here for that. So, But why do you have to apologize to nieces and nephews? Oh, I guess because it was their parents you were kind of... Yes. Got it now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I did what I had to do. You know, you, 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 still, you do what what we've said over the years. You go, hey, uh, <laughs> yeah, right. So I, you, you got to say, I pump it up for the radio. You know, that, right, that's and always I, been my I, out I over did, the years. I was hopped up, and like, I said, I, I shouldn't pump it up for the radio. I Don't did. worry about it. I forgot the rooster thing. That was kind of. <laughs> <We got it. laughs> so anyway. We're uh, we're str we're, we're striving along, man. We're now, striving along. Now your wife, um, yeah, yeah, filmed the last moments of your dad's life. Then, no, or pretty close. About the day before, and it was um, wow. It's just so funny. Even to the end of his death, the only thing that kept him going was whores and money. You mentioned whores, he'd light up. You mentioned money, he'd light up. Because then I started buzz. You know, the day before, and he was still kind of. I think he was a conscious. Mm. Because he would do certain things he'd react to, and he'd look over at me. I would say, you know, I'd start going, "Dad, if you can get, if you can get a boner, I'll give you fifteen hundred dollars cash right now." And he would, you'd see, he's just the way we'd banter. He his mouth is open, and he opened his eyes, and he'd look in my direction, and I say things like, "Okay, if I put you on a bicycle." Can you just, if you could just stand the bike for a second, keep your balance, I'll give you five hundred dollars cash right now. If I bring this horror in, I got a horror outside right now. I'm gonna bring her in. If you could just look at her, 
That stuff, he yeah. still would laugh. Not laugh. But yeah. You know, his way of laughing was, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, that was the laughing. But yeah, wow. whores and money, whores and money. Did you tell your mother that he died or no? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Now, yeah I thought that, now that was interesting, too, is um, right before right before he died, um, my mom, who I thought was delusional by this, right before I, I went on like a, I went away for a little while. And before I went away... I uh, made sure the guy, the, the nurse that looks after my dad would at least pick up my mom while I was away because no one's visiting her. So I came home for two days in between all this, and my mom, I take her to coffee in town, and um, she goes, you know, I, I saw you, I saw dad, and we, we made amends. It was good. We danced. Well, you danced. She goes, yeah, he was he was in the wheelchair, and I get him. We played Frank Sinatra, and I said I loved him, and I said we should move in together and and end our lives together, and and he said he loved me, and I said, and I thought, yeah, okay, uh, sure, yeah, no, yeah, it's okay. What are we on? Triathlon? This stuff's good, right? And now I'm in L.A. I get the call about my dad. I fly home. When I get home to see him in the hospital, the nurse is there. And just before she, she's like, Jeannie, you're not going to believe. I know tell you what happened. And she texts me a picture of my mom and dad where my mom's holding my father. She goes, oh, my God, I never see James do this. Uh, she goes, Doris, your mom, I turn on Frank Sinatra. She got up dance. You got your father get up and he's shrugging his shoulders. They're saying they love each other. And they said they should spend their lives. I thought she was delusional. Wow. This, this really went down? Wow. Because she told me, and I didn't, I didn't believe this at all. Yeah. She's like, no, no. And James was really coherent with her. And wow. I said, really? So that was kind of a, I think that was another bizarre, okay closure, even for me. Yeah, sure. Where, where now, right before it happened, those two. It's her parents. She went to my dad, made him at, so she sat with him too. Not to the very end. But uh, as much as she could, because right. she does, you know, turn into a werewolf about six, seven o'clock. Yeah. She's got this sundowning thing, and hair starts growing on her <laughs> chin, and she starts howling at the moon. That's a real thing, huh? I've heard about it over yeah, the years. Yeah, sundowning. It's so weird. It's howling at the moon. As soon as the sun goes down, man. And they all say the it's get... really, it's the moon. It's some weird access. It is some weird energy. I mean, no one can explain it. Why does it happen to them at that time? Right. And then the next morning, they're relatively better. Yeah, they get up and there they go. Was so, your mom emotional when he passed? Or? No, not at all. Not, not at all. And then the weird stuff happens is my dad had three... Three blood kids. I'm a blood kid, too. Where you start running into weirdness is now you have to... Li you know, I don't want anything to do with listing all the parents, the kids and the grandkids and this and that and the bing and the bang. Um, so you get in little weird things like I didn't like being named a stepchild. <clears throat> you know, I start hearing that at the wake. Like, oh, you know, he's, he's, he's mentioned the stepchildren. I'm like... Well, what? Well, legally, that's right. Like, what do you want me to do? Right. Do you feel like you're a child? Because if you do, well, then you're a child. Right. It's what you feel. If I'm if I'm having a wedding, and I hire two best men, the reason why I hired two best men because I knew the one guy's really my best man, but the other guy, he's going to be like, I can't believe you didn't invite me to be your best man. But the guy who's the other best man knows. Right. I'm the real best of man. Course. You know, if you if you right. have a stepmother or father and it's your parents growing up and it's over like he left his stepchild, I'm not gonna be offended by that because I know in my heart, whatever, eh, I was a child. Right. They treat me like that. Just so, making it official. But people get yeah. people get all yeah. shabinged out. I was and, as much a son to him as you and Mike. <laughs> and, and that's and that's I heard those were I'm I'm on my house on Saturday and I hear that going on. Right. I'm like Really? This is where you're at now? All right. Well, I, I, I can't get into all that, and I hope you feel better, but I'm not getting into that. That's just no, unnecessary trauma. Unnecessary roughness. That's unnecessary what, roughness. That's just what it says on the card or in the paper. It doesn't really Whatever. matter. You know what's really funny, too? In the prayer card, we, we would laugh because on his prayer card, you know, if you go to a funeral, there's a prayer card. Right. You walk in, there's a, so people would pick up the prayer cards, a picture of them, but on the back were... 
all his sayings. So anyone like really religious, or whatever, we're like, look at this stuff's kind. Because on the back it say, "Go get laid, <laughs> go play with your weenie, go shit your hat, go fuck yourself." So <laughs> some of the, some of the best parts of the funeral was waiting. We're like, oh, this guy's this, these people are really cat. Like, watch this, and you see them pick up the car and then turn, and they go from tears like, oh my god, this is so, oh my god, go fuck yourself. Why would you? And then um, there was there was also at the wi- now at my house I a bag. But the most emotional part was the navy showing up. Because he was a World War II vet and bagpipers and stuff like that. So at my house now, we're having a party. I'm playing Johnny Cash and all that jazz. You know, these people are upset because of whatever was on a piece of paper. And these people, whatever. For the most part, everyone's having a great time. But we started off the whole thing. I took me and his two other sons. And my father would start off every party like this, especially after he caught a buzz. So we got, we ran everyone up. And I literally got repercussions for like two or three people from, for doing this. But it's the two or three people you go, you know, I, I'm not going to see you again, so I really don't care. And you fully expected it anyway. Yeah, from, I already expected it. Like, like, right, you know these two are going to I'm not going to see you again anyway, Whatever. so right. I don't know what to tell you. And it wasn't for you anyway. So everyone gathers around his kids and went, listen, if you have kids, I'm already I'm already apologizing. So I'm just telling you right now, you're going to cover their ears, and we know you know this is my this is our father, a great man, blah blah blah, funniest person we ever knew. We're, let's start off the party the way he'd always want to start off the party, and we go. Here's James Brewer, you know, born in '23, gone in 2000. What he would always like, let's give him a nice hymn, and we and what he would always do, he'd go. Like he'd go to what's your name, Jimmy? Jimmy Norton. Everybody, this is Jim Norton, and we're gonna welcome him with a nice hymn. He go him, him, fuck him. <laughs> now go get you something to drink, asshole, and lay your weapons on the table. What's and wrong then, with that? And, oh my god! So half the places. Everybody doesn't know what's going on because we're going to him. We're like him, <laughs> and we got to the fuck him. The whole place just erupted, except for the you know two or three. Like oh my god, that is just you don't say fuck him at a funeral. I mean that's just horrible. It's a World War Two vet. They're right, saying right. fuck him. I, mean, I liked it until that part. Right. Yeah. Well, no, I loved it to that part because I realized you're not at that. Did be they seen again? Voice their objections to you, or you heard through third to me. parties Ew. to me. To you. I really enjoyed it, except for that part. Ugh, they, <laughs> goodbye. I, uh, yeah. they Did you enjoy the ribs and chicken? Good. Yeah. Get out of here. Right. They they couldn't keep it to themselves. <laughs> Get out of here, Just man. Keep it to yourself. Just keep it yourself, <laughs> retard. The no. conversation on the way home. I couldn't believe I couldn't either. That's, That's fine. It's not appropriate. That's fine. It's just not appropriate. <laughs> right. I get off on that, though. I really get off on but that. To have I to enjoy t- that stuff. But to have to tell Brewer. Just Ugh, douchey. You know, I that like that, douchey. though. I'd rather come tell me. Really? Yeah, because then well, I you, least... know you know they're talking, but it's like, all right. I like that. I get off on that stuff. You learn a lot about death when you go through it, man. It's kind of... I feel good. I'm ready, for, I'm ready to take on... Some... I shouldn't say that. You, you feel good about death? No, no, no. Well... well... It's uh, your whole life. I mean, you lost your dad. When you lose your dad, your your life starts changing in perspectives, and you just you're looking at everything differently. And it just it brings you closer to we are not immortal, and right. we are leaving. Right. No matter how many operations you want, no matter what kind of diet we're on, no matter what, you know, you turn the page. There's your name. That's it. You're it's it's your day. Where do we go though? That's a great question, and as my dad always said, what did he think? Yeah. You're not ever gonna be answered because none of these assholes have come back to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's and that's what he'd always say. And I'm like, Dad, you don't believe in God? And he's like, No, I don't. I said, You don't think like you go into at least a, a an energy or a spiritual world? He goes. Well, if you do, you don't come. None of you, nobody's come back to talk about it. <laughs> so who gives a shit? Where's the place up there with four four hundred billion people fucking dressed in eighteen <laughs> hundred? Jesus Christ! So, and, and, but he's also a guy that watched people get slaughtered mm-hmm. and slaughtered. 
So it's just they have a... Who knows? None of us know. It's the best of the week. It's the best of the week. I jerked off to this line probably 70 times in my youth. (laughs) She's laying there in like thigh highs and sexy lingerie. And she said something about... Uh, that bulge in the front of your pants. And to hear a girl say that, I went bananas. And then that, I knew that that was an edited version. And in the real version, she said something like, that cock. She said something so fucking vulgar. I, I that, that fueled. Is not my cock. That fueled my masturbation fantasies. Can we find that line? <laughs> See if you like Nancy Allen. Try to find that line. Nancy Allen you dressed to kill understand. sexy. I'm telling you, you'll find it. It's on YouTube somewhere. Uh, he, he, uh, oh yeah, the, the Jessica just did Michael Caine. <laughs> yeah, it's... You just read about. Do you like doing these things? You have to fast forward Sometimes. a little, Sam. No, let it do go. Like All right. She's wearing a raining out an overcoat. Friends do a pretty good job because they pay me a lot. Oh, she's an escort. These things it's not paid for. Is that a proposal? No. It's what we psychiatrists call a question. Yes. Yes, what? Yes, I do. For men that turn me on. What sort of men turn you on? Uh, my dick would be <sighs> out by this point, cranking, type? ready to go. Like you. I am ready. Because she's wearing a fucking full trench coat right now. And it's Are raining you out. attracted to me? Yes. Are you? Attracted to you? Mm-hmm. Yes. He's looking himself in the mirror. And this isn't a social visit, is it? You come here for help, and my job is to offer you emotional assistance. How about some sexual assistance? Oh. Do you want to fuck me? Oh, yes. Well, why don't you? Because I'm a doctor. I fucked a lot of doctors. And I'm married. Fucked a lot of them, too. Don't you think we're getting <laughs> off the point? I'd be tugging my dick like a fucking chimp <laughs> by this point. No. I know the coat's coming off, and I know what she has under it. Yep, there she goes. Oh, man. Her fucking juicy ass, and she's wearing thigh highs and full panties. Lots of stripes. Yeah. Now, why would you want to do a thing like that? Well, because of the size of that cock in your pants. I don't think you're so married. That's what would make me fucking blow my load all over the place. And the rain is but you blowing. She, but she would say bulge in the in the original thing of that. Right. And I had never seen that, but when a girl, the, the fact that a girl in that outfit, and then right after that, oh, by fun. the way, she has she was like sitting on the desk, all uh, sexy, laying on her side, and fucking my, I would I would <laughs> ruin my dick it's watching the greatest that. Greatest movie in the world. And how funny <laughs> that the last clip is a guy outside with binoculars, binoculars spying on him, looking through the window. <laughs> who, who, who's uh, spying on them? I forget. Get his name. He was um, Angie Dickinson was his mother in the film, and uh, she was killed in a razor yeah. slashing. Is this a Brian De Palma movie? What Just movie? to Kill. Uh, it had that like almost a Hitchcock feel. Uh, yeah, so was yeah. the other movie. Uh, what was the other one? The one that you're talking about. Oh, was that also the, okay? I didn't realize it was Brian De Palma. You like Brian De Palma? Yeah, he, he did some good stuff. Yeah, he did. But the, the Dress to Kill was a very, very creepy. That's a good one. Scary. You saw it, right? Yeah. Fuck, did I jerk Michael off that King. a lot? It opened up with a really sexy shower scene. I think on HBO when I was a kid, or Showtime, or the movie channel. That was, <laughs> that was, that was one of those dirty movies when you were younger that you yeah. get away with watching. Just enough. Just enough, right? <laughs> just, I kind of like those just enough movies. Yeah, judging by that cock you in your pants. I yeah. didn't even know that she said cock at that point. I really just thought it was bulge. Mm-hmm. I guess the, the rating system back then was R and X. It, it would have made it a harder R. Right. right? But just her, a girl a talking about a guy's eye. balls was so fucking dirty. Now, why would you want to do that? I mean, Michael Caine is he's the best. Although he plays Michael Caine in every movie. He's one of those actors. I'm Michael Caine. Right. I'm... <laughs> That's a pretty good one, right? Yeah, it's oh, not yeah, bad. For, yeah. for, for, yeah. Let's see. Gotta do it again. I am Michael Caine. Why am I in here? He lost me. Why are you here? In this studio, trying to get me to act that way. 
I am Michael Caine. That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not bad. That was pretty it's good. Not bad. Not bad. <laughs> you got to keep saying I'm Michael Caine. Yeah. Yeah. Keep, right. yes. keep reminding so you. So the who audience is. knows who it is. Yeah. Keeps on uh, track. <laughs> I'm. It's what we psychiatrists call a question. That's when you let your dick go because you know that he's going to talk. <laughs> right. But she's. Come on, if I take this off. Crank, 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 crank. Let Fuck. go. Now, why would you want to do that? You, you, I'm <laughs> Michael Kay. I am Michael Kay. <laughs> you time out your loads. You have to time them out when you couldn't stop the fucking action, man. You couldn't stop it and rewind. God forbid somebody talks from the next room. If I'm cranking it, it was late. And I, the worst was when you'd be there and you're fucking jacking it and you're ready to spew. And I would hear the telltale sign of the door open, meaning one of my parents had to go to the bathroom. Uh. And, and they were walking, so I would always have to like tuck my dick away. Or Oh, it was the worst. And then I would listen for the bathroom door closing so then I could keep cranking again. <laughs> listen for that opening, the toilet flush, everything was sound. <laughs> right, yeah. T timing it out is a, is a talent, <laughs> you know. Jimmy, put that away. Why are you up so late? Cranking it in your room. Well, mother. No, I wasn't. My, <laughs> no, I was, that was Michael Caine. No, I, was in, I was in the living room. I wasn't in my room. Oh, Caine. you were in your living room. I, I had a black and white TV with no cable. Oh, I'm picturing you in your bedroom, your little baby bedroom. No, I'm in the living room. And oh. I, and he went down the hall. And and it was my bedroom was at the very end of the the hall, and then like on the left was my parents. So when that door opened, I knew that they were either going to go to the bathroom, which was right next to their room, so they wouldn't come near the living room. Oh. So you'd have to hear for the door when you heard the sound of footsteps. Your fucking cock had to go away. Did you change the channel at that point? Oh. Yeah, it depends on where I was in the movie. Like a lot of times, I would get like, again. You'd start jerking probably a few minutes before because you would want to you'd want to shoot when the moment happened because again there was no freeze frame. And no freeze frame you couldn't write you just i remember being a teenager you know all all worked up and cable hit and i remember taking out the tv guide and going oh oh, oh i see what's going on and these movies would be on late yep. one in the morning or yep. something like that yeah so then you go oh, i'm going to bed Nine, ten o'clock, whatever it would be at the time, and then I remember just fucking getting all worked up as I heard one by one everyone else going to bed, and then I knew like right around one o'clock I would sneak down, and I remember the whole thing of turning on the TV, hoping no one heard the TV going on, and the big clunky buttons of the first fucking cable remote, and getting right, conk, getting conk. Yeah, you conk. Conk. Right. but getting away with this like all of a sudden like okay it's it's yeah it's, like a, it's my time now <laughs> like a perverted rat it's my time scurrying around the house but i remember getting worked up knowing you know okay i saw the tv guy i forgot the movies back then yeah. that really would get you going but the, it's just like you said these just enough type movies oh, tales of a window enough. washer like that type yeah. of stuff yeah. Yeah. uh emmanuel series those type of like you know kind of sexy r right. hard r movies but then uh, getting bummed out like my dad would stay up too late or something <laughs> and then i would hear snoring so now i'm like fuck Coming down for water no, none of that. I mean, if he went upstairs, that was it. It was the whole thing, waiting for everyone. I, I mean, I'm talking seven kids in a house, and every, you know, everyone That's was on different impossible. schedules. But then, you know, some nights, Dad would I would hear the TV go off. He'd walk up the stairs, you know, the the the, the creak of the staircase. I'm like, all right, now it's gonna it be is go time. It's go time in about 20 more minutes. I just gotta wait 20 more minutes. <laughs> Do you think the rest of the family was doing the same thing? All these other kids. That's a really good yeah. question. Every 15 Had minutes, somebody was arcing a fucking load on the door. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta ask my brothers that. That's be, a right? great question because I definitely did it. I remember to. turning the TV even because you know it, it would shine upstairs a little bit, and that might be a giveaway. <laughs> yeah. All this—it was a whole like ritual a spy, thing, like a CIA, right? <laughs> top secret. But if you got to figure with all those other siblings, there was else. a lot of times when you were just going to bed, people were like, "Thank God he finally went to bed." Right? I, yeah. Right? I got. I got to ask my brothers. <laughs> You always knew you were in for I, good I never movie. caught him in the middle of the night like, hey, what the fuck you doing now? <laughs> you always knew you were in for a good one when you're watching the movie and then you see like two lesbians on a fucking moped in Vietnam. You're like, good. Mm. Someone's <laughs> pussy is getting eaten very shortly. <laughs> <laughs> You would look for those little weird lead-up scenes where you knew right. something was about to happen. Some innocent girl just <laughs> minding her business. Oh, man. But when you don't time it right, that's the worst. That's a, the worst. That's a talent. I think a lot of us end up you know, losing our load in the middle of trying to find something better. <laughs> Fucking idiot, but it also idiot makes guys you so, we are. It also makes you so specific, though, that you can't... You know, it's almost like it's almost unhealthy. Like it's because you get so specific and everything is so timed out. It has to be right. You get too fucking bent on a certain pattern. It's not healthy. Why isn't it healthy? Yeah, because then you uh, can only come to a certain type of thing, and it's like right. so just, uh, let's uh, let's say hi to Pat in East Anover. Uh, Pat. Yo yo, what's up, guys? Hey, 
Hey, uh, just uh, you know, back in the day when you had the, uh, the TV, squiggly lines on the TV, uh, channel 98, 99 or something like that, that came in color, sometimes black and white. You could sometimes make out a hit here or there, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like the dirty channels, like if they were, if they but, were, you didn't get them, you had to kind of do that knob on the side and you can kind of get it. Or, or you get it for just a few seconds, you had to yeah. push that knob halfway down or something and <laughs> hold it just right and all of a sudden it would pop on for co- not even a couple seconds, I maybe think a I second. Saw a nipple. I think I saw a nipple. You would see distorted <laughs> boobs and stuff, but, but as a kid that was good enough. It was just Because we didn't enough. have the internet. We didn't have the internet. We had to do this. I know. Poor guys, right now we're talking going, remember I had to call the rest area <laughs> and that fucking big headed open micro fucking picked up the thing and gave me nothing <laughs> what are you doing down there i don't know it's a rest area now, yeah no now there's grinder but back then there was fucking just dial and hope the guy wanted his dick sucked <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah <it was> <laughs> One of the greatest moments as a teenager was when john ewing came over because he could hot wire the, the cable box uh-huh and so my, we started watching porn, bec- and our parents, uh, my parents at the time, thought we were just upstairs watching the Knicks or something. Yeah. And that was a whole ritual thing too. Like, okay, I'm gonna hotwire your box. He would open it up, and it was just uh, this yeah. little thing that got everything. But then he had to put it back before he went home because you know we would get fucking caught. Oh really? So that became a thing for a while. Man, that guy must have been popular. Yeah, well, John Ewing was a guy that just fucking was way older than all of us all the time. <laughs> he was the guy that first first guy to start shaving. He was 6'4". He was driving at, I don't even know if it was possible, but he was driving at 15 because he looked like he was 20. <laughs> first guy to have a car That's in high school, good. that type of yeah. kid that we all we all have one of those guys. Just in a our warrior. Lives. He was a warrior, but <laughs> yeah. and he always knew shit that none of us knew yet. Because we would go to school talking about the squiggly lines and how you could kind of see porn, and he's like, Pfft. He's in the back that, with a toothpick. Yeah, that's child's play. <laughs> I got you covered. I can, I, I, I'll hotwire your uh, your cable box. What? What really? do you have to do? Move the wires or just flip the switch inside the box? These stories are so old, I don't remember. I remember he would take the cover off, and he would have to get in there a little bit. And I, yeah. I, I feel like he was just moving a couple wires around, and that was all it was back then. Probably just taking one wire and then attach it, like, almost like a no or a yes or something. Yeah, else. yeah. That's all it was, you know. <laughs> We've gotten a lot more complicated with our cable systems, but back then, I remember it was an easy fix, but no one was doing it. It's so funny to picture you guys all, like little kids around him, like, is he doing it? Is he doing it? We were like 15, 16 ish, I would say. Yeah, somewhere around there. And then you get guys, though, who are allowed to do that. Like, I talk about Bill D'Angelo a lot. My buddy, whose parents were really cool and open, and they weren't, like, I guess they had other older sons, too, so by the time Bill was born, they were just over it. And uh, he had WHT, and he was allowed to watch it. His parents didn't get, you know, whatever. They They probably would have said, like, you guys go to bed. I'm going to jerk off now. All right, son. <laughs> just don't get it all over the parlor. You know, like, they were just cool. They didn't care. Yeah, I had a friend like that, too. They just got everything, just free reign. The parents were, like, just upstairs getting high and just leaving us downstairs. And that was such a different home than my home. My yeah. home, like, it was yours. Pretty strict. Where, oh, yeah. Where yeah. I mean, every movement was just... It was silence. I mean, just silence from the time they went to bed, and you had to completely... Just to walk around and just get snacks, you had to be like a right. spy. It's the best of the week. It's the best, best. of the week. This Pat is sitting in Anthony's old chair. Oh, shit. No, that's okay. That's wow, good. you got big boobies. <laughs> Miss Pat's talking got to E-Rock. <laughs> Miss Pat's got some boobies. <laughs> Miss Pat's got some boobies. Wow, nice. I didn't buy them either. <laughs> yeah, those are yours. Yeah, they are mine. Good morning, Jim. Hi, Pat. How and this, are you? There's a nice bounce to them too. Still. Uh, this is the uh, underwire in the bra. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> Stop okay. trying to make me feel young. <laughs> Who is the dude in the background looking like Secret Service? Oh, Kenny. That's, that's Kenny. Oh, hey, Kenny. <laughs> oh, I was trying to make. Sure, he wasn't my parole officer. Well, he, he might he might have been in that business for a little while. Yeah, you know, he sort. probably has less of a fun vibe than your parole officer. <laughs> right? Yeah, <laughs> creepy. <laughs> uh, there's so much I want to talk to you about, but um, they said you disagreed with the uh, Adrian Peterson thing. I mean, I'm from the South. We always got wood with switches. You know, that's a branch from the tree because right. they didn't even know what the fuck a, sw- right. a switch was. Yeah. So I mean, that's how we used to get whoopings. I, I, I don't know. But to, to the point where it left marks? Yes, all the fucking time. My mama would make us go pick them and put them in hot water and plat them and then beat your ass with them. Why the hot water? Because it makes them twist. You know, a branch, it needs to be soft for it to twist. 
So you get your ass beat with it, and all the way down to the to it was no mo. Right. And nobody locked my mother up. Oh, okay. I mean, it's just a new age, you know. That's you can't do old school. Like my mama, when I was little, she used to shoot in the air to make us move. Right. But if she shot today, she'd be in fucking jail. Of course. She kept a twenty-two loaded. So if she would shoot a gun in the air for what? Like, did I tell you to wash some dishes? Pop out, get the ass and now wash some fucking what dishes. About, I heard you say that on the Rogan podcast. Uh, Rogan's a good friend of ours. Love Rogan. Love what he's doing. And you told oh, that right. story. And my my first thought was, what <laughs> was what about the people living upstairs? We didn't live up. Who's gonna do? One of them stairs. No. <laughs> I mean, if it was somebody that stairs, she just shoot in the wall. Okay. So it didn't scare us. We got used to, oh, she wants us to get up. And then she wondered why the, the apartment started leaking? Yeah, she wondered why the roof was always leaking because <laughs> you just put three, uh, 30 holes in it this month, bitch. <laughs> she really would just shoot the 22 like it was nothing? Like it was nothing. You was used to it. Wow. And whoop our butts with uh, these switches. Yeah. I mean, we said have the same type of br bruises. Nobody said nothing. Not even the school said shit. Right. You go to school and you got whips all over you. Okay, you must act up. Right. I, 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 right. Right. I pers I got two kids, I, a four and a two. I can't see spanking them. I just can't. I, I was spanked as a kid, and and I was and, I, and honestly, I understood why my my parents spanked us. I'm not sitting here like oh those fucking you know that those wasn't monsters. A spanking, Opie. That was a whipping. A wh you know, well, a spanking. You take your hand to the kid's ass. Right, right. But a, a, sure. that's a whipping. You taking switching belts. That's, that's where I don't understand. Is what I'm saying. I understand parents today if they're spanking their kids, that's fine. If that works for them, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not in their lives. If that works, that's fine. But uh, leaving marks on a four-year-old, that is crazy to me. Yeah, I mean, I agree, too. I was like, damn, Agent, you really know. What was crazy to me, hitting the baby nutsack, you know, that, that, <laughs> that's some tender skin on a four-year-old. You know, your nutsack sure. probably can take a gym, you know. But a four-year-old, that's, yeah. that's like, that's some really tender skin. And what did he say? That was <laughs> <laughs> I'm assuming that's tender I'm skin sure. because y'all yeah, cried today. Is. And he said that uh, that was by accident, right? Hitting yeah, him on the ball bag? Wrapped around, right? Yeah, because when you hit him with a switch, that switch go all over. Sure. You know, it's like a 22 pistol. It travels. Right, right. And it Went right to that baby nutsack. I was all for age until I realized he had hit the baby nutsack. He said he felt bad about that. Well, of course. Let me hit your nutsack. When you when yeah. you be in here hollering this morning. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I don't think it's abuse. I need. To, I think they need to say, "Hey, you can't whoop your kid with a switch." But you well, so know, you, you were whooped as a kid, but you you were a wild child for a while. I was never wild. I got caught up in some shit. Okay? You got all right. You got caught up in some <laughs> shit. But I don't think I would have got caught up in shit if I was getting the shit beat out of me. Well, you know what? We my mama was really strict until she got her spine damaged by a security guard in our project. Right. Then after that, she had no control of her neck, so we was no longer scared of her. How long did how did he damage her spine? He oh. threw up against the wall she was the candy lady he told her not to sell candy so he came over there to whoop her ass and she was a very small lady so she gets to fighting with me damaged her spine and then her neck went, went like if we was in the car with her and her neck fell over we would have to be there to pick her neck up that Jesus. was a hard job as a kid. So did she hold her neck up all the time? Well, as long as we positioned it up, it right. was okay. But like, say if she moved too quick, that bitch fall over, we would have to be that a bitch yeah. back up. <laughs> I'm kind of piggybacking uh, Rogan's podcast because I heard that I heard that as well. And uh, did 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 he really de uh, give her a D D D T D D T? No, I get okay. he power right. drives shit out of her. Right. That's a wrestling move. I used to love wrestling. I know, I know. <laughs> he beat the hell out of. Her. He damaged her spine. So, so in the project, she was selling candy. She was the candy lady. What's, what's, so why is that a problem? Ah, uh, because she talks shit. Like she was. My mama had a foul mouth, and she was like, "Oh fuck you, security guard." He said, "Well, you're not reporting your income, so don't sell the fucking candy." Well, what is it? It's not his. Well, it's I not his job to his, worry about that. I think he just didn't like her. Right. He didn't like her, so he wanted to whoop her ass. So he whooped her ass. What kind of candy was it? Some good stuff, or you know, pixie sticks and yeah. all types of little different nice. shit candy. Just to make some money. I wanted to make extra money for, you know, utilities and shit because we were poor. I went into the candy business in school. It, it was very profitable. Sam uh, also did that. I would come in with the candy and, you know, charge a little extra, and I, I had some nice pocket money as a kid. It was nice. Well, I didn't sell candy. I sell cocaine. But. I know you did. <laughs> yes, you, you oh, probably had a lot more pocket money than he did with his fucking Mars bars. <laughs> boy, yeah. I, I, yeah, we're going to get into that. We're going to get into that. So, wow, where do the, we begin? The projects were at? Atlanta? Well, projects was uh, in Decatur, Georgia, yeah. Oh, this Decatur, okay. projects really got crazy. They were safe back then. I guess we didn't stay that long because after they beat up, they put, our, they put us out. Oh. Did, did you know your dad? Uh, yeah, later on in life. Later on, yeah, because I don't remember um, that coming up on the Rogan podcast, so... No, I mean, I met my dad when I was 11. 
11. Yeah. Wow. How'd you meet him? He just came to see you? No, well, he came over to whoop me and my sister, well, whoop my sister ass, and um, he couldn't tell us apart, and he hit me. And I had never seen him. So at the time, I was really into wrestling. So I stepped back, and I drop kicked the shit out of him. <laughs> and I tagged my brother in, and we whooped that ass all over the house. And while we was beating him up, he was like, I'm your real dad. I'm like, well, introduce yourself next time. Wow. Come here slapping the shit out of me. That's how you met your father? That's how, <laughs> that's how black kids meet their father. Uh -huh. <laughs> that was a good day for her. The story she, she tells, wow. So, so how did you get, up, uh, get involved with the drugs? Um, I had two kids at 16, at 15, I'm sorry, 15, and um, I couldn't get a job. Everybody wanted a work permit, so I would take the kids on the interview with me, and, you know, they was like, where's your work permit? You should be in school. So I was like, well, meet my fucking kids. They mama need a job, right. and nobody would give me a job. So at that time, crack had just hit the black community, and I had a friend who was like, well, let's, we could do this. Yeah. And so I just took my welfare check and went from there. Is this in the 80s? <sighs> No, the nineties. Oh, okay. I'm not that She's fucking not that old. old. <laughs> she said crack had just hit the. Uh, it hit really bad in the uh, the late nineties, the early nineties, the Probably early nineties. Yeah. I'm no, older. no, it was the eighties, eighty six, eighty seven. Because my daughter was born in eighty six. Okay. So by eighty eight, I was selling crack. Yeah. Because I stopped in ninety one, ninety two when I met my husband. Oh, okay. So it was the early. It was the late eighties. There's a lot there we got to ask questions about. So I. I, I do know you uh, met your baby daddy, I guess you want to call him. When that? I was 12. When you were 12, and he was 22 years old. Yeah, 22, 23, something wow. like that. Wow. How That's did you two uh, meet each other? Coming from a uh, high school dance, uh, like a teenage dance called yeah. the YMCA. Right. So uh, I was walking with my sister and my cousin, and he pulled up because he knew their boyfriends. And we just all started hanging out. So, I, you know, I had a really nice body. I was fuckable, but... <laughs> <laughs> You're looking at me this morning, Jim, like I'm not fuckable. But uh, no, I'm not. I understand. It's, I understand. No, it's the age thing, not the fuckability. It's the age difference. <laughs> oh, that's why you keep squinting your eyes at night. <laughs> like you don't want to look at fat people. Do I look greasy, No, Jim? that's not it. <laughs> I, told, I told Roman, I was like, he can't look at fat people. Have you noticed that? He can't, that's all I do is look at fat people. <laughs> <laughs> you seen Roland or Iraq? He look at everybody oh, else. When you get the mirror rolling, his right. head is down. Right, right. But I was, I was 12. and um, So you had a nice body at 12 is what you're saying. Fuck yeah. Like, oh, God. Yeah. If I would have knew that they was going to be wearing naval rings, I would have never had no fucking kids. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't see that one coming? Uh-uh. <laughs> I sure didn't. I can get one, but I, should nobody see it. Right. I probably couldn't nobody see it anyway. But I met him coming from a party, and um, my sister and her, my sister and my cousin were with their boyfriends, so he gave me a ride home, and he just started talking. And I come from, you know, a rough background where no one paid me any fucking attention. I'm like, finally, somebody will listen to me, but I didn't know I was going to fuck him in the long run. I thought, you know, he was just going to be listening. Right. So he came back the next day. I'm like, what? He actually came back because I had acne really bad. I had a little chicken hair. You remember the song Chicken Hair with a little short, <laughs> nappy fucking hair? I, I was a rough looking chick. What's wrong with this guy? Paid me some attention. It was like, wow. Right. Did you like that you were 12? Sorry. Did you like that you were 12? No, I actually, you know, I was lying. So I said, when I first met, I was like, I'm 18. But the next day, my mom, he come over. My mom was like, you know, she 12. And he told me he was 18. And so my mom was, my mom was like, how old are you? He was like 18. So I guess my mom was like, I don't give a fuck. Wow. You know, because she was an alcoholic, she didn't give a fuck. Were well, you a mature twelve? Oh yeah, I had the same you set of titties you just seen that just bumped. Really? I, these are the same set of titties I had at twelve. Yeah, they're thirty. They're, they're forty-four double D. If you wanted to know, no, Jim. double D. I assumed I didn't no, know triple. it was forty-four. I'm sorry. Yeah, really? Oh, you yeah. gotta go triple. triple. You gotta nice. give room for my back. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> my back titties. <laughs> <laughs> so when did you realize uh, that whole situation was wrong? Later I didn't in life, realize. yeah, and later in life, because you know what, I, I met him at twelve. Mm -hmm. I got pregnant at thirteen, and at that time, I'm still in elementary school. So once I, <laughs> once I gave birth, I, I turned fourteen when I gave birth, and um, it's, it didn't done. All I had to do was all I could think of, I gotta take care of this fucking baby. Plus, the main reason why I think I kept the baby is because I, um, I wanted somebody to love me. Mm -hmm. And I figure if I have this baby, this baby will love me unconditionally. Because his wife now knocked on my door when I was like four or five months pregnant and asked me to get an abortion. I'm like, bitch, no. I'm going to get a welfare check for this baby. Did you hear this? She's 12 when they start dating. He's married. Right. Yeah. When did you uh, find out he was married? 
early I on? No, when she knocked on my door. And she when you were four on, months pregnant? Yeah, she knocked on my door and she said my my street name, well my nickname was Rabbit, and she was like, uh, I want to, you know, I want to speak to Rabbit, and I was like, that's me, and she was like, I'm, I'm you know, I'm his wife, I'm Daryl's wife, and that shit confused me. I was like, wife? Well, how can you be his wife? You got to be his girlfriend first, and she was like, how old are you? And I'm like, I'm 13. Oh my god! And so she she we go outside and the ice cream man coming down the tr- street and she buy me an ice cream and she discussed abortions with me and i was like abortion and i'm thinking to myself bitch all you gonna buy me is a bomb pop to get an abortion <laughs> not even a box of bomb pops the fuck is wrong with you i could get 235 for this baby <laughs> so i was like no nah, i think i want to keep the baby because it'll, it'll love me she's like oh you're gonna ruin my marriage then by this time i'm thinking every fucking marriage is already ruined of course i'm, I'm trying to take your husband right. in my mind i wasn't taking shit but how, yeah how old was she I think she was like 17, 18. Okay. They was, everybody was much older than me. Right. Whatever happened to him? I still talk to him. I talked to him the other day. Oh, you did? Do you, do you dislike him? That's kind of predatory if you're 22 to fucking well, 12 child year old. Yeah. It is fucking child molestation. Well, the acne know. especially makes it very predatory. Yeah. Right? The what? The acne. You <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> 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 well, you know, nobody gave a fuck back then. They do now. You and you know what's crazy? Cause he signed my kid's birth certificate, and I, when I was um, when I was doing something, my daughter was going on a cruise, and she pulled out a birth certificate. She said, "Oh my God, you fourteen and he twenty two or twenty three. I was like, "Put that shit away." <laughs> it's, it's really nasty when you think about sure. it. Sure, you know, but it is. I mean, I had a second baby by. So At fifteen. Oh, both by him. Yeah, I had I have four, but I'm married now. And then I got pregnant again, and then I got an abortion because I was like, I can't fucking take care of these kids. You know, this dude ain't gonna help me. He wasn't helping me at all. Right here, I am fourteen, fucking falsifying my ID to go do child, uh, do labor, day labor work. Right. And so that's how I made money for Pampers. And when I started selling drugs, I could really take care of my kids. Right. So, but uh, Jimmy asked a good question. Did, did she answer that? What? Right. What kind of relationship you got with? The guy oh, now, with, or with him now, or what yeah. was your conversation like? I talk to him. I mean, I don't hate him. I'm not built to hate. I can't hate no yeah. fucking body. I can. I dislike you. I don't fuck with you. But I can't hate. It take energy to hate. Mm-hmm. So people are like, how can you talk to him? I. I think because I forgave, I've forgiven him over the years. I mean, he did. I mean, he put two kids at me, you know, didn't ever take care of them. You know, he beat me. He shot me. Right. But I've overcame all of that shit. Wait, he sure. Let's, let's start the beatings. <laughs> I if, you were, if you weren't living with him, if you were living, he was living I with I never lived with him. He oh, yeah. always lived with the other women. Okay. And so he beat you? Yeah, he used to beat. Now, that's what I tell people when they talk about this Ray Rice shit. I was like, now, that was a misunderstanding. I fucking really used to get beat. Like, he one time he slapped me with a skate. and Like, he shot me. He shot me in the back of the head. Right. Now, I used to be in a very, very abusive relationship with him. <laughs> with him, yeah, for 10 years. So, um, when he shot you in the back of the head, that should have killed you. I uh, he just knocked some shit aloof. Was he yeah. trying to kill you or was he trying to shoot He's, by you? No, he said he wasn't trying to shoot me, but I was in the house with another guy and he hit me and then he said the pistol went out and it just tore a nice hole in the back of my head. Wow. And he left me there. To die? I don't think I, I mean, it just kind of like knocked me unconscious and when I came through, I'm fucking bleeding like hell, so I called 911. Right. What about the guy that you're with? He ran. Uh, <laughs> the, he the ran. Guy, yeah, the guy that you were in the oh, house Oh, he with. got the fuck on. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> Who gonna stick around for that? I'm out of here. But if the guy had a pistol, he didn't shoot the other guy. Nah, he's a pussy. My baby dad is a pussy. <laughs> but, mm. he, he, that's why he hit me instead of the guy. He's not gonna fight no man. Well, if he had a gun, he could have just fucking pulled the pistol on him. Well, they got the fighting, and then the guy ran out the door, and then it was just me is, and him. Is, is your nipple okay? <laughs> My nipple is okay. All right. I got shot in the titty. She, she got shot in the titty. Bye. By the same guy. No, it was not. Oh, Everybody that's another said, guy? Stop putting that shit on him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's bad, but he's not that fucked up. How times have no, you been shot? Just twice. Oh, okay. <laughs> another guy shot me in the titty. I think well, it was with a 45. 45. Yeah. What, what was the story there? Well, I was selling drugs, and he was just a fucking hater. And uh, he spit on my car, and I drew a pistol on him. And, and I learned from, if you ever going to stick a pistol in somebody's face, go and shoot him because it might, you might get shot your damn self. And he came back shooting, and he, he hit me up under my arm and blew my fucking nipple and areola apart. Wait, he came back shooting, meaning he walked away? He and walked then, away. Oh, okay. And so while I was outside serving, you know, my drugs, he came back shooting. How, how old were you then? Fifteen. Fifteen. So you already had the two kids? Yeah. 
And I had already been shot that same year by my kid's father. Right. That 15 was a rough fucking uh, year yeah, for me. sounds like it. <laughs> yeah. When, when, when did you start doing stand-up? Um, 12 years ago. Because I watched some of uh, past stuff. It's funny. It's really, I watched some of the stuff from Gotham and some of the, the stuff from Charlie Goodnight. And it was, you talk about a lot of the stuff in your act, now which I, I really yeah, like. Now I do. You kind of got that Richard Pryor thing going on. He had such a crazy life. Yeah, that's what they say. <laughs> I know. I know. You've heard that. But it's kind of true, though. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Who don't want to be like fucking Richard Pryor? He's a great. But yeah. A lot of his comedy came from his upbringing and how crazy his, uh, his life was, right? Yeah. Yeah, it was fairly brutal. Um, so the drug thing, you started at how old? Um, at both of my kids at 15. So at 15, you're like, look, man, I got to take care of these kids. And this, you know, the government and all that's not helping me well, here. Well, or, yeah. or these dumb little silly jobs. Well, what I did is I divorced my mom when I was 15. I became emancipated mom. Oh, you did that? Yes. So I could get a Well, I was 16, so I can get an abortion so I can be on my own. Because, I mean, I, I wasn't getting any help from her either. Right. So then once we moved again, I got into selling drugs and I got my own place and I I started to do shit for myself. I can't imagine doing any of that at 15. No, I can't either. I was a helpless. But then again, I, I wasn't having sex till I was 18, you know. Right. I was, <clears> a, just, I was a late bloomer. Yeah. Uh, I was, I got, strict I household. I, I wouldn't know how to live by myself at 15. How, how do you do that? Well, you learn. It's called survival. I understand. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, if somebody throw you out there and you got two kids, what are you going to do? You're going to either you're going to either get up and do something or you're going to fucking fold. Right. And what did Daryl do for work? Nothing. No. Give out good dick. Oh no! He just <laughs> fucked. Well. Okay, so did he? Did he have? Was he? Did he have? Did he fuck well? <laughs> yes, he did, Jim. <laughs> I can give you his number if you need it. Oh, no, I don't mean for me, but that really was a dumb question. All black men fuck well when they don't have a job, Jim. That's all they got. Why you think Bobby went with Whitney so good? Right. Unemployed dick is delicious. That's funny. Especially unemployed black dick. And your nickname on the streets was Rabbit. Rabbit was Why? my nickname. Why? I don't know. That's what my stepfather gave me. I, you know. Oh boy, what did the stepfather do to you? Oh, oh that, nothing. That he I, nicknamed you rabbit. No. no. <laughs> did, you, did you do something very quick? <laughs> I used to like carrots. They say. Okay. Good. I guess they was carrots. <laughs> <laughs> And business was really good. I guess you need some skills to be a drug dealer, right? Uh, not every just a not, street knowledge. Well, yeah, you know what? Not I'm everyone learning. makes it as a drug dealer. They all think they can. Well, I mean, we all. What do you end up? Everybody end up in jail when you break the law eventually. But I learned a lot of stuff from the streets, from crackheads. I learned everything I know from the streets. Mm -hmm. You know, like. Shit, that's how I learned how to drive a crackhead. Right. <laughs> they taught he taught me how to drive. Yeah, because you had a learner's permit. I had a learner's permit with a car. Right. And this crackhead, I would give him. I say, you come at night and show me how to drive. Right. I would give you a couple of sacks. So he'd be on the passenger side, hitting the pipe, and I'd be in the driver's seat with my two kids in the back, just cheering me on. Mama, you're doing good. I'm like, shut the fuck up. I'm scared. I, I think I learned how to drive a little differently than that. <laughs> yeah, me uh, too, Miss Pat. So did my kids. So <laughs> okay, did my good. Kids. So did my kids. How old are your kids? I have a 28, 27, 16, and 14. Okay. I'm married. I've been married for 23 years right. now. I have a wonderful husband. Yeah, we'll get to that point. So yeah. I, I want to talk about the drug. So uh, in, at the top of your game, how, how uh, well were you doing? Um, I had a partner that we was doing really well. Probably yeah. about 10 grand a day. Ten, that, I, you, that you would split? Well, we was in a partnership together. Right. About 10 grand a day. Wow. That's nice. That's good money for a 16 year old. That's amazing money. I had a money. fancy apartment. I had all the Jordans. <laughs> really? <laughs> you know, everybody want all the Jordans. But I had everything. You I had mean, a real nice apartment at 16? Yeah. Because of that? Well, you know what? I, I always like made fake ID. And I've always been able to talk like I was much older than I really was. Mm -hmm. So back in those days, you can just go and make you a fucking check stub. And, you know, they do a little verification. You get your friends to answer the phone. Right. And you rent an apartment for $1,000 a month. Wow. Nobody knew I was 16. I had two kids. Right. I mean, I already looked like I was 20-something. Right. So. Wow. So what point did you stop standing out? Did you like always stand on the corner, or did you ever farm that out to other people? Well, I could do it. Like I, was, I had nieces and stuff that would help me do it. So if I dropped it off to them, they knew what to do. Oh, okay. So, you know, I ain't have no Nino Brown shit. I just did what enough, you know. I didn't have to work all day. Mm -hmm. I could go out there when I had my partner and we make money in the morning. We get the fuck home. And then you're teaching your nieces the business? Yes, I taught my nieces. Some of them. <laughs> we all went to jail. How did that finally crash down? Uh, I met a man. 
and I was ready to make a change in my life. And I was just tired. You get tired of the same old bullshit when you feel like you ain't going nowhere. Plus, he wasn't getting any better. You know, I was with my kid's father. You, you get to a point where you get tired of getting punched in the same eye on Friday. You get tired of hoes. And I mean, he had like 20 some kids. And bitches would come to the trap and, oh, throw their baby out. You gonna buy my baby some pampers? I'm like, you know, I can do better than this. What's the trap? The trap is called, what, what, back in the day, I don't know what it's called now, right. is where you stood and sold your drugs okay. at. So that was your little block. So he was bringing his other kids there, knowing yes. you were doing well? Yes. His ba the Mamas would just come down there. I, I, I All think looking I for not, handouts. Well, yeah, I think I beat up more bitches than Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson. <laughs> oh, my God. Every time you turn around, I was whipping his baby mama's asses. <sighs> they would come to you for money. No, they would come to him for money. Oh, then, you know, he was supposed, I was supposed to have been number one. So he was, they would come in there and say shit like, oh, bitch, he was with me last night. Then we all be down there fighting. Sure. Because he cheated all the time. Right. Oh, you thought he was in a monogamous relationship with you? No. So you met your current husband, is that? Yeah. B before you went to jail? No, I had already been to jail. Oh, because Jimmy was asking how did it all How did it all apart? crash down? Like, how did you go to yeah. jail? How did your drug business stop? Um... I met my husband. It wasn't jail, because after I got out of jail, I still did the same shit. But I went to a open mic with a lip sync with Bruce Bruce one night, and my husband was there with his brother, and I knew his brother. Okay. And I was in the, I was in the process of hiring a new hiring a baby daddy. Right. And he had just got out of the military. He was well spoken, had back teeth. <laughs> <laughs> a back teeth in a black man is very important. <laughs> really? Yes. And so I was like, oh shit. You know, he ain't hood. He's intelligent. I was like, mm, I ain't, I'm not really into, you know, fat boys. He wasn't really fat. He was like cube size. Yeah. My baby dad is smaller than Jim Norton. Okay. So I was like, but I'm not into uh, fat boys, but I'm going to give this one a try. Right. So I was like, hey, fat boy, you want to split some wings? So he was like, I, my name ain't no fucking fat boy, but I split some wings. And so he was started giving me rides. And we hooked up, and that was 23 years later. We got two kids. I, I wanted to, uh, I, I don't want to send the back teeth thing, because if you can't see the back teeth, who cares? What? The guy with back teeth. Well, it's important when you're in a conversation and you're riding in the car and they talking and spitting on you from the side. Oh, okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think you fast forward slightly. The, so how do you get caught? And, and you, I know you did about a year in jail. I yeah. know that much. Um, my, my niece hit, my niece, we got out there one morning early on a Friday and it was this little officer named Officer Beard who fucking hated me. And he was like, I'm gonna let you sell all the drugs you want. But when you turn 17, they had just changed the law in Georgia because of crack. Say, if you, you know, if you, if you break the law at 17, you go to jail now. He said, when you turn 17, I'm gonna have your ass in jail. And my birthday is April the 2nd. I think I was arrested April the 10th. He saw my niece. My cousin hired the drugs, and she was underage. She was like 13, so he let her go and said, I'm issuing a warrant for Rabbit. So I ran for about a week or so, and I couldn't make no money. I said, well, I might as well turn my fucking self in. So I turned myself in. Did you save any money? Uh, not a great, yeah, probably not uh, the best uh, financial plan. Ever save my, come on, I'm 16. Do you think I'm thinking about saving any money? Well, what can you do with 10 grand a day, though? That's a lot of money. You fucking shop and buy and ball out. Don't you see rappers? They, they ain't nothing but the new drug dealers. Don't they all end up broke? Right. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you ran for a week. Where where, where were the kids? Just, they was with me. They was with me. So you're so, just going f here and there, just trying to yeah. figure it all out. Well, he never knew my address because I didn't live in that neighborhood. Right. But he knew I. That's how I ate. So he knew I would eventually come back. So I was like, "Fuck it." He was down there looking for me every day. So you were smart enough to live mm -hmm. at, uh, outside the area. Oh yes, my daughter went to school in front of the place where I sold drugs at. Now, really? Yes. Wait, she was going to school and you were selling drugs outside? In front of her school. And she that's hated it. That's before they put the signs up. Uh, yeah. yeah I, I, tell people, I tell people I was grandfathered in all the time. Wow, that's fucked up. So so you would drop her off and then you would hang outside I, the yeah. school and, and sell you know drugs? What? The principal was so fucking dirty. He knew I sold drugs. So he always put her classroom on the side that I sold the drugs at. So she was in, she'd be in class. I'd be like, hey, I'm coming to eat lunch with you. Right. So one day I pick her up and she was like, Mama, I want to transfer. And I was like, why? This is a good school. She said, because I get tired of looking out my window saying you sell drugs every day. I was like, fuck that shit. I was here first. You're going to get a transfer. <laughs> wow. And then you did the year in jail. Yeah, I did a year in jail. How's jail? It's fucking horrible. Yeah. I mean, unless you unless you homeless, it will be great. But right. and you know, I miss my. I actually miss my daughter going to kindergarten. And by me being such a wild mom at that age, it really messed up the relationship with me and my daughter in, in the beginning.
because she thought I was just fucking the most evil person in the world. How can you give these people these drugs? And mm. She wasn't looking at, oh, I'm trying to survive. Right. She wasn't looking at it like that. So it, it kind of ruined our relationship in the beginning. Right, I'm What's sure the worst part of jail? I guess getting fucked, but nobody wanted me. <laughs> <laughs> That's the part that scares me. But I did only one night in jail, and I remember the worst thing was I had to shit, and I didn't want to use the, the bath. The toilet was so dirty, and I'm like, I would give anything just for a clean toilet. But wasn't it right in front of everyone, too, the toilet? Yeah, or something? it was. It's yes. metal. It's cold <clears throat> with no seat. That's That's just... Twisted. Why do they can't make the toilet? I think at least? they want to make it where you don't come back. If you make yeah. it too comfortable, you, people are gonna continue to come back. Well, they seem to come back though. So some people do. Not me. I, I jail ain't for me. Right. You know, cause I'm black. So when you go in there, they take your hair out your head, and I'm in that bitch looking like Don King. <laughs> 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 Literally, I was looking like Don King. I think that's why nobody wanted to fuck me. Plus, I was extremely mean, and I hated being in jail. So, who took, you know, who took care of your kids while you were gone a for a year? friend took care of my kids. Yeah. yeah. Did you have any sex in jail or no? No. I, I don't do that eating pussy, Jim. I don't like my own vagina. <laughs> so, you know, I know what a vagina go through. That's for That should be for you guys to eat. <laughs> 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 you know, you don't know. I know how well we do and don't wash our dishes down there. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah. But I have a gay daughter and she love it. She love it. <laughs> Oh yeah, I would hope you know, I would yeah, really she, fucking... she love it. Not jail. She don't love jail. Right. She haven't been to jail. She love a job. Now you kind of had to make an adjustment uh, as far as how you felt about gay people, right? You, you know a fucking lot about me. Oh, I almost feel like you've been peeking I, in my window, I'm trying to you know be yes, more prepared I... for this radio show. I figure we might be here for a while. I, I should start preparing. Well, no, I, I, it seemed like you weren't really. You I were, didn't. I didn't like gay people. I didn't. I and I'm not. I, the word hate is too strong. But by me doing time in jail. And being, you know, I'm, when you black, you raise it, you know, I mean, you know, when you raise Christians or whatever, that being gay is wrong and all that shit. You hear that from your parents and grandparents. And I just didn't like gay women. Gay men was OK, but I, I've lived with gay women for a year. And I was like, this shit is not for me. So when my daughter came out and said that she was gay, I had to say, well, why don't I like gay people? You can't judge people for their sexuality. Right. And I started looking at the person individually. And I fucking love my daughter-in-law. I got a white daughter-in-law that looked like Robin Thicke. And she's fucking awesome. <laughs> <Not really. laughs> <laughs> yeah, she looked like Robin Thicke, and I love her. So, I mean, yeah. So now you're all in. I'm not all in. Ain't nobody going to eat me now. Well, I, I mean, again, not to that point, right. But, <laughs> but I support my daughter. You know, more you. power to Good you. Good for you. How old was she when she came out to you? Well, looking back, my daughter was gay early on. You know, as a parent, you try to, uh, you know, because I got a mother-in-law. She was like, one day we was over our house, and she said, this kid got a gay spirit. And I was like, fuck you. What? you the Spirits running around gay? We got gay spirits running <laughs> right. around this bitch? And she was like, you need to pray the spirit off your daughter. And, you know, you hear that shit from Christian. Oh, lady, shit up. And so as my daughter started to mature, every I had cussed at my sister for kids. And at this time, I got six kids, six girls, and everybody trying to get fucked except my daughter. My daughter running around reading um, Elon Harris. I bought her Elon Harris, which is a gay author. And I had no idea because I heard it on the radio station. Get the book. It's very good. And my daughter couldn't put this book down. So uh -oh. I was like, what the fuck is in this book? Right. And I found out it was a gay book. And that's what kind of gave me the light bulb. And I asked my husband, I was like, I think she's gay. And then he was like, I don't know. Nah, nah. She just ain't into boys. She read a lot when right. she was. She's How gay. old was she when, when you started to really like go, huh? Well, when she went off to college and she went crazy. She went, I think she was eating everything on campus. <laughs> <laughs> At least trying to. And I would hear, I would hear people say, oh, she's just down there getting buck wild and acting crazy and shit. And she went out to Virginians and we didn't speak for like two years. So I finally contacted her. I said, like, what is your fucking problem? I said, I said, and I asked, her, I said, are you gay? She said, yes. I said, well, finally you're going to admit you gay. Can you come home now, bitch? I miss you. Wow. Good. So she was gone for like three years. Right. Why she, she was afraid how you'd react? Yeah, she thought, you know, she was afraid how I react. It's it's hard to get people who said in one way to realize sexuality don't have shit to do with the character of the person. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I learned, and now my daughter's happy as long as she's in a healthy relationship because she saw me in a very unhealthy relationship with her father. You know, she probably grew up thinking, hey, I, I really eat pussy because all men punch you in the face and I hit your head you. with skates and shoot you and shit right. and cheat on you. I mean, because it was numerous of times I found out my kid's father was cheating for me personally riding in the car with her. She would be like, Mama, that's my daddy girlfriend house right there. I said, okay, well, let's turn around. We've got to whoop this bitch ass. <laughs> Does she have a good relationship with her father? No. None? 
No, he showed up at, no, they just fell out real bad. But they, my husband raised them since she was six years old. Right. So he showed up at the graduation looking like a clown, but no. Nothing. Nothing. Looking like a clown, how? A tight suit on. Oh. Um, fucking a card that was spelt, not a shit spelt wrong in the card. No money. How you, you ain't did nothing in 18 years for your child. You couldn't put $10 in a damn oh, card. Gosh. But he want to say his child support was the support. You know, he gave me, what, $12, $13 a month? That's it? Because he had so many kids. Right. Unbelievable. Yeah, what are you, what are you talking uh, about now if you talk to him? Like, that's amazing that you still have a friendship with this guy. <laughs> We just talk. I talked to him the other day because uh, I'm in I'm in the process of writing a proposal with a writer for, uh, for a book about my life. Mm. So I wanted to know if he would answer a, a few questions. So, you know, mm. stuff like that. Okay. I'm always nice to him. You know, if I'm in Atlanta and I see him, I speak. I don't hate him. Right. I think he's still in love with me. I really do. Just from the little shit, he stare at me like, oh, and like a rapist. And I always tell him, don't fucking stare at me because you make me uncomfortable. And he's married. And he get real mad, like he won't call me Patricia, a uh, Pat, right. because that's what my husband like. You need to go by your real name. I can't take you home, name no fucking rabbit to my mama. <laughs> <laughs> and so my kid's father would not. He still call me rabbit to this day. Wow. Well, let, why don't we do this? We got to take a break because I, I mean, Miss Pat's story of uh, turning her whole life around is really just as fascinating as these stories uh, she's telling today. Uh, I want to, you know, talk about you getting into comedy and all that. We're gonna do, continue with Miss Pat. Stay there. <laughs> It's the best of the week. It's the best of the week. We got Miss Pat in studio telling stories throughout the entire break. The feedback on you is great. Thank you. And then somebody had to say that, you know, wow, Miss Pat's a role model for black people. Not. I'm not a role model for no black You're people. You're not trying okay, to be yeah. a role model. You're just a, you you have stories to tell. You're a very honest woman. And 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 there is a success uh, story here too because you were in a horrendous situation. You met your baby daddy at 12, had two kids by him by the time you were 15, had to drop out of school in 8th grade. Uh the, the little jobs that you could get weren't going to make the ends meet. So then you go into the drug business. Yep. To to uh, to you know, provide for your kids and yourself because it was a better life uh, at that point for you, and that, but you also knew that it, all that was wrong, and 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 eventually you got out of that, and and you know did well for yourself and your kids. Sounds like you're telling my story. <laughs> <laughs> but she's not trying to be a role model in, or any of that shit. I'm just telling my story. You know, people take it the way they want to take it. They can take it inspiration. They can hate. Personally, I don't give a fuck. You know, I tell those people on on, on the internet, do like my real daddy do. Stay the fuck out of my life. He wasn't in my life, and you don't have to be in my life either. I don't care what you think of me. I'm, I'm in my 40s now. I'm a grown-ass woman. I'm not trying to make no new friends. If I want new friends, I got four kids i have a grandbaby and i have a niece that i just helped out of the same situation that i was in that has four kids that's all i give a fuck about right. i don't care what you think of me when i did rogan they, they said i was ignorant i'm this i'm that okay i'm not the i'm not i'm not i don't have a fucking college degree right. okay but that doesn't that doesn't make me stupid no. so you're ignorant I mean, they said all kind of stuff after I did Rogan yep. Podcast. One girl was like, oh, if she was a white girl, she would be, uh, if she was a white girl, uh, y'all wouldn't be saying this shit. Y'all be calling her white trash. No, bitch, if I was a white girl, I have a TV show called 16 and Pregnant. Thank you, ho. Right. Thank you. But you're listening to the minority. You know, the majority of uh, the people are enjoying you on our show. Definitely enjoyed you on Rogan's podcast. And, and that's why everywhere I don't else care. you've been lately. I call them Kiba thugs. If you so bad and you want me to know, know something about me, meet me at Starbucks. So I can whoop your ass. Oh, you whoop mine? You've been in a lot of fights over the years, huh? I don't care nothing. Yeah, I, I will fight your ass. <laughs> I, I, I I'm not scrapping with Miss Pat. Fuck I that. mean, I'm no MMA fighter, but I will stand out there. You'll, we pull out each other hair. I don't give a fuck. You'll smother me with those boobs. I'll be, I'll be in trouble. <laughs> Only if the buckles break on the back of them. <laughs> 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 that happened a lot with my bra. <laughs> and that is inspirational. Anybody who comes from a, a shitty situation and winds up doing what they want to do or, or turning life. it into something, I, I 
th- how is that not inspirational? Because a lot of people uh, fuck up early and make think, bad decisions. Think about it. You're in the ghetto. You're 15, 16 years old. You've got two kids. Fa- and pregnant with my third child. And pregnant with your third child. And fast forward about 25 years, and you're a successful stand-up comic. And, I'm doing good for myself. And I'm not get- stealing. I'm not breaking the law. No, yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't try to hide nothing from my background. I tell you the truth. Okay, I made right. some fucked up mistakes. Right. But I made them because I had two kids. Right. Do, would I be selling drugs if I hadn't had no kids? No, I'd probably been somewhere fucking a lot better off if I wouldn't have had two kids at two, at and, 15. And you never did drugs yourself? I've never done drugs. I, I mean, I smoked mm. a little weed here and there, but drugs... I grew up when everybody got high and got drunk. I was raised in a bootleg house. So I always said, I'm never going to be like you motherfuckers. So why didn't you? Uh, oh, okay. But why? I don't drink either. But why? I mean, how, did, how were you able to say no to the temptations that were all around you? Because I saw what drugs did to you at an early age. Yeah, but other people see that, but they, it doesn't stop them. You know what? I just, I, it was like <laughs> I was set in a corner. I mean, when you Day in and day out, when my granddaddy ran a bootleg house, I was around drunk people all my life, and I grew to hate them because they was always in our house, but that's how my granddaddy made his income. And they were, we always had to dance for drunk people. You know, you seen black movies where kids have to get up and dance. All of that shit is true. We was the entertainment, and I hated dancing because I hated how they looked at us, and I hated cigarettes, and I hated, I just hated the whole situation that I was in. So you're a little, little girl, and they, I mean... They would put on music and be like... Get your ass out there and dance. And so, you, and you me, knew they were looking at you in kind well, of a my provocative was, my way. My sister used to dance all sexual and shit. And I would dance like I really didn't want to dance. So my mom be like, set your hot cock <laughs> ass down. Like fucking rerun, do that unsexy <laughs> rerun dance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, but my sister enjoyed it. I mean, she followed that life, lifestyle. She ended up on crack. She's, uh, she just got out of jail. And, uh, you know, she ended up on alcohol and drugs, cigarettes. I, I chose not to do that shit. But now you're raising her kids? Well, I, let me tell you, my sister was on crack they took her kids i raised her kids for 10 years so my sister had this whole thing where she could do a better job she just wanted the welfare and shit so they only gave me 235 for 10 years but you can't even take care of four kids on 235 dollars so i bust my ass from uh, us jobs and stuff and me and my husband taking care of kids she popped up one day and took them back fucking destroyed me because i knew that those kids was going to end up like i like what we was headed from molestation pregnancy drugs dropout and i'm like I'm trying to break this cycle, bitch. Right. So she get her girls, and they all get on drugs. My niece lived with me. She got four kids. Other niece, 20 years old, she got five kids. Other niece got one, and uh, my other niece got three. And only her oldest daughter graduated because she was a senior when my daughter came back. So she just fucked up their life. Now I got her daughter trying to show her, hey, it's it's nothing wrong with falling. It's just about getting up and doing something with your life. And she been with me now nine months. And to rehabilitate somebody from that type of situation that's hard as fuck mm. my niece would tell me oh you live in this white neighborhood you trying to make me like you i said no bitch i'm trying to give your kids a chance in life your kids shouldn't be fucking ducking because guns are going off your kids shouldn't be knowing how to rap but don't know they fucking abcs and i had to break it down to them it took a while but now she's driving she got a job her kids is in school she's doing a lot better but that whole mentality she know she come to me she got four kids with dude name tattooed on the back a tattoo and i who the fuck gonna hire you looking like that and you dropped out of school, I mean, you look like shit. Right. I mean, and you talking all this lingo that I don't know what the fuck you're talking about, and I speak your bunnies my damn self. <laughs> so it was it, it was hard, because, you know, I picked her up last year Christmas, and I almost had a heart attack. My husband was like, you just having a panic attack. I was like, what the fuck am I going to do with four kids, you know, and a mama? Who going to pay for daycare? I go on the road, but God worked it out. Right. And she's doing great now. Do you think it's easy to leave the ghetto? No, no. I mean, some people would think it's as easy as uh, lifting yourself up. Yeah, and, just get pull yourself up and get out. And, and and you know. No, it's not. It's not. I mean, it's not leave. It's not easy leaving any situation that that's all you know in life. You know, that's like you know, you look at women who've been in relationship uh, abused for twenty years. Like, why did you stay twenty years? That's all she knew. Right. I mean, and a lot of people don't reach out and tell other people what they're going through. I personally started surrounding myself with better people. Like, I would go out, and if you was going to be my friend, you needed a college degree, because I needed to learn how to talk from you. I needed to learn <laughs> what was going on in the real world from you. So I didn't I didn't surround myself with friends who had gold teeth and who was fucking talking crazy and shit. I needed some intelligent people, somebody who can look back and say, hey, Pat, you need to do this, or you should do this. I needed somebody that I could kind of follow a little bit. You were motivated. 
I was motivated. Well, I had two kids. Extremely motivated. Yeah, I didn't but- want my daughter to be molested. I didn't want my daughter to drop out. I didn't want my daughter to be shot and abused. I guess my point is there's other people that are in that exact situation in, in the ghetto with two kids, no, no man, 15, 16 years old, but they don't have that same motivation. Well, you can't make excuses. You can't be motivated and have excuses. You can only do one or the other. Right. So I didn't have no excuses. I know my life was fucked up. I know where my kids was headed if I didn't get my shit together. Right. And it was all about, you know, even though I sold drugs and all this, my daughter was a fucking straight-A student because when she came across that street from school, I'd be like, set your ass right there. After I sell this sack, we're going to work on the ABCs. <laughs> so, I mean, I was determined to make sure my kids had a better life. And, you know, I was tired of being on the corner. How do you justify in your head? that your kid was uh, seeing you sell drugs but you were trying to do, buy, uh, do right by and, her. You know, I'm like, 16 I, at the time. I'm right. 16 at the time. and it, To me, it was a job. Right. Now I look back, I was like, I was a fucking horrible mom. I mean, if, if you see a grown, if I saw somebody that was an adult doing what I did back in the day, he was like, oh my fucking God, that's horrible. Right. And I'm not making excuses. I was 16 and it was horrible, but that's all I knew. Right. You know, until somebody came along and said, hey, Pat, you know, you can't have these kids down like this. And I tell you, my first, I opened it was a guy who owned a laundromat in Atlanta where I sold the drugs at. And he was like, well, your kids shouldn't see you sell drugs. Let them stay in the laundromat while you sell the drugs. And I stay open a little longer so you can sell your drugs and your kids can be a little bit safe, mm-hmm. safer. So my kids spent most of their time in the laundromat. Wow. While, it, while I was outside selling drugs. And you sold from 15 to 21, you said? 20, uh, about 19. Oh, 19? Three or four years about? Yeah, about. Okay. Yeah. So now I want to know how you turned it all around. So you have these two kids. The third, you had the I had third two kids. And the and third it, you abor- aborted. Yeah, I had an abortion. And then I got custody. I met a man. And then right after I met my husband, we moved in together. And I got custody of my sister kids. So here I am, I think we 19 and 21 with six kids, none of them his. He's a nice guy. Yeah. <laughs> what does he do for a living? He works at General Motors now. He works at Allison Transmission in uh, Indianapolis. Okay. Yeah. So is he, is he, it's funny, I just saw a great documentary on a GM plant getting shut down. Is he worried about, like, was there a point a few years ago where you were worried mm-hmm. he was going to lose everything when GM went kind of belly up? Yep. That's why we moved. They closed in Atlanta, so we ended up moving to Indianapolis. And and the stand-up came uh, came uh, about Through a case in a, worker. In, yeah, in a strange way. Yeah, I went to the I went to the welfare office um, before we moved uh, to Indy, and I was there. You know, I used to get white case work, and I was like, oh, I had such a horrible life. I've been shot. I've been beat. You know, just running gang because that's what you do in the hood. You run gang, and who you run gang on is white women because they're easier to cry. They have sympathy. A black woman sitting there like, bitch, get your act together. <laughs> So, I had to, so the six months before I had this case where we were in that boohoo and crap. I'm so sorry. Your life was so fucked up. I'm going to make sure I approve everything. The next six months, you had to go in every six months. I get a black case worker and I'm trying to run gain on this bitch. And she just looking at me like a straight face like you. And when I finished, she said, you know what? You should really be a comedian. This shit is hilarious. Wow. And I'm sitting up thinking like, bitch, I didn't come here for no job. I came here for uh, <laughs> something free. Did you even think about stand up before that or even understand it or no, nothing? No, 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 not at all. People, because she was like, You remind me of Richard Pryor. And I was like, uh, Who is Richard Pryor? I heard the name. So I went home and I Googled it. And I was like, mm, They make a lot of money. You didn't, you didn't know Pryor growing up? <laughs> no, I didn't. I don't wow. no comedy in my house. Come on, I was being shot at. <laughs> Sounds like, she, yeah, you just oh. didn't go We didn't down laugh the road. at my house. While you're too busy uh, pulling your uncle's legs back so you can get it in. <laughs> See, I did research on you. I did I, research on you. Somebody tweeted that's actually, that too. I, I got to be honest, that's from Rogan's podcast. Pulling your uncle's legs back for what? I, I, my, my jaw dropped when you told that story. I'm like, my, what? My uncle, was, my uncle was crippled. His name was Uncle Cecil. So on Friday, my granddaughter would buy him pussy. So, you know, when you cripple, your knees go together. So a lot of times we would have to go to the bedroom, me and my sister, and hold his leg back till he stick his dick in. And, you know, he was retarded. He was really retarded. So he would get to laughing and shit. And I went down, I was like, Uncle Cecil, stop laughing, nigga, and put it in. I want to go play. Black man. <laughs> she was eight. She was eight. She was eight years old doing this. Yeah, we 
with their Making sure her up. uncle, her crippled uncle got it in. And he got it in. Why did they pick to? you and your, was it your sister you said? Or they picked any kid who was close. Get Why back that whole kids? Why kids? I don't Because know. that's what went on in the, in the bootleg. How every, we saw everything. I saw my uncle shoot a lady. I mean, I saw my grandfather shoot a lady like nine times. And he was told my aunt, the lady out there laying on the ground, he took both his 38 pills and just shot her. Just shot her till they was empty. And when he was finished, he was like, go back there and uh, uh, pull the moonshine out. And I'm thinking like, this bitch is laying on the ground dead. You more worried about a, 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 a bootleg charge? Why did he kill her? He didn't kill her. She survived. She survived. Yeah, if she would have died, he probably would have got life. I think he did like 10 years or 15 years. I can't remember. Why did he shoot her? Because she called him a black faggot. You don't call old black men faggots. That don't work. Yeah, they probably don't really care. They don't appreciate that. No, they don't appreciate that. Did he say I object to that or did he just start shooting her? (laughs) I was standing there holding his leg. He's like, I got your black faggot bitch called Hot Leg. And he just pop, 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 pop. And I was like, holy shit. So I was like, Granddad, are you going to jail? He's my hell yeah, I'm going to jail. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) You see a lot of murder? No, only when I sold drugs, but not running. My, I see my granddad like knock people clean across the street, right. people whipping their ass, prostitute turning tricks, you know, stuff like that. What happened to your grandfather? He passed away like at, he was like 90 some, I think. My cousin put him in a, 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 a old folks home. So I called him and I was like, granddad, I'm going to come up there and bring you some grape soda. Cause you know, old black people like grape soda. So he's like, don't come up here. These white people can't cook. I told Jesus to come get me. He died the next day. After asking Jesus to come get him. Jesus came and got his ass too. He passed away the next day. Wow. 92. It's amazing. Like you can live a crazy life and live to be fucking 92. Yeah. And then some people jog every day and they drop dead when they're 50. Trying to do the right thing. Yeah. Um, So, so she tells you, you got to do some stand up or whatever, because this is hilarious. So not knowing stand up, how, what was your next step? Well, p- then after that, people just kept saying, you funny, you funny. So I asked my husband, he was like, I said, do you think I'm funny? He said, P- Pat, you serious. People just laughing at this shit. They don't know that you telling the truth. So at that time, my kid's father, my baby daddy, right. uh, one of his baby mama lived around the corner from me. Now, this is a girl he showed up at the hospital with when I first gave birth at 14 years old. So we become like pretty good friends. So I called up. I was like, come go to the uh, come go with me to the uh, open mic and just see if I'm funny. Because she always thought I was funny. And I went and it went pretty well. Where was it? In Atlanta at a place called The Pub. And it was just a new talent night or was it a real comedy show? No, it was like a little bar show. So I went there and I did comedy and I've been doing it ever since. Did you tape your? I wish I, I always wish I had taped my first couple of nope. sets. I didn't know any better at that mm. point. I was horrible, so I don't want to see that shit. Really? I'm still working at it. You know, you you never as good as you think you are. How old were you when you did uh, your first set? <laughs> Twelve years ago, I was uh, twenty eight. Twenty eight. Something like that, twenty something. That's kind of that's kind of a, a bit old to start, right, Jimmy? Well, you hear guys who start later than that. I yeah. mean, uh, thirty, sure, late twenties, early thirties. I mean, uh, Rodney, I mean, started at a younger age, but he dropped out in his, I think, forties for ten years to do yeah. aluminum siding, and then came back and then hit big. So yeah, there's no formula for it. Mm. Right. I worry about getting old, but you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to be like the cute little white girl. You know, got their titties sticking out, got their thighs and stuff. You're not gonna come <laughs> to my show to get turned on. You're gonna come to my show to fucking hear about my life or what, you know, whatever I'm voicing my opinion on. I'm not gonna be. I don't got to the point where I don't even put on heels. I don't have that time to be fucking rearranging my vagina to be walking in heels trying to be <laughs> right. sexy for you. Yeah, I saw your Gotham say you had sneakers. Yeah, so I just went to sneakers. I don't have time for all that. You know that diva shit. I'm gonna put on a little makeup. Up, keep my weave together. Right. I don't even want a necklace on. I just want to come out and do my shit. If I can come out in my fucking pajamas, that would be okay with me. Do you remember your first joke? Yes, I told a joke about my brother. My brother was used to st- breaking people's houses for a living. And we I, we would go with him sometime to earn extra money. So he broke in his lady house, and, and the lady was sitting there, while an older lady was watching TV. He's like, freeze, bitch, I'm the FBI, and grabbed the TV and VCR and ran out of the <laughs> <laughs> Which is a horrible joke, but that was my well, first joke. It's a good place to start. <laughs> but it got really good laughs. And I was like, do you mind if I tell everybody you used to break in house and he country for hell no? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just pumping it up for the stage. Don't worry. Yeah, but well, I used to talk about him being a cat burglar, but he was fat. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> yeah. What's he do now? 
Uh, he don't steal no more. I can tell you that. No. Uh, just look, he's a fake ass mechanic. That's what I tell you. My brother, the worst thing you could do is hire my family for anything. My, I told my brother to fix my car right. So he's supposed to be doing like a head job and to keep the spark plugs down. Instead of going and get the fucking thing fixed, he broke off a spatula and stuck it in my engine and screwed it back down. And it wouldn't work, so I take it to the dealership. They come out, they was like, ma'am, who put a spatula in your engine? <laughs> <laughs> my dirty-ass brother, and I paid him $300. So I don't let him do an oil change. How many people count on you for, for uh, you know, money and stuff? Money? I don't get away no how, motherfucking money. How many people are you supporting? Well, I got my sister, I got my sister, daughter, and her four kids. And right. then I have two kids at the house. Like, I have two grown kids. I don't give them no fucking money. You got to go out and get it like I got it. Right. Not like I got it, but, you know, you got to work. So, uh, when did you realize the stand-up was starting to work for you? Uh, when I moved to Indy, a lot changed. Because I was just like, you know, Urban X, you see me, the same old bullshit. And so, the clubs wouldn't let me go up. And and I would tell these stories to, like, one of the managers who worked there. He's like, won't you do your real life? And so, I started to do my real life. But to do my real life, you had to, I had to do some forgiveness to some people. I had to stop being embarrassed and all kind of crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. So, I just started to talk about my life. Because I thought I was the only one that had two kids at 15 and dropped out. I didn't know that that shit happen to people no matter what color you are no matter where you come from in the world right i'm learning that. i had a white lady whisper in my ear the other day and looked like she was fucking rich and she said i had my baby at 14 too i was like holy shit that's amazing to me yeah that's very rare though <laughs> no, i'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> come what, on now <laughs> what uh what exactly was the thing that you were most embarrassed about was it that having kids at a young age uh, yeah, having kids at a young age and an incident I had with Jimmy Carter. What? Yes, an incident I had with Jimmy Carter. You didn't jerk him off or anything, did you? No. <laughs> <laughs> you threw one of those fences he's building. <laughs> <laughs> and I always hope he will remember me. I, I used to work at McDonald's in Atlanta off of Tarp Boulevard, and uh, I used to steal out the register, right? And so, you know, that's what you do when you get your life back together. You ease your way out of crime. Yeah. And so I had to do it. Do I had to go get a job because of Bill Clinton started the welfare to work program. So I'm working there one day, and we kind of slow so I stole money out the register and in walked this white dude with a fucking earplug and I was like oh shit they don't caught me stealing but before they came in they circled the McDonald's a couple of times and it was in a black van so you know you from the hood that's either police or that you about to be robbed so in walked the white dude with a plug in it. I was like holy shit who is this and two seconds later they sent him in Jimmy Carter walk in I did not recognize his I recognized his face but I could his name wouldn't register so you know I'm talking I said some dumb shit like he get to the race and I look at Jimmy Carter. I was like, nigga, where the fuck I know you from? <laughs> <laughs> and Jimmy Carter turned pink. <laughs> That's my most embarrassing moment. And Jimmy Carter, young lady, young lady. And I look over the Secret Service. This white dude is pouring tears because, you know, that's how we talk in right. the hood. And I'm dead serious. J Jimmy Carter done turned pink. The boy and the girl's like, Patricia, that's the president. So I turn around and say, nigga, your cheeseburger free. <laughs> <laughs> Why was Jimmy Carter in the McDonald's? I have no idea. I have no was idea. Was there a photo op? Or there... No, he just came in. He just he came, came in. in. He, he ordered a side salad, a water, and a cheeseburger. I Did never forget. You it. get a picture? No. I got a picture with the president. No, I didn't get a it picture. Makes Jimmy well, they jealous. didn't have That's no. They like didn't have no camera phone back then. Yeah. No selfies. No, but the guy on the grill, he got the autograph. So I called my husband. I said, oh, you ain't going to believe this nigga. Jimmy Carter just left out of here. And my husband was like, but you bet. Tell me you didn't say that. I was like, yeah. <laughs> I think that's my most embarrassing moment. That's funny, though. It that's is guess funny. That, that, that's the best meet of ex-president story I've ever heard. Absolutely. I know yeah. a lot of people have met them, and they're always reverential and polite. That was great. Well, I didn't know. I didn't know his name. <laughs> it didn't register me. He was a president. He just looked familiar. He could have been an actor for all I fucking knew. Is your husband straight edge? Kind of. Yes. 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 My husband and never been in jail. Don't don't commit no crime. Believe it. You know. He just. Uh, he believed in you. He did believe in me. He won't tell you. He won't tell me that. But he. St I ask him all the time. Why did you stay with me? Yeah, because there was a transition, transitional period before you really well, truly got your life together. Some shit. I mean, like, I used to work at General Motors, and I quit. I worked at Ford, and I quit. Right. And he was like, why don't you want a job? I said, because it's something in me saying that I'm supposed to be doing something else. Right. And he always had a decent job, so I was like, I want to follow my dream. And when I became a comedian, he was like, oh, not this shit again. 
Well, what do you mean? Hard. He knew you wanted to do that? No, when I became, because I had like quit jobs and got jobs and, you know, I never wanted a career. I never wanted to, you know, when he, when I worked at General Motors, he thought that was it. Oh, we both work at the automotive. We're going to have a lot of money. I was like, fuck this. I'm tired of putting cream in the back of a car. <laughs> <laughs> what did you do? Not literally cream. No, but what did you do? I used to seal the back of the car. That was your job yeah, over was, and over again? Yes, that was so fucking boring with old people who complain about their jobs. I'm in my 20s. I'm like, I don't want to do this. I don't care how much you paying me. I want to do what I want to do. So I left it. How then much I, was it an hour? $22 an hour. That's a good job. Yeah, that was a good That's fucking a good job. good job. Plus, both of us made that. You know, so we breaking home a couple thousand dollars a week. And we got, at this time, we had seven kids because I had already had one. Wow. It's also hard, though, when you're used to making at one point, what, you know, eight or ten grand a day. Right. But my husband didn't come from that lifestyle, so he don't know nothing about that. My husband cheap as fuck. <laughs> Every penny count. If I want to, if I ever have to say, give me twenty dollars, we have to have a family meeting. <laughs> then why do you need this twenty dollars? Why didn't you budget your money? You shouldn't do this, Pat. Don't eat out. I'm like, oh fuck you. I would go. I turn a trick before I ask my husband for some money. <laughs> is he responsible or is he like OCD cheap? Uh, no, he's very responsible, okay. but he's cheap too. Like he's very cheap. And you're gonna get him back. I, th I think you're gonna be making a shitload of money in the coming years. Well, I hope so. You know, but he. Yeah, but I but think that honesty pays off in the end. Really you think so? Yeah, hell yeah. Sometimes yeah. I, I don't know. Sometimes people give me hell about being so honest, but you know I say those are people who's at home that got frozen cu cucumbers in their ass and don't know how to be honest <laughs> with themselves. That's what I say. Yeah, who gives you shit about being honest? I can't say anybody not enjoying uh, You know, that. I had one. I went to uh, one lady told me she was like, "How dare you stand on stage?" Because I tell I tell a story about how when I was standing at a hotel one time and this white dude asked me to come and go to his room with him, and he like. And so I'm like, okay, whatever that is, I go to his room and he had me jack his dick. But he paid me a hundred dollars. And I'm so naive, I'm thinking this is my real job. So I'm like, are you gonna be here tomorrow? Cause I can come back tomorrow. You know, cause we don't get a hundred dollars in the hood for jacking dicks. <laughs> How old were you? I was eleven. <laughs> but that was a lot of fucking money, don't judge me. Oh wow. And so she's like, How can you tell her? That's a child molestation story. I said, Bitch, don't think about the story, think about the money that I made. Right. Very good. You know, how many Fuck dicks em. have you jacked and didn't make no money? That's what comedy's based on some trip. You know, you know, some tragedy. We I'm all know that. But I, you used to go to this hotel to... Uh, um, stand there for the air condition. For the air condition. Yeah, because we didn't have air condition at the house. You know, we were poor. The only so air condition we had was stick your head in the freezer. So you would go down to the, the hotel? Yeah, just to stand, sit down, to get away from the hood. So I would go, I would go white people watching. <laughs> just sit down in a nice hotel just to get away from all the shit that I was going through. And this guy house. approached you. I had a nice, I had a really nice figure. I think they had like tricks going in and out. And so he just came up to me one day and I was like, okay, I'll go up there with you. Did you know how old you are? Or no, have an I idea? Ask. I had a nice rack of titties. They, they looked like they was legal. <laughs> <laughs> Your tits look legal? <laughs> Were you, Don't they look legal now? <laughs> Were you ever worried though? When you went up there to no. his room? No. Never even thought about it. Didn't think about it. Yeah. How old were you when you lost your virginity? Did you say that? 12. Right? Oh, you were 12. Yes. Was it with the guy who became the father of yes. the kids? Oh, okay. Yes, it was with the guy who became the father. I just can't even comprehend that. I was 18. But I, but I did all my sexual stuff at the, orally when I was young. So, so let me I ask guess you something. How old was you when you started jacking off? I started jacking off at probably maybe 11 or 10. Okay. Oh, God, no. But I was doing dirty things <laughs> before then. I don't, I don't even remember. I would, but I would guess around 13 for me. Yeah. About... Maybe. By that time, I was all in. <laughs> yeah, you were. That's amazing. That yeah. really is. What amazing. motivates a twenty-two-year-old not to pull out of somebody that young? I just that I don't get more than anything. You know what? I ask him too. Like sometimes, like when I first started working on trying to write a proposal for a book, and I would go and I would ask him a question. I was like, you know, technically, you took my life away from me. You know, I try to laugh it up and you know be positive about life. Now I say, but do you have any reg regret fucking a twelve-year-old? You know, thinking, you know, he was going to mm -hmm. apologize. He looked, he said on the phone to me, he said, well, your mind and body was not 12. Ugh. And that shit floored me. And he hadn't made me cry in years. But I hung up that phone and I fucking boo-hooed. Because that hit me in my chest like a fucking sack of brick. For a grown-ass man to say your mind and body was 12. I have a 16-year-old daughter at the house right now, y'all, that's 
16 and got big ass titties and look like she could be 18, but her mind ain't fuckable. She's not, you know, right. not with no grown ass man. Right. She's a little girl, really. She stay up on her daddy all the time. She do shit 16 year olds should be doing, enjoying their life. But he said, you know, my mind and body was uh, fucking grown, so I was fuckable. But that's his way of trying to keep himself from being a child molestation. Cause, uh, try, child molester, because technically you are a fucking child molester. Right. Did you, uh, you know, stay awake at night worrying about this stuff happening to your kids? Yes. Yes. Okay, I mean, right? you, you have people in the family, you know, uncles and shit who touch you. Yes. My, my kids never went around my family. And they used to say, yo, you so bougie. No, motherfucker. Y'all not sticking your fingers in my daughter. Y'all not fucking with my son. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. I know y'all. I grew up with y'all. I'm no fucking fool. None of you're going to do what y'all did to me. Uh-uh. Oh, you had uncles and stuff to it. Yeah. Well, you know, yeah. Did you disown your family more or less then? Well, I mean, it went on. All kind of shit went on. I knew what went on. but So I was saying, you're not going to do this shit to my right. kids. Like, I had an uncle that used to get drunk all the time. And every time he get drunk, we call him Uncle Bunny. He'll pull out his knife, and I'm not lying, and stick it to our throat. Never cut us, but like, I cut your goddamn throat. And the family be like, cut him, Uncle Bunny. They be cheering him on. And I'm sitting there like, uh, do y'all know this a fucking toddler? He got a knife to his throat. What the fuck? <laughs> How's that funny? But to them, it was. Right. To them, it was. Yeah, and I was no. like, no, nah, you're not going to do that. That shit to my How's baby. Uncle Bunny? He's still alive. He is still alive. Yeah. Do you, you don't talk to him? No, I don't. Well, we don't have a tight knit family. We usually get together when somebody die. So I see him at funerals and shit. I bumped into him one day at the CVS and he looked at me and I looked at him and I was like, he ain't gonna remember me. So I'm gonna walk by. He said, "Hey, ain't you Mildred's daughter?" And I was like, "Yeah, that's his, that's my mom." And I was like, "Yeah, I'm Mildred's daughter." Like, what you want her daughter? You is? I'm like, I'm rabbit. Cause we don't know each other real nice. Right. What happened to your mom? She passed away at 39 of diabetes, they say. 39? Wow. Yep, that put me out in the street sure enough after she passed away. Right. With the bad neck. <laughs> I, but you know what I tell people? I said, I like my mama because she never stopped trying to do normal neck people shit. She, <laughs> she shot at she shot at she actually shot at you too. Yeah. She Earlier you were talking about how if you guys didn't behave in the house, you'd pull out the twenty two and just you know. She shot at fire me. some warning shots, but one time she did shoot at you. She shot and it went into the uh uh it hit the hot water heater because I was talking to my kid's father on the phone and she didn't want me to talk to him. So I went in the bathroom and I laid her down and I said, "You stay right here till I get through talking to her." She crawled out of that bitch and shot at me. Why she wasn't walking back then? Not if you laid her down. She couldn't her spine get up. Was, no, she couldn't get up, but she could crawl. And she and she crawled and got her twenty two. Yeah, but I didn't know she could fucking crawl. <laughs> I was like, the next time I'm gonna put a paperweight on your neck. Wow. So she had a, her off. What a what a weird kid. That's like a broken neck. <laughs> Pretty much it is, Jim. It's a broken fucking neck. So was there a way to fix that if there was medical treatment? I don't know, cause her neck was always like that, like it would fall back or fall to the side, and we would just always be there to, to put it back up. Wow, I never heard. It's that. like putting a damn topping on a Christmas tree. You know right. how many times you flops? Yeah. yeah, flops and so over. she would hold up her own neck at times. I would assume. Well, it, as long as it was up, it was good. Right. But once that motherfucker got start wobbling, well, that we, was it. we had to be on that catch a neck move. It's fucked up. What did you do on Cat Williams DVD? I used to open for him. Oh, you toured with him? Okay. Yeah, I toured with him uh, on the Catapopolis. Nice guy. Very smart. How cool is that? Fast forward, you're opening up for Cat Williams. Yeah, opening now up Now doing Kat. your own thing. Uh, and your daughter graduated high school, high school. and college. This yeah. needs to be said because she was the one that officially broke the cycle in the yeah. family. Yeah. Yeah, she's they doing great school. now. She, well, she didn't, my daughter did not. My daughter did three years in college, you know, ran off to Virginia, but, you know, she graduated from high school, and then she attended college. She did not graduate. Let's get that right. But she always said, I got one more year. I'm going back. I said, well, it's up to you. Right. But, you know, it was nothing like the day she graduated. And, you know, I could not stop crying. And she was like, you know how teenagers are. Why are you crying? You embarrassing me? Because I'm saying to myself, oh, fuck, if only you knew what I went through to get you to this point. It was not easy getting you here. But I couldn't say that to her because, you know, it's her day. Yeah. And she's like, stop embarrassing me. So she go off to college and she called me up one day. She's like, Mama. I was like, what? She said, you know, all my friends are sitting here talking about they've been molested. She said, I feel so left out because I wasn't molested. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yes, I did my job. <laughs> well, I could take you to a family reunion. <laughs> you bought <laughs> right really like. <laughs> right. 
You feel hey, that left out. She felt so left out. Boy, I cracked my ass on that one. I laughed on so I was like, yes, I did my job. Because I would have a talk with my daughter. When I when I got married and my I had my sister, four kids, We would, I would take them to school every day. And I said, look, I want you to know that I love my husband, but you mean more. If he ever touch you, I will fuck him up. And I told them this from fucking kindergarten, elementary, all the way up to ninth grade. One day my daughter was like, Mama, if he was going to touch me, don't you think I'd tell you by now? I said, I just want you to know. And I mm. never asked her again. Did he know that you were giving them this this speech? Nope. He had no idea? Mm-mm. They gave it to him every morning on the way to Chick-fil-A. <laughs> <laughs> love Chick-fil-A. I do, too. God damn. I and I didn't that. play that. I mean, yeah. I had to protect my babies. Man, Miss Pat, you got a story to tell, huh? Yeah, it's interesting. It's really, it's great that you do stand up too. And I love that you talk about this stuff. Absolutely. Um, in the, uh, it's hard stuff to talk about. It's uh, having the kids at a young age and your mother being an alcoholic and all this stuff, and you no, make daddy. it really funny. It's really, really good. Yeah, I try. I mean, because I don't want you to come to my show and feel sorry for me. And, I, and no. sometimes I have to stop it and say, look at white people. If you're feeling sorry for me, write me a check. Because I'm not feeling sorry for me. If I'm up here telling you about it, that means I'm over it. I can only talk about what I have forgiven people for and what I'm over. I'm not looking for no handouts. I'm not looking for you to feel sorry. I want you to laugh at what I'm saying, what used to be pain in my life, so you can learn how to laugh at what's, what's pain in your life. Because once you get over it, it no longer has control over you. You know, once you can talk about it, it doesn't control you anymore. Yeah, it, doesn't, it doesn't seem sad. It doesn't seem like, no, oh, you want pity. You know, it's just really funny. I mean, the way, the way you do it, it, it seems like it's really truthful, and it seems it's just really funny like, material. Cra- I mean, crazy, crazy yeah. stories, but, I mean, you, you found the humor in it. Somehow. <laughs> Somehow, right. That's that's a challenge, but you did it. Well, that's a good thing about having a life like that is you can kind of mine it for material, It's like, and, and you know it's yours. You know, you can, you can go back and... Pick through all these fucking awful experiences and just you know, there's hours of funny stuff. Do you do anything else when you stand up? Do you do like social commentary, uh, like I don't know, uh, pop culture, any of that stuff? Or no, not yet. Not yet. I, I'm beginning to get asked to speak at high schools, which I don't know what the fuck I'm gonna say to teenagers. <laughs> but a lot, you have a lot like, to say to teenagers. <laughs> and people ask me like, "Oh, will you ever think about speaking at colleges?" I'm like, "I, I don't know." <laughs> right. I mean, if you pay me, yeah, I come in and tell my story. Right. I mean, it's, to me, it's all about you know, Outcast said it great: get up and get out and get something. Don't let the days of your life pass you by. You know, you you do you you down. It's okay. Get up. You know, don't feel sorry for yourself. I think I just learned that I had a wonderful uh, upbringing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think I had a extraordinary, uh, normal, wonderful, yeah, loving, you went on vacation. loving upbringing. You didn't get thrown in the backyard. I only, I didn't have no friends because I was ugly. I only had one friend. It was a chicken. Yeah. And I told my whole life to him. My mama fucking killed him. And I like to die. Yeah. Why'd she kill the chicken? We had to eat, Jim. Oh, you ate it, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you don't eat your friends? <laughs> well. <laughs> hey, that's what you learn, though. There's always someone out there that has it crazier. Have you found someone that has it crazier? That's the, that's a good question. Yeah, that is a good question. Because um, yours, yours is right up there near the top as far as crazy-ass you, upbringing. Well, you know, my niece who'd been away from me for a while, when she came back, she kind of blew my mind. Like, she, she has a... Um, she has four kids, and I was talking to her about her Facebook one day. I was like, why is your kid's father on your Facebook saying, I'm here chilling with my bitch, Crystal? And she was like, well, I was a bitch. I'm like, oh, what? I ain't never thought I was a bitch or a hoe. I always wanted respect. And I was like, no, you are a young lady. You're, you are a, your name is Crystal, so why is you letting him disrespect you? And she was like, oh, that's how they talk in the hood. Then she told me that when you, and, and I said, how do you have four kids and none of them have your kid's father last name? And he do carjacking for a living. What if he get killed? You can't even get Social Security. She said, well, in the hood, we don't allow kids to sign the daddy birth certificate. I mean, we don't allow the daddy to sign the kid's birth certificate. I was like, what the fuck they do that at? That's that's no. fucking crazy to me. Right. Why won't they? So they can go out and get a sister and he, he not be responsible. So he's just going to give all his rights away and, oh, you had this baby for the government? Fuck is wrong with you? This ain't the government, baby. So it's just stuff like that, that the new age shit that they do now that really shocked me with her. What are they saying? They don't know who the father is? So there's they no said they don't know who the father is. But all four of them is his. But everyone knows who the father is, so they're yes. getting away with that. So that that what really shocked me with her. Just let me know. None of the kids, you're not going to hold this guy responsible. I said, so now you got to fight him like a dog, because now he can easily say these are not his kids. How bad is the ghetto now compared to when you were coming up? I guess it's extremely bad. Look how, they, look how they're getting killed. They wasn't getting killed like that when I was coming up. 
I mean, every now and then, but it seems like, I don't know, because I, I don't live in the ghetto. Right. And I don't really deal with my family like that. Right. But just dealing with my niece, you know, it ain't, she's always on the phone gossiping about the ghetto. Every time I turn around, who got shot, who rubbed to, who did this, who did that. And I tell her, I say, the only way you're going to get that out of your life, stop calling home, finding out about that shit. I didn't call back and say, hey, who, who, who's selling food stamps this month? Let that shit go. So she still misses the ghetto, even though she's living a nice she's life through you. Better. She's getting better. She's getting well, of course you're going to miss what you used to. Right, right. I mean, just, I, is it a real white neighborhood you live in? Yes. So that's got to drive her a little batty, no? Uh, it's boring because all they do is like, I mean, it's even, it's, 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 it's shocking to me too. Like, I see the white kids in, in the little wet, red wagons, and we only use wet. Uh, my tongue is getting tired. Red wagons to put dirty clothes in and go to the laundromat. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, why do you care that these dirty clothes baskets? <laughs> <laughs> so it's just the stuff. They're so family oriented, and you know, I don't talk to my neighbors much. I have one next door that, you know, my neighbors be outside cutting grass with a forty-five and shit on they. Hey, hey, and take my ass in the house. You know, I don't know who he's trying to kill mosquitoes or what, but <laughs> it's kind of yeah. They all tote their gun legally, so I don't too much fuck with my neighbors. But I, I live in a nice neighborhood. Miss Pat, you did not disappoint today. Oh, my God, well, absolutely. I, I didn't come to disappoint. <laughs> I understand that. Come um, back and see us, all right? I will. All right. Miss Pat, everyone. Yes. Thank y'all for having me. It's the best of the week. It's the best, best, best of the week. The legendary Paul Williams. Let's bring him inside. He's, a, he's a window licker. What was he doing? He was licking the window? Yeah. yeah. Let's bring why, him in. why was he doing that? He's gotten he's so crazy. Tall. <laughs> he's a delightful man. Yes, he is. He's our friend. And he's with his co-writer, he's Tracy Jackson. Friend, yeah, we do love Paul Williams. Hey, nice to meet you. hey Tracy, nice Hi. to meet you. Tracy Hi, Jackson, I believe, Hi, right? We're on yeah. the air. Just so you know. Paul Williams, right on. Right on, right on, right on. Paul, it's been a while. It's been too long, laddie. I just tweeted, I'm running late. Opie, going to kick my butt. Nah. <laughs> nah. Hello. Hi. How are you? Hi, guys. What's up, Tracy? Hi, Paul. Good to What's up, Paul? Where have you been? You're well, too busy winning awards to come by this and say hi. I evolved Pauli Paul Lama's spiritual book called Gratitude and Trust with my friend and partner, writing partner Tracy Jackson, the lovely sitting next to me even as we speak. Yes, she is. What is that? Wait, are we on? Is the that air? you? Hold on. I, I, was I wasting this beautiful commentary? What are we? I don't know. What was that? I heard Paul? talking. There was something coming from your phone. Yeah. That probably is. Did you, did you guys shut your phone off? Was it yeah. gratitude or trust that you're working out? <laughs> you yeah. just heard the end. <laughs> this seems like a really angry book, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're going to write a book called The Imperfect Partnership. Yeah. <laughs> the Perfect Marriage. Now you're going to have The Imperfect Partnership. Right. Are yeah. you still speaking? Well, are you guys, are you, are you, are you guys a married couple or no? No, no, no. Oh, no, you're just no, friends. No, okay. No, no. But okay. she slaps me around as if we were. Oh, nice. Uh, you need that. The relationship has evolved to the point where she treats me with player. the same disrespect. <laughs> like they're a football player. I like a good funny. domestic violence joke up front. <laughs> I respect that. It's a true I respect that. Has <laughs> tiny hash marks on his bottom based on his writing partner. <laughs> <laughs> I broke the ice a little bit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How did you guys meet? You love to tell that story. You, I want to give it to you. Okay, we met in Robert Mitchum's bedroom in 1982. She was like 12, and I, and I was getting loaded with Mitchum. Yeah, and I was in there with Bob. No, I wasn't. That's a joke. <laughs> she was, uh, yeah, we were getting high, and, and uh, she came in, and she was so kind, and she said, I love your music. And I was loaded, and I was, you know, just just rude and, and arrogant. That's a sweet and, little girl, too. Yeah, and I said something like, you know, like, well, and she said, I love your music, and I said, well, if it helps you get laid or something, just really, really rude. <laughs> She was 12? No, yeah. I was well, 20, no, no, but it she was, was okay. I got laid, but it was still not oh. nice. Yeah, she was in her 20s. So she's, she was a Paul Williams fan when she walked in the room. She walked out of the room a Neil Diamond fan. <laughs> <laughs> Song Sung Blue, I still love the guy. But why were you in Robert Mitchum's house? Yeah. yeah. I get the story, up, but uh, why, was, why were you there? Well, we both knew him. We both lived in Santa Barbara. Right. And he was a friend of my family's, and I'd known him for years, and he and Paul were friends. And yeah. We had you know, a different Santa kind Barbara's of friendship. A small, that, yeah, well, they had yeah. a different kind of friendship. Yeah. But it, Santa Barbara was a very small place, right. and it was a New Year's Day party. I was really excited because Paul Williams had moved to Santa Barbara. And I'd finally gotten to meet him after all these years of being a fan. And he was just, you know, he was wearing a, like a... Like an Andy Gibb jacket, you know, if I can date it a little bit. So, 
Yeah, we, that was that was a very yeah. eventful day. Were you just yeah. friends with Robert Mitchum, or were you, you know? No, I was legitimately oh, friends. Oh, just friends with, yeah, yeah, legitimately yeah. friends with Robert Mitchum. Yeah, he, yeah for and, my whole and, life. Yeah. <clears throat> And I was rude, and, and the fact is that and then we met again, like at Feinstein's. I was performing at Feinstein's. It was at, by then I was, I think, 11 years sober, 12 years sober, and she, you know, she got to see the two different Paul Williamses, the one that looks like when he's not full of cocaine and vodka, and the, uh, who was you know, a little nicer than the older guy was and all. And, and happily, Tracy had, had you know, in the meantime, become this very successful screenwriter and, and somebody who had, had been exposed to a lot of people in recovery and had a real affection for what that process does which I was a fair example of you know I've been given my life you know Opie you and I've talked about oh, this boy, yeah. that I was you know I went from being face down on my own spittle to to the life I have today which is pretty impressive and, and uh, Tracy if says you say so yourself yeah if I say so <laughs> exactly. you should say yes. it it's yeah. an amazing story I mean everyone had you done yeah, I was gone. You were well, I, done, yeah, well, yeah. well, the documentary about me is called Still Alive. Right. That says a right. lot right there. I tried to actually do a TV show with him when I got to Hollywood. I was writing pilots, and I, my first, I just hadn't forgotten him since Mitchum's bedroom. And I said, my first day, I said, they said, what do you want to do? And I went, I'd love to do a TV show with Paul Williams. And they said, if you can load up a truck with cocaine onto the lot, you might have a shot. Oh, the reputation <laughs> was bad. Bad. Well, well, yeah, and you know, and I'd earned it too. I was worthy of every e evil word said about me. How so, many years were you partying like that? You know, I had a. Br I drank from the time I was about this high. I was like maybe thirteen, and then uh, I probably, you know, I had a brief little co little chemistry experiment with cocaine that lasted maybe twenty five years. Wow. I just, I did cocaine every day till uh, I, you know, I was forty nine when I got sober. I joked that I had the best child. Didn't have the best <laughs> childhood, but I had the longest. You know, right. forty nine. <laughs> 25 years. Yeah, I'll be I'll be 74 tomorrow. No. Oh. I'll be you know what? Let's go get a wow. cake, Roland. Yeah, you have called me more than once on my birthday. Well, I sure have. Yeah, exactly. So You're, I'll call you tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> so you've been sober 25 years. 24 years. Yeah. 24 years. 20, now, 25 in March. Do, do you have had any physical issues from um, physical problems because of the cocaine? No, no. I can Nothing. read through my You're notes. Lucky. Exactly. And I, I'd like to think I'm a little more attractive because I was pickled until I was 49. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. I can't marry that guy that I... Like, I was watching Smoking the Bandit the other day. Yeah. And I just can't... Hard films. That's a great... It's one of the best comedies ever done, though. And it's You're great, great in it. It is great. And I can't... Like marry the image of you now yeah. to that person. I cannot realize that that's the same person. It, it, you look physically very different, and yeah. just the attitude, even the voice, it's just, everything is different. People tell me that when they look at me now, Gary, Gary, you know, Gary Cooper comes to mind. Oh, I think I say Busey. And the cocaine did wonders for your hair. You got a full head of hair I got still, a full Paul. Head of hair and I don't dye it, you know. But it's the beard. You don't dye your hair. Bit, you know? When you said dye your hair, that was like a. Real <laughs> but but you know, to just Tracy and I, as we became friends, she. Said, you know, you know, the, well, I heard something from her that, I've, that so many people have talked about to me. They they wish they had some sort of a process like what we have in recovery, and that was the beginnings of the book. And she, because she's done this before, she kind of took me by the hand and walked me through the process. I write three hours, she writes seven to nine, and so uh, you know, it was a perfect partnership for a lazy old guy. Right. Were you good collaborating with having? I don't like having my stuff edited. I get really weird if someone, like, if I write something or put an idea down, they're like, ah, I don't know if that's the right thing. Did you get too territorial about stuff if she wanted to change things? No, no, because no. she made it better. Oh, okay. Was, yeah, when it's like, oh, okay, they make it better, but I'm gonna, then I, when we get out on in public, I'll tell everybody it was my work. You know? Right, Tracy. Did you know anything about recovery? Did you? Were you? I've never been in it. No, right. and I, I didn't know. I, I'm learning a lot. I've always been really envious of people in recovery. I sort of have recovery envy, uh -huh. if you can imagine. But I was the girl who believed me for madness. I was literally that person. Oh, I yeah. walked out of that film Terrified. and went, gateway drug, I'm not touching anything. And I literally never did. So we really are the yin and yang of that experience. Because I was in Hollywood, I went to parties, there'd be bowls of cocaine inside this room, and I just eh, walked out. Right. So... But I was really envious of what people had who were in recovery because they just seemed nicer after they'd been these real jerks. Then all of a sudden they were these really enlightened souls. So something mm. had to happen on that journey that I kind of thought everybody should have. Like, right. what if we all just went to recovery? Wouldn't right. that be cool? And as you pointed out, we all have something to recover from. Every one of us does. So I just really, you know, I'd had all these friends. They were terrible, then they were terrific. Most people sort of have moments of being terrible. Let's all be terrific. And that was my idea, that this just really, there's nobody who can't benefit from those really simple things. And, and, and it really makes sense as not like solving a problem, just as far as just like living your life, the well, stuff that's in the book? I think if you have a problem, 
the book applies. Right. But they're just little things on a daily basis that the book applies. Yeah, right. You can be you can be an addict. Life. Well, Paulie and I call it two things. It's either life limiting. Or it's life threatening. So obviously, right. what Paul went through was seriously life threatening because God knows we've seen too many people who have vanished because right. of this, and that's a tragedy. Yeah. But then there are people who are just always in their own way, right? They're just the people who never get the job they want, the person they want, the life they want. They're so they're the victims. They're right. the, what you name it, they can benefit from this. Because their personalities, like right here, I just opened a book randomly. It says something needs to change, and it's probably me. Yeah. No, I disagree with that, of course. <laughs> well, <yeah. laughs> Don't you dare, Jimmy. Don't you dare. We put the probably in it. You know, like the, one of the first things we have to do is identify. There's a footnote that you're excluded. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that, you know, that's that probably is really important for somebody to kind of try it on. You yeah. look at your life. What isn't working? Are you addicted to your iPhone? You know, are you, are you a, 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 a gossip, a rumor monger? Are you a victim all the time? She wrote an amazing chapter called uh, uh, Reaching for a Bottle of Disappointment. There's, there's, <laughs> there's all these people, all these things in our lives you know that are, are life limiting and the fact is you, you may be in a relationship with somebody you hate and you're related to them and stuck with them they may never change but the fact is the way you relate to them can change something needs to change and it's probably me is the gateway the gateway affirmation to changing your life to owning that, the, that right. you're the one that can fix the problem I'm looking here at a shopping list of bad behavior and like a lot of times these books they're like alright but this, this is actually the first thing you say the, this examples of like I guess of like you know people who are behaving in kind of shitty the rageaholic the workaholic emotional anorexia um the bet meddler i guess that means that somebody who's always getting involved in everybody exactly. else's <laughs> solving um, your problem the hibernator the victim like this it really covers every person i've ever interacted with that's the thing you see it really does and, and people walk around not knowing it and then they just go oh my life sucks my life sucks my mm -hmm. life sucks and you're the problem you're the problem you're the problem when you got Eh, maybe you're the problem. You know, not yeah. you. Again, you're you're exempted. No, no, no. I always say when I point one finger, three are pointing at somebody else. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> The book's called Gratitude and Trust, Six Affirmations That Will Change Your Life. You know, I've, I've, it started out with me saying that basically my choo-choo runs on twin rails of gratitude and trust. I'm grateful for everything that ever happened. I mean, everything that ever happened to me, including the mess-ups, the screw-ups, mm. the stumbles, you know. Because no in my life has been a gift. If I don't get, you know, I wanted to be an actor. I, I felt like Montgomery Cliff, but I looked like Haley Mills, so it was really <laughs> hard for me to get a job as an actor, you know. So I didn't get what I wanted. But what I got was I took the way that felt, picked up a guitar and started doodling. And out of that, no, I got a life, you know. So in my life, gratitude is huge. And trust is, is the antidote to fear, you know. I mean, you're, you, you just had a major life-changing event in your life right now and everything. But at a certain point, you got to trust that there's everything in, the, in what's going on around you and in the center of Opie's chest to walk through this thing and have let things get better. Okay, God, I knew that was going to happen. Hey, what, you know, He's not used to people being nice to him. He's just he's and he just, shouldn't you know. be. And he shouldn't be. <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah, it's it's a little strange without yeah. um, Anthony. I, I guess you're, uh, yeah, you know, yeah, of course, you know, referring to that. There's but, a little but, guilt but, associated yeah. with it because you know we're we're doing our thing here. He's doing his thing there, and yeah. well, I don't know. It's we miss him. Uh, yeah. We yeah. absolutely weird. miss him. And by the way, yeah. this part is not a replacement. No, no. I, just, no. I don't know. I'm just in the seat. <laughs> yeah, you know, but you know, it's good because otherwise it would be empty. I, yeah. yeah, it's weird I'm sitting over here though. Spout pure wisdom. Are you going to write a book on your life? You know, I no, I don't think so. I think I don't. Oh, I mean, man, never Paul. say never. But you know, you have some great story. Oh, I could Paul. remember big hunks of it. You know, <laughs> that documentary a, was so good. Thank you. And the amount of book, detail you could do, right? Yeah, in a book, you could really get into some there's stories. A, there's a lot of maybe villain. My, you know, the thing is that you know the, because Tracy has these stories about what I was like then and all, and you know there are other people with other stories. I suppose I could round them up and say what was I really like, but I'm not sure my heart could take it. <laughs> oh, okay. How many How many years do you think? you don't remember well I think that you know it's a progressive disease I don't know when I crossed the line from use to abuse to full tilt addiction but I would say that the 70s were amazingly productive you know it dis despite the growing usage of, of, of alcohol and other drugs I think by the 80s I mean I well, you know you're an alcoholic when you misplace a decade yeah. I just I was gone for the I didn't know that Reagan was president you got to be kidding me it's like, it's like I was I was I I went from 48 Eight times shots on the Tonight Show, sitting on that couch forty-eight times, to hiding in in my bedroom. You know, in the eighties.
Wow. Because I couldn't find, you know, one of the elements of alcoholism is, is isolation. You, Did you get you arrested? Hide. Never got arrested. You know, I wish I had been. I would, probably would have gotten sober earlier. And you just stayed home for 10 years? Well, every now and then I go out and have a little, little, little you fun, know, take me a little something to take home yeah, with me. Or little... with a, you drive a Ferrari with a pistol and a bottle of vodka. Yeah. Well... I mean, how awesome is that? Wow. <laughs> yeah, that's something you should do sober, even if you're not drinking it. <laughs> you're talking to half of Opie's following right now. Wait a minute. No, a Ferrari, not fucking Buick. <laughs> <laughs> okay, a pickup. <laughs> you, you drank that much, you needed the vodka in the car. You know what, Opie? I would. I had a house up in Montecito, which where we met. I also had a house down in. in, in I was a, a weekend father after I left my wife and kids. I go pick my kids up, and I couldn't make it the ninety miles from from Montecito to Santa Barbara to the house in L.A. without a drink and a toot. And I would, you know, I mean, I did exactly what my dad did. My dad drank drunk as a skunk in the car with me standing in the seat behind him. I did the same thing with my kids. You know, I would I would actually make my kids look away so I could sneak a toot. I couldn't go that long without a toot. I'd say something like, "Is that cow on fire?" And they would look over and say, well, "Cow on fire!" And look away, and I'd sneak a drink or a toot. You know, wow. wow. Yeah. But they they had to have known. Well, it's interesting because they were so small. You know, I mean, I, okay. I got so I had my last drink in '89. My sober date's March 15, 1990. But but my son was eight when I got sober. My and my daughter was like six. Oh, so I sat down with them and I said, you know what, let me explain what happened. If you'd been better kids, I wouldn't have had you. <laughs> it's all your fault. <laughs> Daddy hurt himself yeah, yeah. because of you. Yeah, it's all your fault. <laughs> and they were, I mean, at six, my daughter, who's now a social worker, you know, it, it looked at me and she went, God, Dad, you're so sick. I went, exactly, I have a disease. I have a disease. of a, So my children have turned into amazing adults. They did a great job of raising me. They did. <laughs> now I had to finish. And she had to finish. Yeah. Why the pistol, by the way? Were you licensed? I had a CCW to carry. He was paranoid. Yeah. A little paranoia. Yeah. Yeah. Kicked well, in. It's, it's it doesn't happen with cocaine. You know, beyond yeah. paranoia, it's also, but Tracy, it has to be a classic example of grandiosity. I mean, what did I think it was? Sinatra? Nobody was going to try to kidnap me. They were trying to get away from me. <laughs> I just had to give you and a Ferrari and a you know a bottle of vodka and a armed. There's something about that I have a really hard time with. <laughs> now wait a minute. Do you find it a little attractive though? I mean, yeah, it right. sounds pretty cool, frankly. <laughs> I didn't. You can see the grins. Just I like. did not date guys who like packed. No. But that's the problem. Oh, you've been perfect couple. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you mean a gun? <laughs> <laughs> that is such a that is such a problem. Like all the all of the crazy stories, and I know that in some ways it was a dark part of your life. But when you hear like getting high with Robert Mitchum or driving a Ferrari with vodka and a, and a gun, it all sounds like the coolest stuff you could possibly do. Yeah, yeah it is until you talk to the people that live yeah, with me. Yeah, it's a problem. You know? Right. It sounds awesome, but... Uh. Yeah, but the reality... Oh. Yeah, the reality is you have two kids that didn't have a dad that was there for them. The reality is you could have crossed that line driving to Vegas and smashed into a car full of kids and people yeah. and killed them. Wow, yeah, yeah. Tracy. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Well, which a lot of people do. Yeah, the guy who killed Sam Kinison. The guy who killed Sam Kinison was a young drunk driver. And he was sober. Sam then. was sober. Yeah, and he was sober then. Yeah. That was tragic. Yeah. Seventeen-year-old yeah. drunk driver. I think. And back then it was a little different. Even around 1991, 92, the kid. I don't even know if he went to jail for that. He got arrested, and, and I think it was more like he just did, it wasn't an automatic prison sentence. Even in the early nineties. At the yeah. top of my gratitude list is that I didn't kill somebody or myself, or really yeah. injure somebody sure. to that extent. It was just you know. So there's always something to be grateful for. Back to that's this process. Is has for the last two years been the greatest addition to my life because while we're writing this book, we're also working the, these affirmations, you know. And I mean, the third one is I will learn from my mistakes and not defend them. There's a huge lesson in in, in me screwing up e even today. And 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 once in a while, for example, I thought we were supposed to be here at nine o'clock. We we're supposed to be here at a quarter to nine. I own. I that. did tell you that though. You didn't. She did tell me. So I would like to publicly apologize to the world listening today for showing up late for you guys. But oh my God! It's so cool to be here. What do you know? mean not defend it? Well, because the, the old Paul would have said, "Ah, oh, it wasn't my fault." You know, I, I was. Well, I had a black. My, alar be... my alarm didn't go off. Yeah, right. you were supposed to call me, Tracy. Why didn't you call me? I mean, it's, this is what we do, right? Right, you know, right. It's like no one says, "Hey, I just screwed up. I wasn't looking at my watch. I was, right. I was tweeting. I was in the shower. Yeah. I just forgot. I'm really sorry." Yeah. Then you go, right. "Okay, we're all human. We all do that." But it's when you blame other people for yeah. your mistakes, which yeah. a, a lot of people do. 
I mean, none, right. of us, none of us could walk away and say, just, none of us have ever played You just got the time screwed up. Let it go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, but you <laughs> let it go. So, so it's a little late. Yeah. Yeah. Just an about example. Her. Just an example. Hey, Tracy has OCD. Her <laughs> oh, like, you don't know. <laughs> Tracy has OCD, man. He <laughs> said 9 o'clock. It's 9 one. <laughs> how, how bad is my OCD? Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. you know, if, the, if it wasn't for Tracy, this book would be done in about two years. Oh. Oh. In about two years, this book would be done. As, you know, but, but uh, yeah. Yeah, like, you know, and and while I was drinking and using, I became a chronic and habitual liar. I didn't even know I was lying half the time because I was always defending. You know, I was constantly breaking appointments. I, I had emergency dental work. That was bull. I would never. You know, I don't think I had emergency That's dental work ever. What's that? Defending a mistake. That's right defending there. a mistake. That's defending right a mistake. Yeah, exactly. Were, so, you, uh, no, were you abusive at all when you drank, or were you just kind of distant? Uh, Even verbally yeah. abusive. You know, no, not really. I, I think I just hit. You know, I was always a little lover. Little what could I tell you? I was no, a little you lover. Know. I was in the world. I, you know, I, my whole world was about ouch, mommy, pick me up and love me. I mean, I just <laughs> and when, and a little bit of confidence from the cocaine, and I knew that your wife wanted me. I just, I just <laughs> you, you, no matter who you were. You Did know? you get a lot of action because you had the cocaine around? I don't wish I could. That's the part I wish I could remember. You didn't get the action. <laughs> that's the part I wish I could oh. remember. <laughs> See, it only had an iPhone back then. Could There'd be a lot of selfies today. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh. It had all that whore bait and you didn't... <laughs> yeah. Did you just say whore bait? Sorry, Tracy. Oh, my God. I, 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 I say really bad Tracy, why, why didn't you get involved with the drugs and alcohol being in Hollywood all those years and around it constantly? Honest to God, I was just afraid. I, yeah. I, you know what? It's the OCD. It, 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 it's the OCD. <clears throat> I, the thought of losing control for me is much more frightening than having a good time. I really was. Right. I think, and, and I think the OCD was back then. I, I mean, as a child, probably 12, 13, 14, when my friends started using stuff. I just, the idea, I never, if I drink, I have to drive, I'll have half a glass of wine. I will never be over that limit. It's just, I'm terrified of authority, of losing control. My lists have lists. It's just, I couldn't do it, you know? But I just she, couldn't do it. She turned down drugs from some really famous people. The Gonzo uh, journalist. Uh, Hunter Thompson yeah, Hunter tried Thompson. to get me high. Couldn't you got to get high on Hunter <laughs> Thompson. And he said you that. Have he to. couldn't believe I wouldn't do it and i just went i don't think you have a choice yeah. right i said do you have some chardonnay and he's like, no, I don't want. And he opened this drawer and he's like i've got hash i've got coke i've got loose i mean you know it was just like you know this big it was like farm and i'm just going uh uh-uh, can't do it how, did, do how it. did you wind up there with him with where Hunter were Thompson? you yeah i was and it's i my husband's a rare book and manuscript dealer and he sells a lot of archives so we had to go out to aspen because he was selling his archives yeah. It was actually, it's actually great because it was Academy Awards and, and that's when I was writing a lot of screenplays and I always said to myself, I don't care about Hunter Thompson, I just want to watch the Academy Awards. And we get there and he just tried to get me high and I didn't want to do this. But he had his TV set up, this is, you guys will love this. He had his TV set up so every time he changed the channel, it would go to whatever you're watching to porn. And then back to whatever you're watching to porn. <laughs> so I'm sitting there, I'm getting like this contact high because there's so much hash in the room, I can't even believe it. And I'm like, all of a sudden it's like, you know, best supporting actor, but then it goes to like two girls having sex in a bathtub. I mean, you miss the best supporting actor. The whole <laughs> night went on like that. And then it would go to like films that were done about him. So there'd be Hunter and Johnny Depp driving down Sunset Boulevard. You know, a guy and a goat in a field. And then oh. they go back to Susan Sarandon giving some political speech. I missed the entire Academy Awards. Had a contact high. And I was just miserable. Most people would have loved it. I how, how was the TV yeah. set up that way? He was just I changing channels. He He's, must have he just rigged, been fucking around with no, the channels. No, he rigged his channel thing. So it would just always, there were these three sections it would go to. It was on a loop. Films that Hunter oh, was in. Oh, my God. Uh, porn and whatever you're watching so maybe you're watching cnn and it's like you know two guys yeah. going down each other. i mean that was what it was really it was it was quite of a setup and but gross. it made you a little crazy you know and he was crazy to begin with so yeah <laughs> he probably couldn't tell the difference he wasn't interested in recovery at all no and, and to gratitude list be grateful that you never met that man because you'd be dead by the right. <laughs> you lying there dead with an erection yes. oh you would have had such a good time yeah my gratitude list is now i have a new way to set my tv up <laughs> Sounds like a, per- a great thing to do. Phenomenal, yeah. yeah. <laughs> great Academy Award party coming up. Right. Yeah, how do you put on a timer like that? Unless he had another remote that would override the one you had and was just messing with you. He, I, he was. I mean, he was in charge. He, I mean, he had a setup in his kitchen that did not look unlike this, where he was behind a 
his little counter, and it was all there was a computer, and there was a phone, and there was, and it was so he, yeah, I mean, he was the master of that universe. He was doing something, but I wasn't getting to watch the Academy Awards. It says a lot about the, about this show that that the real focus of the conversation has turned on how do you set up your TV? Every other channel. <laughs> Right? <laughs> okay, we get it. <laughs> That's amazing. Was he nice though? Was he a pleasant guy? You know, he by that time, yeah, he was pleasant enough. You know, by that time, he was really fried. I mean, he died. He, shot, you know, he killed himself like maybe seven or eight months later. Oh, I mean, he was really at the end, and he was. It took its toll. Yeah, you know, I mean, you yeah. you can't do. There was a list on something recently. I don't know. It was Buzzfeed or what it was, but something about the amount of drugs that Hunter Thompson did a day. And it was. I mean, in, in the amount of time I was there, he must have drank this much scotch. Jeez. He must have done at least five joints. He smoked hash. He took pills. I mean, I was there three hours. I would have been in the hospital. Wow. Well, that was it. It would have been, but he and he did this day in, day out. He woke up at three in the afternoon. He stayed up until five or six in the morning. And I remember because I did His wife said it was really young, you know, much younger than he was. And she said, "Okay, after the Academy Awards that we were not watching are over, Hunter's gonna. Re we'll all get high, and Hunter will read from Fear and Loathing." Now most people would be like, "I'm so in." I was like, "If you don't get me back to the hotel in five minutes, what? I, I know." I walked away. I'm like really not a lot of fun. I'm, you know, I'm was really, he able to I'm read really it? Was he able fun. to read I, it at all? I left. I don't know. He probably could. You can't leave. I did. She's wow. driving me nuts. I know. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> She's a good girl. She's you know a good what? girl. I'm actually fun. I can be fun. Can I be fun? She can be a lot of fun. Uh, I can be a lot of fun. When I you have to say you? that, <laughs> who wants to hear yeah. some pompous ass read his own material? That sounds <laughs> awful. Good I for get you. high. Yeah. yeah. Good yeah. for you. Yeah. Yeah. Reading his own greatness. Boo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for five hours? Yeah. Exactly. You're right. Well, Tracy, Thank did you find, I mean, you live, you were pretty straight, but when you talk about this book and not being in recovery, did you discover stuff about yourself that needed to be corrected that wasn't oh, yeah. addiction? Oh, but I... Or did you... Yeah, I mean, I may not take drugs, and I may not drink, and I may not sort of, you know, watch porn all night. Well, I have, maybe. I don't remember. But I... I, I, yeah, I mean, I'm OCD. I'm controlling. I can be uh -huh. obnoxious. You're a goody two shoes. I'm, yeah. I'm a goody two shoes. I don't want to be. I'm not a goody two shoes. How does your OCD come out? Is it numbers? Are you a counter? Or I'm an everythinger. Everything is listed. Are you Everything a scrubber? is organized. Oh, when I get nervous, I clean. Oh yeah, I do every. I mean, it's it's a way of keeping the chaos away from me. And I think that a lot of what's in our book goes back to things that happened in your childhood. And people deal with anxiety in different ways. Some people medicate it. For me, it was always organizing. If everything in my world was completely together, mm -hmm. then that meant everything in the outside world might be completely together. And then everything inside of me might turn around and be together. Was your dad a drug or something? Like it works. My dad left when I was really young, and he was very he was psychologically abusive. So... Yeah, I have a lot of stuff of, of the supermarket. supermarket. Yeah, my dad, like, you know, he didn't physically abuse me, but he was, you know, I'd see him in the market in Santa Barbara, and he'd, like, roll his cart by me. He wouldn't talk to me for years on end for no reason. So I could never quite figure out what was up, and I just assumed everything was my fault, which is what happens to a lot of kids mm -hmm. who come from families where the truth isn't spoken, and you never know. So you think everything's your fault. That's the go-to place for kids. It's my mm -hmm. fault. Mommy and Daddy got divorced. It's my fault. Daddy drinks. It's my fault. Whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Daddy's not talking to me. It's my fault. So that sets up like a lifelong pattern of trying to fix other people, yeah. which can become an addiction. Did you right. figure out why he did that? Yeah, he's got so many issues. I just, you know, we got, the show's not long enough. But um, <laughs> it just, it's him. And it was his inability to father me. But right. mm. that that led to me picking the wrong guy for 20 years over and over. And that's a big problem for people. You know, you've got the same relationship in a different body over and over and over again. Yeah, then right. something needs to change. It's probably you. Why is, you know, this guy or this girl just like the last 10? Right. <laughs> and I think that's something a lot of people do. Of course they do. You know, yeah. they just find that same fault. I mean, I could walk into a party, 10 great guys. I go right to the one that's going to hurt me. It was like radar. Right. Beep, 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 jerk. <laughs> well, that becomes, she has to go into Robert Mitchum's bedroom to do it. Uh, well, you know, Robert, yes. But that becomes the addiction, right? Absolutely. Yeah. The addiction becomes saving other people. It becomes, if you can fix this person, that means you're okay. And there was nothing wrong with you before. I mean, it's a, and it's a weird thing, little trigger in your brain. And until you sort of start doing steps and looking into it, your behavior, you don't know why you're doing it. It just becomes... Re repetitious right. and you wake up and you're 40 years old and you go why does my life look just like it did when i was 17 <laughs> a lot of people do that it right. sounds like the ocd thing is a good way to cope though it sounds like that was a good structure to like well I, it you sounds know, positive actually 
I think if you have to have a problem, that's yeah. not. I mean, I had other stuff too, but I think if you have to have a problem, oh, being what's the OCD. Other stuff? Well, what do I do? Well, I told you I picked the do wrong tell. man. Yeah. I picked the wrong man. I, I do. I, I'm a spendaholic. I'm, a, I'm Tracy, and I'm a spendaholic. Okay. Um, what else do I do, Paulie? That's like I, I have temper. I mean, I, I didn't have a physical temper like I hit people, but I can be really a bitch. I, I can just take people down so fast. Yeah, I feel like that. before you. I feel that, Paul. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you I feel bad for you. Are you already being careful, aren't you? I'm being really honest. This book That's teaches smart. me to be honest. <laughs> I know, but I could. You know, I I would hurt you before you could hurt me. That's another thing a lot of people do. But you know, you people are very defensive. You've been hurt a lot in your life. A lot of people it doesn't mean you hit people. So I'm not remotely physical, but I could just you know verbally, I'll or I'll distance myself from you. I I just walk away. A lot of people do that. But if you follow the path, it's history. Interesting, because what you're essentially doing is is rewriting rewriting and putting a new ending on an old story, the story with Dad. You're going to write a new ending to that with a new person. All That was my second marriage. Absolutely right. They were right there and all. But you start rewriting those elements in your life, and what did you become? A what, writer. What did I become? Oh, I read a guess. Writer. So there has, you know, there. I think OCD. there's a connection there. I'm having a therapeutic moment. A what are, what are some know. of the stuff you wrote that we would know? I wrote, the last film I wrote, you'd know, it was called uh, Confessions of a Shopaholic. I wrote I wrote a film called The Guru, which you'd actually really like. I don't know if you ever saw that film. I'll send you guys. You'll you would like, like it. it a you lot. will like it. It's really Who's filthy. In it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's Marissa Tomei. Uh, it, it, it was nice. a film about an Indian guy who comes to this country and he becomes the guru of sex. Heather Thomas. Uh, uh, Heather. Heather Thomas. Uh, Heather. <laughs> Heather Thomas. Who had no Heather? Heather. Just remember. Graham. Heather Sorry, Graham. Heather. You're so sweet. I didn't mean that. Um, and I've re I made like four films, and I wrote, wrote nice. rewrote so many every romantic comedy probably. Um, many people have seen. And then she, I've, what else have I done? She also made a, an amazing film called Lucky Ducks, where she had a daughter, that, a 14 year old daughter, who just didn't appreciate what uh -huh. the hell was going on in this world, all the great things she had. So she took her to a school that she helps finance in India and said, You're going to work this summer for a couple of weeks. You're going to work in this school in India. So yes, I plunked her in a slum. I nice. took a 14 year old Upper East Side kid and I plunked her in a slum. <laughs> so that got a lot of attention. Did but it work? Did it help? Uh, yeah, she's fabulous. She's fabulous yes. now, but she's 24. I mean, yeah, yeah it didn't work. It, it, that was the film. It didn't quite work. But it, right. <laughs> it made for a good film. Right. But in that film, what I learned was I was the one who had to change. And it's interesting because it comes back to this book. What I book? learned There's this book, book the book you guys have. <laughs> oh, oh, the book. Oh, the book. Gratitude, gratitude and Trust. Gra it's called it's affirmations. Affirmations. It's Gratitude oh, and Trust, How to God. Fix All of the Broken People Around You. That's right. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. It's not called that. Six affirmations that will change your life. But I went to India to fix my kit. And I, and I learned in three years of shooting this film, the three weeks turned into three years, that it was me who needed to fix it. Right. And that, when you think about it, that comes back to this. That's kind of awesome, huh? What a nice turn, what a nice end to the story. I know, yeah. you see? Yeah, you see? You see, I got all gratitude and trust. Full circle. <laughs> exactly. It's always nice when things come around. Yeah, exactly. Paul, do you feel like you just got lucky that there wasn't, like, permanent damage? Oh, like, you see God. some guys, like, even if they recover, you could just tell that there's, yeah, they're, they're a little burnt or off. Yeah, yeah, they're just gone. You realize you're talking to somebody who left his glasses in a cab yesterday. You know, that <laughs> oh, that's we okay. all do that. Thank you. We, yeah. all, do we that. all do that. In all, but <laughs> I wonder how many people left their glasses in. If I should just say, if incidentally, if you're a cab driver and you found some glasses, <laughs> send them to ASCAP on <laughs> my day job. So, you know what? Yeah, it's, it, it's high on my gratitude list that I can still make a sentence, you know, because I have totally abused. I hid out. I abused. It was. I was a mess. So the the life I have today is beyond anything I could have imagined. First of all, it's, you know, I weigh 130 instead of 187, which was at my peak. Oh, you were 187? Yeah, he was oh, pudgy. Yeah. I was. I was good pudgy back then. And I thought I was cute. You yeah, know, like, you were yeah. kind you of were cute. cute. I, you were <laughs> cute. You, you can't say he wasn't. <laughs> you were cute. I had a crush on you. Yeah. But I was Porky. I was Porky. Porky McWilliams and all. But but you know, and I you run, were accessible. I, uh, Porky was accessible. Tracy, would you have? You know, back in the day. Back Paul in the Williams? day, Paul Williams. Sure, yeah, sure. <laughs> yes, those sure cool are. glasses. Yeah. I, love, my life I is, love those glasses. My life is good. My <laughs> life. That, that, remember that haircut, the long of the bangs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My love. Yeah, yeah. It was, Awesome. That Muppets appearance. One of my favorite things ever is that Muppets appearance when you sang on with the Muppets. Oh, I love that. Oh, I love it too. I mean, everything I did with the Muppets is high, high on my on my <laughs> list. I love to like, wake up in the morning, know you're going to go to work with Kermit. You're doing something right. Yeah. Were you sober at that moment? 
You know what? I, w- I was no, I wasn't sober, but I wasn't over the over the edge. Was with, Kermit with, you know, sober? Co- no, Kermit, <laughs> Kermit was, sober. was drinking terribly. At the time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and and he and Piggy were screwing around like crazy. You know, but but uh, no, you know what? It really got bad in the eighties and all. But it's interesting because I walked away from my music. I walked away from all of it when I got sober. Mm-hmm. I went to UCLA, got my certification as a drug and alcohol counselor. I, that's when I entered what I call the Pauli Lama period in my life. You know, I'll come touch the hem, I will strike that's, sober. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. To just leave yeah. music like you yeah. did but you know what it were you sick of it? I mean, look at daft punk look what happened this year i mean this is this is you know when something that you don't want happens to you or there's a major life change like what i'd like to think this crazy and i would like to think is offered in this book just stick around you know start working on the little things in your life and all of a sudden you'll find yourself i mean i'll, I'll be 74 tomorrow i want album of the year this year that's purely it's pretty amazing that's that's purely a gift of my recovery and and the best thing I can do is pass that forward. You know? right. And I d- had no idea how to do it until Tracy turned to me and said, I can show you how. You got a phone thing going on. What's going on with him? You, you won't let, let okay. go of that phone. Okay. He, what, what's okay. the deal? Okay. We used to what's be the friends, deal? Opie. What's the deal? <laughs> the, deal will be, well the deal is Paul Williams is a phoneaholic. He has replaced booze and cocaine. He, <laughs> he will not let go of that phone. <laughs> we were doing he a wants to look at it. I understand. <laughs> you we are, were on, turned off. <laughs> I, I, so we were on Oprah. We taped Oprah the other day. I had to take his phone away. You are not going on the set with Oprah with your telephone. Okay? That is like yeah, so we, dissing we Oprah. Did, we did Super Soul Sunday. And he's got his phone. We were doing a reading the other night in Brooklyn. I look down on the, on the podium. Yeah. I'm like, the phone is there. I'm like, I can't have your phone. <laughs> Grab. He is a phoneaholic. What's up with the phone, Paul? He can't put it. It, it gives you, know? you a dopamine rush like cocaine. I was reading an article yes, the other it does, day. Right? It gives you a. And now yeah. more people are addicted to these things. And if you think that in your phone, every vice you want well, look who's is right there. on his phone right now. Excuse, excuse me. He's probably Can tweeting. He's yeah. there with his phone <laughs> in his <laughs> lap. You know? well, you're right. It is a <laughs> dopamine yeah, rush. It's a yeah, dopamine right. rush. That's why it's so dangerous when you're texting and driving. Yeah, well, I, that I don't do. That I don't do. Do you know kids are learning to drive later now because they don't want to stop texting? There's my, what do you mean? The kids, like when I grew up in California, 16, I don't know where you guys grew up, yeah. but you, like, you yeah. went and got your 16. license, right? You yeah. got your license. Mm-hmm. Kids now are it's becoming 18. I have a 23-year-old, doesn't drive yet. Kids yeah. don't want to drive because they have to stop texting. Well, they also don't need to. They, they have the connection. We had to get in the car and go find, and find other shit. people. Yeah. I know. Exactly. Now yeah. you don't have to leave. Yeah. Yeah. But every everything you want that's bad for you that you can be addicted to, gambling, se- whatever, right? Yeah. It's, it's right here. Phone. It's right here. And new so information's always coming in, You're so that's right. the high. It's like, oh, what am I going to see? Who contacted better, me? Yeah. You know, even like my, my 14-year-old, I just got 88 likes on my picture yeah. of sushi. It's like, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I mean, your day is May. And then she goes, you took the same sushi, and you've only got four legs. You're not popular. I went, oh, brutal. I can handle it. <laughs> yes. That is brutal. Back, brutal. back to therapy for me. Okay, Liz. Yeah. Can you tell her what you've written in, in, in your life? Yeah, but I don't get 88 likes for my sushi. She doesn't, she doesn't but care? That, but not in her world. In her world, how many likes you get on Instagram is, is on your the way sushi. you're popular. On your sushi. But it is a dopamine thing. I didn't realize. Yeah. I, mean, I knew it no, was. It really it's 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 a big article in New York Times last week about it. And there was, yeah. It's literally, they're comparing it to, to, to cocaine, that you get this little charge, and every time you go in there and you go, who likes me? What's the message? Who... It's, yeah. it's, you know, I got nine mm. texts. It's fan mail. It's fan it. mail. Right. It's, right. Just, it's fan mail. Yeah. yeah. And so it's it's going to be a whole new thing that people need to get over. And that is why right. they're going to have to read Gratitude and Trust six affirmations. <laughs> but, but, you know, we're not that hooked into at Gratitude Trust or me at the letter I, the letter M, Paul Williams, or you at, at Tracy, Tracy Jackson, Jackson 4. 4. We're not really that wired into that <laughs> I, M, Paul Williams and Gratitude Trust. Mm. How did you yeah. find Daft Punk? Oh, I, they found me. They, they found you? Yeah, they were fans of Phantom of the Paradise. You know, they, I've got a couple yeah, things in my life that are... Me. One of the things you have to realize is that something that looks like a failure may pop up 40 years later and, and be a job. It's yeah. amazing. So they asked me to write a couple songs on the album, and then they asked me to sing one. And the next thing I know, I'm standing next to... It's amazing. Such yeah. a good album. It, it's, you know, that the only thing that was different so about the good. whole process is finding a way to bring it into a conversation every time you meet somebody. Yeah. yeah. But you're really that, good you at that. You deserve that one. You have mastered that one. Like like no one I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah. What do you yeah. think of ISIS? You have no Daft Punk just as well. <laughs> yeah, they yeah, seem incredible. like a bunch of punks. Well, you know, speaking of which. Yeah. I've got to tell you, the, the, the one thing that impressed me most about them, I think immediately, was first of all, I love I loved the, the music they gave me to write some words for. Yeah. But I love the fact they choose to be anonymous, that their egos are that much yeah. in check, that they care more about the work they're doing than they do about... Are they anonymous? I didn't know that. Yeah. Well, they, they, they wear their helmets. They, and the helmets, you know. Which they, look they don't like show the their fans, faces. Which look like the 
the Phantom of the Op- Phantom of the right. Paradise album. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. they're the same Paul, family. we only have yeah. a few so minutes great. left. It's your birthday tomorrow. We quickly went and got you a little something. Oh, oh nice. Oh. Tiffany ba- oh, Magnolia no. cupcake. Jesus, no, it's just cupcakes. You don't have to. This is radio, Paul. What are you like? It's just cupcakes. He goes, is it Tiffany? Jesus. It's a nice guy. It is. The box is Tiffany's. It's a lousy red velvet cupcake. Enjoy. Wow. Yeah. Can I get one too? It's like nice. diamond. I've always wanted one of these watches. Is it a Rolex? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a Dodgers hat. Well, it looks he wants another Ferrari. My, looks a little big on my wrist, but you know, look at that. It's just a stupid cupcake. Yeah, oh, happy like birthday. Oh. Uh, Enjoy your cupcake in the shape of a. Oh, I can't say that. If on my the daughter air. Instagrammed this, she would get 4,000 likes. <laughs> <laughs> She's so popular. Wow. You're a good friend. You guys have been just great to us. What, what are you doing end. for your birthday tomorrow? Yeah. Anything fun? What are we doing? We're what? taking you to dinner. Your New York family's taking you to dinner. Yeah. Oh, cool. We don't have a Tiffany gift for him. And I, you know what? I, I, my wife just got back from, from uh, Hawaii. She flew back back to uh, Hawaii. She, she was in, Ka- in Kauai and flew back last night. So I will talk to my wife in the morning. We'll see her Sunday. She was, you know, then we're heading out on the road we for like the road. five weeks. To so promote the book. Right? Yeah. A lot of book signings and stuff. A lot. Yeah. Oh, All over. Great. So they're... Uh, they're lining up to see. You can come out and see him live. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You guys doing yeah. signings at all? Yeah, we've got one tonight. We have one tonight at Barnes and Noble at eighty six on the Upper West Side. Oh, okay. At Seven yeah. o'clock. Exactly. Cool. One of the last Barnes and Noble. That's a good one. Yeah, I know yeah. exactly what it is. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Broadway, I think. It's a yeah. nice store. I've been it's in there a, a few store. times. Yeah. yeah. So life is good. How was Oprah? Oprah was oh, a. Talk awesome. to them about Oprah. Were you intimidated to be in front of Oprah? She makes it so easy. Yeah. I mean, yeah, like the 24 hours don't? before. You guys are awesome. All you guys right, are thanks. amazing. This is, this is one of the most fun interviews we've had. No, without question. How, how, how I'm nowhere else. Like, I couldn't go on Oprah and talk about Hunter Thompson and, you know, his porn. No. Um, she probably love that. Yeah, I, I think uh, Oprah would secretly love that. You know what? She was really cool. She was so kind. Did she you, was so, uh, she was so sweet. She did really me, did. Did you meet Eric Logan? He's our old boss. We did not meet Eric Logan. Meet yeah. Him. He's pretty much running Oprah. Yeah. He runs around. He's a, he's a he odd it. little man with a haircut like a Roman. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> no, yeah. No, he's very inconsequential. He shows uh, too many teeth when he smiles now. Yeah, he's a creep. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know what's, David, I don't know what's going David on with our club. David Zaslav, who you know, is head of Discovery and, and started o- the OWN with Oprah, I think, is the one who sent the book to, to, to Oprah. And she read it. And, and her response was storybook. I mean, she'd hold it up and say, this is the bestseller, you know, and, and wow. the perfect gift and all. And it can change lives. And it just, I mean, it was, you couldn't have written it any better. But this this is this is the great thing about working two years. For, uh, to me, the, the, a, a woman at her best you can describe as a great broad. Tracy's a great broad. I, I mean, it's like say Oprah was a great broad. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> Tracy, is, Tracy is a great broad. Oprah made you. I wanted to crawl into her lap and have a good cry. I mean, she just because <laughs> she just sold you hundreds of thousands of books. That's why. Well, but she's also got that might, mommy thing. I mean, I just you know she's. He's going to crawl into your lap after this too. Laura, just be prepared. Well, I've done that, and no, it's just look, not the same. Look, you, I mean, you know, you're nice saying when this was the most fun interview, it's but fun. but Oprah sold you probably two hundred thousand books easily. We might have sold. You twelve, Paul. Today, okay. Yeah. But you gave us cupcakes. But this is family. Oh, but you gave honest. us cupcakes. Opie, this is family. We started out arguing two hundred eight years ago, and, and, and now I know this is a safe place. I love Paul Williams for real. <laughs> Gratitude and trust: six affirmations that will change your life. Paul Williams and uh, Tracy Jackson. Yeah. Odd question. Do you remember the first question she asked you? Uh, Oprah. Yeah. Oh, what, no. Was it a, a boring question, or was it no. like a? No. Little, I mean, or was no, it like no, a real? Because no. oh, yeah. sometimes I heard her say one time they asked her, "What would you do if you interviewed?" And I forget who it was at the time that was in a scandal, and she said oh, the first question would be really hard or to the yeah. point. I'm like, I, I think her first question is usually the tough. But then maybe that's but you know, was a scandal. But you know, this is a very different show. This is her show, Super Soul Sunday, which is she's not doing her. As you guys know, she's not doing her other show anymore. Mm-hmm. She gave that up. And this show is really all about spirituality and improving the world and making people feel good. And there was nothing. And she had all sorts of information that she could have asked. And she never went for the jugular. She never. A- she asked. She's penetrating not. questions about the book. And I think she started out asking, she said, well, she was really friendly. She said, you know what, we've just been singing We've Only Just Begun. That was the first thing she said. And she was there. talking about We've Only Just Begun and Paul's music. But she never did anything that was remotely 
aggressive or trying to get to anything or unearth anything. She just really wants this show about making people feel good, and she really makes you feel good from the second she walks in. You just can't quite believe it. Actually, the first question was asked. We, we drank the Oprah Kool Aid. I mean, whatever the, it is. Yeah. In the green room, she asked us how, to write on iPad on an iPad our fa the most one word that it was, was our favorite word, and you wrote truth. And I wrote kindness, and you know, and so that was the first question. What's a word that that is your like a favorite word? I got. Not, Glenn Anthony wasn't good. here. <laughs> I got one. Can you say it on the I, air? Yeah. Boring. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so good to be back. <laughs> I got one. <laughs> I saw Jimmy's eyes light up. I was like, oh, no, what's coming out? You didn't give her your phone number on that piece of paper? I, no. <laughs> I've watched Super Soul Sunday, for real. The Russell Simmons one. She does a very good job. She does that. a really good job. Uh, Uncle Rush. I love Uncle, Uncle, I love Uncle Rush. He you comes follow, in here and he kills it for us. Do you follow his tweets? Uh, yes, mm -hmm. I do. I do too. They're great tweets. She asked him what he ate for breakfast. I like. It. I mean, that's she does. She asks you that kind of stuff. Like, what's your favorite thing? What, how, how do you like your coffee? It's really. It's not hard. I mean, but it's it's sweet. It was great. It was sweet. Yeah. All right. It was nice. I think we got to get you out of here. Have to wrap yeah. up. Yeah. Um, we have to go eat our cupcakes now and get a sugar high. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. So tonight Enjoy. you can see them at the Barnes and Noble on 86th Street. What time is that? Seven or six? Seven o'clock. 86 and Broadway. Paul Williams. He will talk about Daft Punk, maybe. Yeah. Gratitude and trust. I really want to read this. I'm not just saying that because you're here. This actually looks really good. I think, Thank I'm, you. I think I'm going to read it. Yeah. I, could, I could use a little something. something. A little I, I'm going to read it. I'm going to read a couple chapters. We can all, we can all improve. I'm, I'm going to get past the fact that you have to read 20 pages before you get to page one. Here's that's 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 we, did have, we can say it on this show. We did have a chapter called Dealing with Dicks. Yeah, which we changed which to navigating changed the nasties. To navigating the nasties. Yeah, but dealing oh. with dicks is a great chapter. That could, could be misinterpreted as a positive how-to book. Yeah, 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 well, that's, that's true. That's the second book. you got to get through an introduction, then you got to get through Tracy's path, yeah, but, yeah, then you get to yeah, Paul's no, path, no, 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 and then no, no, finally no, page no, one. Oh, you read Tracy's path and Paulie's path, and you find out all those horrible but secrets you wanted to talk about. with page one with all that? Because I didn't Well, it is kind of page one. It's just the way it's broken down. Yeah, But then you read 20 pages and realize you haven't even started the book yet. Well, Opie had a hard time in school. Not a homework assignment, <laughs> Opie. <laughs> <laughs> Opie had a long, that's his, too hard That's road. Opie's OCD with numbers, though. He's got, like, really? OCD, too. I'm not, even, a numbers I'm thing, not yeah. even joking. We could, you know, if you would like, <laughs> I have a lot of time, and I'm good with this. After the, after the so I will renumber your book oh, for you. Beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> okay, I'll sit down with a Sharpie, and we'll go one through 290, okay? It'll just, it'll just feel right if you okay, do that. Okay, I'll do that for you. Do you know my favorite word? she means it. I know. I know. My favorite word is Sam. Sam. This is my friend. Hi, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> See you guys. Good seeing you guys. Absolutely. Tom Pop. See everyone. you soon. It's the best of the week. Welcome to OB Radio Accelerated. A look back at everything that happened this week in the world of OB Radio. Featuring OB, Jim Norton. My Wife Hates Me with Rich Foss and Bonnie McFarlane. Sam Roberts Friday Show. Weird Medicine with Dr. Steve. The Joe Rogan Experience. It's Eric Nagel. Friends of the Show. And more. Opie with Jim Norton. That would suck. But I'll tell you what wouldn't suck is having fucking 23-year-old girls getting out of my fucking bed with my load in their mouth. That would balance <laughs> out the fact that I couldn't eat what I wanted. That you're eating just dry salad every day and yeah. a couple of almonds. I'm humiliating myself on Tinder for the last fucking two weeks. Oh, oh you doing well? No. <laughs> no, not I'm not. Not even a hit? I've gotten some hits. I've gotten some hits. I've gotten some hits. By uh, what? Some pigs? Yeah. A couple pigs? <laughs> <laughs> I got a few cute girls, though. Because you fucked up your age thing. Yeah, I know. Oh, yeah, I did talk about this. You yeah, just said 38. I know. And then you would have, you know, and then, then they could decide when they realize you're way older than them. I know, I know. Especially now I didn't shave my head, so I was fucking grazed all over the place like fucking stupid poly walnuts. <laughs> I, I, but I'm hoping I can get girls with daddy issues. That's At, at like 46, now, I'm hoping I can get some girl that like wants to fuck her dad. What, what was the best one you got so far? I, uh, and did you do anything? Yes. You did something. I wrote her. Whoa. And got nothing. <laughs> Fuck. There's one that's really beautiful who I liked. How old? Mid 20s or late 20s? Demir Specs. Uh, I'll show you a picture of her on the break. She's a. Uh, but she checked you, and is it. You check each other, or how? Yeah, does but this work? I just, now that I'm thinking, she must have just swiped the wrong way by mistake. Oh, you swipe? <laughs> yeah, you swipe right for like and, and, and left for nope. And I'll bet you I was. Did it take your swipe back if you fucked no. up? No. 
Oh, that's got to suck if you if you thought she really liked you and she just swiped the wrong way. It was probably, I bet if I sat and talked to her, she would go, oh, I remember you. Yeah. I was showing my girlfriend and we were laughing and as a joke, I was like, maybe I should like it. And it went too far and went like. Uh. That's probably what happened. It was some kind of a fucking fluke. Because I wrote her a couple of uh, messages or a message. And uh, then she finally, got, I wrote her two, and then she finally got back to me. And I wrote her again, and she has not gotten back to me. No. So, but I'm not, like, stalkerish. I'll just kind of uh, just go away and not bother somebody. But then I'm thinking she's probably got a lot of Tinder hits, and she might not check it that often. Mm -hmm. So I keep convincing myself, well, maybe. And that's the, only, that's the only one you got so far? No, I've gotten a few. But, I mean, that was the one that I kind of was like, hey. And got. Uh, How close are you to sticking a pig? No, I don't know if I'll do that. I mean, um, no, no, I've never been into total pigs. I mean, I can find something sexy about most people, right? But uh, I, I haven't. Um, I won't fuck somebody I don't want to fuck. So, how bad are some of the other ones that that liked or swiped uh, properly? Well, they're willing to fuck because they swiped right. Like that should tell you. There's not much. Did they're they're in the same boat I'm in. How bad are their pictures? I'll show them to you. Oh, I can't wait. Yeah, I'll show you some of them. I gotta see this. I'll show you one while we're on. I, I won't. Uh, you know, because it's within a certain radius. So some of these were probably when I was traveling from Syracuse. I was doing it in the car. Mm -hmm. And, you know, within a certain radius of that. So some of them might be from 50 miles from here. Right, right. They might not be from, uh, you know, close. It's fucking The pictures brutal. he just showed me were just brutal. Fucking One brutal. after another, brutal. You're a very successful stand-up comedian, sir. And they don't care. And radio personality. And the one and overall uh, good guy. The one I like just... There, needs, there so, needs to be an app for people wanting to fuck celebrities. Well, that one's all right. Yeah, I like her. That might be a tranny, though. No, I thought the same thing. You did, right? Yeah, no. Um, someone's saying you could delete your account, change your age, and it'll get you more ladies. Do you know how to delete your account? No, because it goes through your Facebook. I don't want to go through the whole thing. Yeah, you just you have to sign up not using Facebook. Either that or you got to change your date of birth on Facebook. Oh, how do you know, Dr. Steve? Mm -hmm. well, what's going on there? <laughs> what do you got? I actually did a couple stories on Tinder on my show. Oh. Weird Medicine on the Riotcast Network and uh, Sirius XM. Nice, nice, nice cover-up. It looks like someone got caught with a Tinder wrap. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, it's for the show. Yeah. for the show. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's really weird. I don't see meeting a wife on this uh, app. There's just there's too many people popping in and out, and there's hookers. It's it's like a whole. Do you want a wife? No, but I mean, you know, I don't know what I want. I may, you know, want somebody that I go out with a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know, it would be nice at this mm -hmm. point. Fucking forty six. Doing. I mean, I, I have a fun life. But I I literally do nothing. Like I'll, I'll come to the show, and then afterwards I go to the gym, and I'm done. By like noon, right? And sometimes I got shit during the day, but I'm like, fuck, man, I would love to hang with somebody and just travel. If a little you want bit. to find a nice girl, go to church, Joe. No, I don't want a nice girl. I want a. a <laughs> he wants I, a little dirt. I want a pretty girl yeah. who's a real pig. Um, you know, I, I have a really weird list of requirements. You need a little dirt. A you lot need a little. Dirt. I, I need a lot of you dirt. You need a little dirt in your relationship. Yeah, a lot of it. Weird medicine with Doctor Steve. Hey, Doctor. Steve, my name is Dan from Chicago. Uh, I was having sex with my girlfriend a couple weeks ago. Um, pretty sure that she thought that she was close to her period. And uh, after sex, we had not used the condom. After sex, uh, I felt a little tingling. And when I went to pee to uh, avoid getting a UTI, uh, some blood came out, but then the urine uh, cleared out and it just looked like regular urine. So I was Wondering if maybe the blood had to do with her urine or, or her period coming up. Um, I am I a substantial size, so nice. Of course, she thinks that I might have <laughs> Show up a little too far, but if you could let me know. It's okay. <laughs> okay uh, yeah, he probably pounded menstrual blood up his cock hole. Oh. <laughs> so, the lifting and thrusting created a vacuum. Yeah, where else is it going to go? Yeah. So, yeah, that it, now, if it recurs it, at a time when he isn't having sex with his girlfriend on her period, then he needs to get checked out. And uh, Dr. Steve's rule of 
of blood in the stool, but also blood from the cock hole, is that you get it checked the first time. Yeah. After that, you can blow it off if they say it's completely benign. But um, in this case, uh, yes, it's possible since he voided right afterward that he might have had some. Uh, blood that got pounded up there because of his giant meaty member. <laughs> oh yeah, and uh, and it was uh, caught in the the tip of the urethra, and when he peed, it came out. And he said it was right before she had her period. So like, how soon? Like before? Well, she was probably already bleeding. She I'm assuming probably... it, that he that she started bleeding right afterward, or he would have called and not said that. Right. Mm-hmm. You know. Right. So uh, did he tear anyway. something up? Maybe, or is it just her menstrual? <laughs> Yeah, if he's I'm, so hung. I'm, dude, I wasn't there. I'm just, you know, this this show. The best we can do is sort of give uh, a, a a close approximation of what might be right. happening in some alternate universe, <laughs> not necessarily our own. Yeah, because that's, that's, that's why we have the disclaimer at the beginning. I don't know. I just, know. but it's possible that he pounded menstrual blood up his cock hole. Yes. Wow. Other. Otherwise called the urethra and GVAC. What's the opening of the urethra? Uh, uh, the outside called? Do uh, you remember? Oh, sure. That's the. Uh, well, well, why don't you say it, Scott? <laughs> the the pee pee hole? Yeah. You assholes. <laughs> GMAC does not listen to this show. I He's do. Here. I just don't retain this he shit. He comes here. That's where and he, he keeps sits all there. of his change in his truck. And but he he I, it doesn't matter what okay what's the herpes on the thumb called uh, 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 Whitlow they're very good see all right all right, all right. Cool, dude. See. it's just it, it's uh, up there after the sixth time yeah after you say this one I'll go oh yeah I knew that <laughs> okay but what is it what's the, the meatus but it's spelled meatus M E A T U S so oh, that's <laughs> great that's, a, a few people have mispronounced it meatus. <laughs> It's so great. Where's my meat is it? <laughs> I had blood coming out my meat is. <laughs> so anyway. So, so that's, that's a, the technical term for your pee hole? Yeah, meatus. meatus. Urethral meatus. Yeah, urethral. meatus just means opening. You can have meatus is all over. Right, right, Technically. Right. So is your anal meatus your asshole? Well, no, yeah, I mean, kind of. But, okay, now i got to look it up because... <laughs> I've never heard that, but let's look up meatus real quick. Sorry, everybody. Yeah, hell of a way to curse someone out. Well, yeah, I guess so. It's a natural body opening or canal. Wow, well, there let's you see go. Here. So external you can have like acoustic meatus is the, the opening of the, the ear, ear canal. All right. Yeah. The Not internal cool. auditory meatus is canal in the temporal bone of the skull. That's right. Yeah. The urinary meatus, the opening of the urethra, situated on the glands, penis in males, and the vulva in females. Vulva. And then the superior meatus, middle meatus, and inferior meatus of the nose, but they don't refer to anything else uh, prudes. as meatus. Hmm. Hmm. Very good. Well, there you cool. go. Cool. All right. Meatus. Delightful. I'll try and remember that one, but don't count Just on think me. mate. But, yeah, uh, mate. Uh, I used the word monastic on O and J today to... Uh, to uh, describe my sex life with my wife. <laughs> and Opie just said, I'm not even looking that way. <laughs> monastic. But monastic just means monk like. Yes. yes. Like, like I live in a monastery. I'm very peaceful. I'm, you know, I'm not mad about it. It's just the way it is. It's so easier it's, this way. It is much it's easier. easier. And. and, and, and when I had a monastic relationship with my previous wife, all I could think about was fucking other women. <laughs> and I don't have that. I'm okay. Okay. You know, so. So either you're satisfied or you're just getting old. <laughs> yeah. I'm getting old. I have this brain injury, too. You know what that. Oh, God, this is just about me. Oh, God damn it. I am getting old. <laughs> I think he's I've got he, a I, broken he, thing. I've got this. This, I stubbed my toe. Uh, yeah, I, <laughs> his urine's dribbling down the inside of his leg. I've got um, no. I can. I don't have to make up anything. I got some fucked up shit going on. I've got that um, my back thing and the spondylolisthesis, which is where the the bones of my spine don't line up, <laughs> and and so it's causing it's putting pressure on one of the nerves, and so now I've got sciatica. Oh my god! <laughs> I've got my sciatica. <laughs> Oh God! And then, uh, yeah. Next thing, next thing, thing you'll have. And, oh yeah, now and then, I don't remember what the other thing is. So that's one of the other problems that I'm forgetting things. Oh yeah, and I have the empty cella syndrome where my s- stupid pituitary is gone. And I, the 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 sick thing about it is, I'll probably live to be a hundred because everybody in my family did knock on wood. But I'm going to be a just a 
basket case. Oh. But you won't know that you're living to be 100. Well, maybe. Oh, shit. Hey, listen, we're here. We'll take care of you. That's right. That's why we're friends. And I need you to take care of me, quote, unquote, if I get like that. Understood. Because I need to croak before my term life insurance runs out. If <laughs> exactly. I'm going to be demented, I just need to go on. So That is the damn I, truth. Because my wife will get to double dip. She'll get my retirement plus... She won't have to pay the nursing home because she won't. Uh, I'll be in a nursing home, guaranteed. Oh yeah, and I mean, <laughs> that'll be the first thing she does. The first time I shit myself, I'm in the nursing home. Sam Roberts Friday Show. So when you do a movie like this, uh, Hector and the Search for Happiness, does that start to like play in on you figuring out happiness and all that? Or are you pretty secure in yourself? It did. Yeah. What What's been interesting is talking about it afterwards, been promoting it more than even when we were making it has. Had, totally helped me understand certain things about happiness and clarify certain ideas that I might have already been percolating but not really thought about just about what it means to be happy and and how to be happy you know and um it's a fascinating thing I think the message of the film ultimately is that you can't just have happiness you you've got to have it all because otherwise you never know you can't know what happiness is by comparison you have to have the downs as well as the ups right because otherwise there's no context for your happiness in in modern sort of affluent societies like we live in we're getting less and less context for our happiness we're so pampered looked after we don't have to survive we got a lot of choices there's so many channels so many places to eat toilets, toilets. we don't have to we don't have to evacuate <laughs> ourselves over some hole there in the ground actual toilets you can sit on yes and that makes us a little bit unclear about what's great and what's not yeah whereas if you if you if you walk into a a society where life is a little bit more uncertain you'll see people happier in a way and and not not because their lives are better but because they know what happiness is more keenly because they know what happiness isn't like i know to be happy i have dinner yeah like right? the fact that i have this sandwich in front of me yeah, is yeah, something yeah. to be happy about whereas if you wake up in the morning and think oh i'm not i haven't been shot while well, i've been asleep your happiness is probably a lot greater than oh look i've just got the new whatever gadget you know right yeah because for us like we wake up in the morning and it's like oh, it's monday oh, i know. fucking like i gotta go to work and i can't believe how early it is yeah yeah, yeah. yeah i can't imagine just the blissfulness of being like i'm, I'm alive, alive. <laughs> yeah, like yeah. you're literally happy to be alive um so tell me this too. Everybody's talking about you know J.J. Abrams. You're talking about Star Wars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you in the Star Wars movie? I've been on set. And you have. I, yeah, and I. Are you a Star Wars fan? I'm a huge Star Wars. So that's got to be very exciting. Uh, it was a kind of a bizarre sort of wish fulfillment thing. To uh, of course, you know, he's filming it in the UK and the the Pinewood Studios where they're shooting the movie is is. 25 minutes drive from me i of course i was going to go down and see my friend mm -hmm. oh you happen to be shooting a film <laughs> uh it, it, it it's extraordinary and i'm very excited and, and in true deference to jj's sort of uh you know um keen sense of secrecy i won't tell you a word but it does look wonderful and i can i, I know people are desperate for information but just sit it out wait for next christmas you won't be disappointed that's why he casts his friends exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's like yeah <laughs> Opie with Jim Norton. My mom, not to be too do much it. of a downer, but she, do she do had the it. worst do death it. I've seen to do this it. day. Your mom did? Oh yeah, yeah. That's it? why I'm. That's why I do palliative medicine uh, because her death was. They did everything wrong. Nobody knew how to make her better, and she was begging to to leave this world when she died. What so, she have? Cancer. Yeah, she had stomach cancer. Oh. It was a weird kind called linitis plastica. Oh, and God. Uh, oh, geez. She had, uh, uh, like, four different diverting ostomies where, you know, she'd had bowel obstruction, so she had four different colostomies and, uh, and small bowel just, you know, oozing and just puking up fecal matter and just, you know, and, and they were doing all the wrong things for her. And uh, when I had the one talk on end of life care that it, it, because we don't get that you know that that's one of the other things about this is boring okay sorry <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Oh God, I'm, I'm, in a, I'm, I'm in a room with a bunch of doctors and nurses, and I'm cursing. But he actually, it, I'm sorry. It was terrible. Well, think about it, though. We go from non-life to life. And we call that birth, and we have parties, and we have three different medical sure, specialties. Sure. Right. And then you go from life to non-life, and there's me. And there's you know, right. there's how sad. Me. So how many how many times have you cursed your mom because of her death? You have to watch many many people die, basically. Yeah. Well, I just didn't want anybody else's mom to go through what mine did. Good know? for you. 
you know, there don't you say go. I was called to do it, so it's... it's don't say sorry. Good. Jesus, it's just a quick, dumb joke. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. It was actually fascinating, so... I'm sure. So I guess... <laughs> I'm sure. When, you're, when your mom died, they just didn't know as much as they do now as far right. as hospice care and all that. Right. Yeah, no, there was no such... We did, we'd never heard of hospice. I mean, mm. the first hospice in this country started in 1967, so it's a relatively new thing to this to this country. And it was only in the last, say, 10 years that it it completely covered the whole country where there's, you know, everybody has access to hospice care. And, uh, you know... Ah, <laughs> Oh, bird. <laughs> Can you look at Mr. Snuffleupagus, Sam, please? <laughs> yeah, come please. on, let's hear it. <laughs> right there. Oh, I can hear it. Yeah, Oscar has some Oscar has some fluid in his garbage yeah, no, can. Pl- play one voice of Snuffleupagus. Is there any voice over his like, hey, bird. Here we go. telling you, when he talks, I hear it, the... Hi, bird. I like to visit all the dead people <laughs> on Sesame Street. <laughs> I told Oscar he's got lymphoma. Damn you, Brewer. I want to stand there with your last breath. Oh, the Cookie Monster's got type 2 diabetes. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, here oh, wait, comes. He's on ABC. Wait. Here's a uh, snuffle. Oh, look. It's not a figment of your imagination, people. The one and only Snuffle up against. And Snuff, we've had so many this. of the Sesame Street gang here throughout the years. Oh. This is your first time. Wow. Well, I thought it was time to finally meet my hero. George Stephanopoulos. <laughs> mm-hmm. Hey, Io, you think Snuffer. You've made a whole generation of a kids. A newer Snuffer. Yes, it is a new one. Oh, this is a, we need like, like a, a nineteen Snuffy. We need like the 80s, 70s. Yeah, that's like late uh, 70s. new Fred Flintstone. That's not the right thing. Hey, Barney. Uh, right. yeah, I'm telling you, it is that. It's that. Hey, bird. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Stan, why do you keep finding the new Snuffer off Because you like them. What the fuck is the matter with you? Yeah. Snuffer off It's Eric Nagel. Angelo in Westchester. Angelo, greatest American hero. Liked it or no? Yeah, hey, I was uh, I was a big fan of it too. I used to watch it almost. How old, we, how old are you, Angelo? I'm in my forties. You're in your forties. So yeah, so all right. So you like you were you were how old when the show was out? I was starting my teens. I was like twelve or thirteen when I started watching the show. The guy would fuck up all the time. The suit worked by his brain waves. The thing happened. It, it lasted for two three seasons, and then all of a sudden it jumped the shark when. All of a sudden, they had the the. They changed the, the suit. The, they bedazzled it. Like what happened? No, the sh- the, the suit. The, the the aliens That's came funny. back down again to visit, <laughs> and they gave him the instruction booklet again, and then he fucked it up and he lost it again. You he lost the instruction book twice. He Is that how the series book? ended? Yeah, the, basically the season lasted. The, the season lasted for another half season after that thing because basically it, it got stupid after a while. He couldn't <laughs> yeah, after, after a while. while. <laughs> yeah, <seriously. laughs> he couldn't. He couldn't figure out how to how to jump and fly. Every time he tried to fly, he would you know basically crash into walls. Was there sound and, effects like boink and stuff while oh, yeah, he was like, hitting things? You know, oh. you, you're talking the '80s shit, you know. So you know they try to, to they try to entertain it, but perhaps you change your mind about the song. This might help. If you want to, you know, really get into the whole mood of this whole thing here, I think I'm going to go home and watch this and have a great Saturday night. You <laughs> should. <laughs> this is perfect binge watching on Netflix. Ugh. How how long was it? it? Was like a half hour? I'm guessing it had to have been a half Angela, hour. Hang on one second. It's an hour show. It was an hour. An hour show. Well, I don't remember it being an hour. And I think Robert Culp was actually a CIA agent, not an FBI agent, so he couldn't really. All right, so we went from cop to FBI to CIA. Yeah, yeah he worked like for that. some sort of three-lettered government agency. Absolutely, stonecutters. You know, and then after a while, it just kind of got boring because it was like the same thing. You know, drug dealers, terrorists, and all that. And then you know, it kind of got frustrating because did he fight the Russians? Because this was the eighties. Yeah, this was the 80s, so he was going after the Soviets and all that crap. But, you know, after a while, it kind of just lost its luster. And he was, you know, he had this girlfriend who he couldn't tell, and there was all this other crap. So Right. Uh, you know, Pam, I think her show. name was. Yeah, I can't remember the lady. lady's That's real name. Mary- Pam. 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 That's an 80s name. Yeah. Hey, Pam. Pam is never sexy. All right, boys. <laughs> all right, <laughs> thank you, Angelo. Pam. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of people calling to support this show. This might be your binge watch for the Is weekend. Any, are anybody um, on the line? I th- uh, I th- anybody th- on the line in their early thirties? 
Or from like like thirty two and under. Anybody born in like nineteen eighty? I don't no, know. I wonder if there's anyone on the line who's like seventy, who was like thirty <laughs> and watching this when it came out in the eighties. Let's, yeah. let's go down south to Mississippi and talk to Clint. Clint. D Rock. Hey man, how are you doing? What's up, buddy? I think I remember how he lost the uh, instruction booklet. He had struck himself down while he was holding the book. Then he sets the book down and he makes himself big again. And the book was sitting on a uh a pebble or something. And that's how I think the uh the whole thing ended. You've sold me. I'm right. definitely watching this show If now. that was the premise of losing the book, I might be losing this argument <laughs> about Greatest American Hero. Because I, I don't remember how he lost the book. Like, and that's actually starting to win me over on the show. <laughs> the Jim Norton Advice Show. Jeff in Canada thinks he has a sex addiction and has a girlfriend, but he can't keep himself from cheating. Oh, no, you naughty boy. Hi, Jeff. Hey, Jimmy. Hey, buddy. I've had this girl for about four years, and... Um, what happened was, for the first three years, we sort of stopped having sex, and, and that was fine with me. Well, sort of fine with me. Um, but then I decided that I needed to have sex, and um, I discussed it with her, and she wouldn't let me go out and find it any other way. So um, I did anyway. And But now I'm into such crazy shit that it's, it's almost scary. What are you into that's crazy? Um, trannies. Um... That whole slave um, stuff, you know, like choking a girl to unconsciousness, that kind of shit. Oh, wow. You like to choke a girl out, huh? Well, I didn't know I did. And she wanted this. My oh, girlfriend okay. isn't into that at all. And that's the problem. Like, we, like I said, we stopped having sex for about three years. And uh, we're start we just started to have, we went to sex therapy and everything else. And we just started actually to have sex again. But like for the summertime, I think we had sex twice. All Why the are you with this girl? I absolutely love her. Then why don't you have sex? What is what is it about you two that doesn't click sexually? Uh, we're just so opposite. She, like she she's so missionary, like very vanilla kind of sex. Like I remember we were having sex one time, and I just went to move, and I pulled her hair a little bit with my hand, and she goes, "Oh, hair, hair," you know that kind of stuff. It's like yeah. Uh, here's what I think. First of all, you probably are a sex addict if you think you are. Here's the problem I've run into. When I'm, I'm dating girls who I love, and sexually they're very normal and healthy, and I'm twisted, so we, we don't come close to being compatible. Sometimes what happens is we're both a little wrong. Like the girlfriend needs to kink it up a little bit, and I need to come way back down because my reasons for wanting these different things are not only – I'm not saying you should compromise who you are sexually, but a lot of times I'm just grabbing and reaching for anything because I'm acting like an addict. So if you're doing it, like, say you like, uh, hey, I like my nipples played with and she won't lick my nipples. To me, liking your nipples played with or liking your ass played with is not a, you know, a sexual addiction thing that you need help with. But if you're going from transsexuals and you're only liking them because they're sexual objects and you're into choking and then you're into this, it's almost like grabbing for one piece of candy, then another piece of candy and then a brownie and then cake. It's just, it's almost greed. It's almost, I'm always looking for something new to satisfy this fucking dopamine crazy, craving. So that to me is where I need to come back down to earth. Any of those things on their own are okay. You can like kinky hardcore sex. But if it, if it keeps changing and there's, there keeps being all these new things that I like and these new things that I need to achieve that level normal, uh, which I expressed I got from Mike Tyson, um, then maybe you need to address it in a sexual addiction uh, way. You know what I mean? Absolutely, but the thing is, I have a, a girl for each one of those sexual addictions. Addictions. Like I got the one girl that likes to be slapped and choked, and I got the one girl that likes to be like um, just up the ass, always rough sex. Sure. That, that kind of stuff. And so it's 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 like I have. I'm a kid in a candy store, almost. You know, I, I get what I want, and I. But it's not fair. Do you feel guilty that you're cheating on her? I I do I do now in a bit because. Before, when she wasn't having sex with me, I felt I deserved to have sex, and, and so this this is okay. And but now that she well sort of is having sex with me, I feel a little bit guilty. So I've been you know, I made up an expression little... once: "Idle time is the devil's playground." You know what you might want to do? Or idle hands, whatever. I stink at expressions. You know what you might want to do if you're concerned about it, and you think like, "Fuck, something's wrong here." Because if you have all those different balls, you're juggling. Something is going to go wrong sooner or later. It always 
does. Something yeah. happens and you're going to get caught. You're going to slip up and get caught. Why don't you give yourself, like, like, try some sexual addiction therapy and, like, see if you can come back to normal. And believe me, I'm talking to myself as I say this. See if you can come back down to earth a little bit. And then you might be surprised, like, wow, maybe I don't like all of these things I think I like. I'm only doing them out of need to serve an addiction. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, some of it you may like, but you may only like 40 or 50% of what you think you need. And of that 40 yeah. or 50%, you may be able to get her to do 25 or 30% of it. Like, you know what I mean? Or half of it. You may be able yeah. to get her to do half of the stuff that you actually, as a sexual being, want her to do. Well, I'm almost scared to ask her if she's into this kind of stuff because you might think I'm some sort of pervert. You know what I mean? Like, well, you are. Her- you are a fucking pervert. Want- so what? But I don't want her to think I'm a pervert. Well, would you rather have her live in a lie? What, do you want to fuck twice over the summer? What are you afraid of? <laughs> You want your ass played with? You want to lick her ass? Just ask her. Or do it a little bit. Or if she went, ow, 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 hair. Okay, she doesn't like her hair pulled. So try a different tact. But I think the problem is you need to get your girlfriend to kink it up a little bit more. And you need to find out what it is you really like. Because if you're just running around grabbing for anything with a pussy or tits, and you're acting like an addict, I deep down think that you don't even know what it is you like as a sexual being. And I don't even know what I like as a sexual being. Some of what I do, what I do, what I've done, I like, and some of it is purely out of just feeding the monster. It, you know what I mean? It doesn't mean that that's who I am. So you might want to try to find out exactly what it is you actually like first, all right? Absolutely, Jimmy. Good luck, buddy. Sam Roberts Friday Show. So Utopia is this show. They uh, they call it an, a, an experiment. Okay. They say uh, we've got all these people here. Let me play you a clip of the intro. Okay. And it will kind of explain uh, what the show, what they're trying to sell the show as. Listen to this, Ira. Imagine throwing off the shackles of convention and conformity. Imagine what it would be like to start your own world with your own rules. For 15 pioneers, that dream has become a reality. Welcome to Utopia. So they get 15 people really? from all walks of life. Yeah, oh, yeah, from all walks of life. Well, that's the thing. It's like it really gives us... It's not that they just took 15 different stereotypes. They just took a, a, a smattering of, of civilization. Yeah. <laughs> and they cre- they locked them all... They, they have like five acres or something. And they fenced the whole thing off. They have some cattle. They have cattle. They have chickens. They have a barn. Okay. They have a river. Yeah. And they say, you're starting your own society. It's your rules. You pick everything. They found the angriest of angry black guys. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Are they he's just, him? He's just did did they look very hard? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. See. Listen, listen, to, uh, listen to this dude. My name is Dave Green, a.k.a. Fifth Ave Dave, son of a prostitute. <laughs> I, ne- I love Dave. Oh. He's a regular Richard Pryor. <laughs> And he's sitting wow. there. He's like, he's like, he's that guy who takes pride in it. He's like, I don't let my past define me. <laughs> you just did. Son of a prostitute. <laughs> Son of a prostitute. <laughs> I never seen my dad not once in my life. Been a felon since I was 17. Peddling crack, selling weed. I came home from prison homeless. I was broke, fresh out of jail. I paroled to a shelter. I want to show the world that ex-convicts and felons can make a change. This is going to be the fresh start I've been looking for ever since I got out of prison. There it is. (laughs) That guy guy would win last comic standing. (laughs) Just backstory alone. It's the same bravery. (laughs) I don't quite understand why y'all are laughing right now. I I always bring up don't commit suicide, but uh, I don't see why this guy never did. Yeah, yeah. it doesn't sound like he's had a very uh, good go of it. Every situation he gets in, it's like a little kid who got his ball taken away and he runs <laughs> over and he pops it. I know some extremely poor black people. I've never heard of any black person being like that. All right, well, listen, listen, who could you? We barely scratched the surface with this guy. Come so, on. Everybody at the beginning of this there's show. There's more to him. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there's more. Oh, there's more. There's like six more parts. <laughs> everybody at the beginning Come of this on. show. They show up in a barn, and they have crates, and they put all their stuff into crates. And the first thing they do is they learn all of your boxes. The only things that you can take with you have to fit in this big box, and everything that's in the little crates can't fit in the big box. So you now, as a group, have to decide. And in his first moment, 
to really bust through stereotypes and prove that everybody deserves a second chance. And just because you're once a felon doesn't mean you're always a felon. I think he was... Uh, well, successful, but I'll let you be the judge. Oh, this is him finding out that he's not being able to take all of this stuff with him. I think one bow is okay. And I say bring bow. Right. Yeah, bring bow. What the f is going on? What the f is this, this clown going on? What the f is this? I was under the impression that all my f was coming. I'm not jacking that. Don't get too upset. I'm not jacking that. You're going to regret not having anything, though. I'm not digging this. I'm sorry. I'm not digging this. I don't care. Now I got to make more choices. I'm not jacking that. The whole Wait, can, we, can I ask a question? Yeah. So the, the actual definition as he is using jacking is like, I'm not feeling that? Like, I'm I don't not know. okay with that? He's not stealing that. It's a great question. Yeah, that's what I thought. Oh, the stealing. No, I think but it, why it would he say he's that? not feeling well, that. I, yeah. I, I lost, you know, I'm going to wait for a while now. Right. <laughs> That sounds, like, that sounds more like Rikers terminology than New York. I'm yeah, not, it's, it's got to yeah. be because I was walking around the rest of the night in yeah. my house. Like, Jess would be like, like Sam, you want uh, you want me to fix you some uh, fries with dinner? I'm not jacking that, Jess. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not jacking that. Not tonight. Opie with Jim Norton. Who is he? I know, I know his face. He reminds me of the character in the new film, in the new uh, series I'm writing. So I can't like the. the You're lead, writing a series. The lead detective, yeah. Don't ask him. Oh yeah. What's, what's the about? He's writing a detective. Well, why'd you ask him? I didn't know you were. Yeah. What? Detective Bill Doolittle. <laughs> Bill Doolittle. <laughs> why? Is, it a, is it a comedy of errors? <laughs> no, it's a, it's a drama. His name is Detective Bill Doolittle, and his big line is, "Don't let the last name fool you." Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. I can see that on a bum, poster. Bum, bum, bum. It's not of a bus in New York City. You like that? It's I'm really good. I'm never going to watch that program. <laughs> Why? It sounds exciting. <laughs> mm, it sounds horrible. <laughs> I may not know who did this, but I will. Another line from... Uh, is that what Detective Doolittle says? Detective Bill Doolittle. Do Don't little. let the last name fool you. <laughs> Doolittle, you really done it this time. Hand in your gun. Yeah. It's not that hacky. I would never do that type of stuff. He has no, <laughs> <laughs> he has no problem with the chief. Oh. He doesn't? Nope. You're not going to have that famous scene where you have to hand in your gun? No, he actually gets along great with the chief because they trade pornographic photos of children. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Is network? Yeah. yeah. ABC. Mm. So do the, do the criminals ever take for granted that he was not going to do a lot? They do because they let the last name fool them. They do, <laughs> and that's the last time. You shouldn't let the last name fool you. That's what he says when he throws the cuffs on them. Ah, do little. Uh, yeah, I got good news and bad news, and they say, "What's that?" The good news is the crime's been solved. The bad news is, and you hear the clink of the cuffs. <laughs> you're going away. Did you ever say you're going up the river? No, it just says you're going away. Up the river is too old school. Nice. <laughs> Look forward to this. Yeah, where, it's gonna be good. Where does it take place? That's no secret. Why? <laughs> you gotta, you gotta pick a, a, a quality city for this. Columbus, Ohio. Columbus, Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> One other thing about the NFL. Uh huh. Pepsi <gasps> is mad at the NFL. Why? What did what they do to Pepsi? Pepsi isn't going anywhere. <laughs> they make a lot of fucking money with the NFL. Ka -ching, They're ka -ching. partners. Absolutely. They're it's not all about this. <laughs> He's making a money gesture with his face. I fingers. see that. <laughs> The best they could do is say, we're mad, because nothing will change. Anheuser-Busch did the same thing. They're mad, but the, nothing's going to change. Why the, are they mad? Because of all the dirty talk. And and how, <laughs> because of all the dirty talk. And, and how they're, they're handling their dirty laundry. Yeah. Coca-Cola's actually happy with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Every, every new can of Coke there has a black eye painted on it. <laughs> LOL after it. It's very inappropriate. Yeah, you think if Pepsi... Does some stupid like pull all their advertising from um, the NFL that Coke wouldn't slide right the fuck in? Of course. Yeah, of course they would. A Shasta or some other high profile bet. <laughs> Shasta in every <laughs> fucking football. <laughs> the tab yeah. people will be all over that. Absolutely. That just wouldn't look right. That just would look so weird. Yeah. Royal yeah. Crown with the NFL. RC, yeah. Mm, but right. I and mean, that Arizona Cardinal player arrested. Yeah, that's right. the guy. Bring me a seltzer. That's high on the lime. That's today's guy. <laughs> every day there's gonna be a guy for a while. Yeah, there's gonna or be every just... other day anyway. But there why, you go. why? Why do they got these? Why can't they just have a good time and play the game? It's fun. Yeah. And you know, why do you gotta be so potty mouthed about it all? It's gonna be a long day. Is that Fran Tarkenton? No, no, that's Detective Bill Dillon. <laughs> no, that's <laughs> <laughs> the last name, please. <laughs> It's going to be a long day. Uh, 
He says like, that before commercial break. Right before the opening uh, credits? Is yeah. He, is he undercover? Or is he wearing a uniform? No, he's, he's in a suit, but you know. Anybody that wants to hit a woman or a kid, why do you hit me first? What? They're football players. Detective Bill Doolittle said oh. that. Oh. <laughs> and the pilot. <laughs> That's right. He's so, very, he's very topical. topical. Yeah. 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 He says it to a guy who's already moment. been arrested. <laughs> Um, well, the NFL's got a fucking problem on their they hands. They sure do. Because everyone's watching them. This is big. Nothing worse than when everyone's watching you. Oh, yeah. Then they start doing things they don't believe in or want to do whatsoever. People are going to, yeah, people are going to pull, people will pull advertising if it gets worse. Yeah. Uh, not the biggies, though. Yeah. Anybody that wants to hit a woman or a kid, why do you hit me first? What? They're football players. Detective Bill Doolittle said oh. that. Oh. <laughs> and the pilot. <laughs> That's right. He's so, very, he's very topical. topical. Yeah. 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 He says it to a guy who's already moment. been arrested. The Joe Rogan Experience. What kind of storylines were you planning? Did you? I know you did. I know you thought about it. Absolutely. Absolutely. I wrote a, I wrote a, a great storyline where you know Brock Lesnar, in the, in this past WrestleMania, he beat the Undertaker. In oh, a, no. he, the Undertaker's had a streak at WrestleMania. He never loses at WrestleMania. He was 21-0 and zero all time at WrestleMania. 21 years he had never lost. And this match against Brock Lesnar, it, sort of, it was sort of set up so everybody just assumed the Undertaker would win. And then in a stunning move, <gasps> Brock, towards the end of it, ends up beating The Undertaker for the three count. You want to see something funny, look that up. Reaction shots no. of the audience. No, don't do that. Okay. But this audience was <laughs> stunned. It's people you, just like... You know what else could stun dropped. that audience? A fucking simple card trick. Oh, come on. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> Listen, Not to do code red. Dude, you're, you're fucking being <laughs> silly as shit. Okay. It's, it's all planned out. It's obvious. It's not obvious. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely not. If it's planned out, you why would it be obvious? You told me what was going to happen. I know what's going to happen. That's me, Joe. That's not the arena. That's not the arena. It's not everybody in the arena was offered a full-time one-year writing job with the... They right. don't know what's going to happen. So you're an expert in pro wrestling, essentially. I've watched my whole... It was sort of like my replacement for not having a dad when I was a kid. Like, I would just sit there and watch these the, these storylines and these guys do no. all this crazy stuff every Saturday. No, I'm getting Saturday. sad. Well, it's I'm sad now. It was my dad replacement. You totally bummed me out. <laughs> you were, Superfly Snooker was your dad. Pretty much. Superfly was one of the biggest things. I mean, that's what I was doing off of couches in my tidy whities when I was a tiny little boy. Bob Backlund. I remember Bob Backlund, the, the creator of the cross-faced chicken wing. <laughs> Which is a great move, man. How much fucking time have you invested in this? You should get paid by this. You uh -huh. should seriously consider, seriously consider taking that job. Uh, no. I would say no to anybody else. But you... You like that shit so much. You've always got those fucking books around. Like he reads <laughs> books on the business of pro wrestling. We're on a fucking plane, and I look over. There's people reading self help books. Some folks are reading novels. Tony H is got a fucking book with the the sex and Se politics, sex of, lies and headlocks. The yeah. true unauthorized bio of Vince McMahon. What the fuck are you doing? <laughs> reading awesomeness about a guy who took a, a joke of a show and turned it into a billion dollar enterprise and wrote it all himself and is the main you should creator. write a book on pro wrestling dude you Maybe. should write a book a love affair pro wrestling <laughs> a love about? affair from tony hinchcliffe my wife hates me uh johnny uh from uh, los angeles has been doing stand-up for 13 years what he's saying uh, yeah, is he can't wanna... get out he can't get ahead he's stuck in the open mic he's not saying he's he saying one. he doesn't he's a good he's a good middle act but he, but he doesn't he... want to do what's necessary is that what you're saying no like, you don't he's kiss stuck. Yeah, no, like for instance if you go to the comedy store right even yeah. though you know you have to you know even though you have a lot of years experience and you ask them and they've seen you and you're like can i not do the open mics can i just do the two in the morning spots or something like that they just look at you like, well, you don't come down here enough. And I'm like, well, if I came down here enough, I wouldn't be the comic I am. I, I've done a lot of stuff outside of Los Angeles, not in Hollywood, like at the Improv and right. Factory. Oh, he's not. So I would be. I so they look at me as a person who's not just starting out, but just like. Well, uh, LA's yeah. always had that problem too. I mean, because um, I lived there for a long time, but they they sort of think like if you're out there performing for regular people, there's something very icky. Yeah. About that, so they yeah. don't give you any credit for going out and. Even when there's an open mic at a club, I'm like, why would I sign up? I just expect to be put 
on. And sometimes they put you on at the end, like, oh, John, yeah, you can go up. Well, but here's the thing. I can't make a living. I can't make a fucking living. Well, here's it's the like thing. I got to go on the road or something. Yes, well, you go yes. on the road for Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and you hang in L.A. Yeah. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Nobody gives yeah. a fuck about L.A. on the weekend anyhow. Right, that's nobody, true. Nobody gives a fuck what you do on the weekend. So you lit in L.A. All the, rich, all the shows out here are like bringer shows. During the week, a lot of times, anyway, and on the weekend, you know, you have people like, you know, you yourself or Patrice or whoever comes here, and then they take Bill Burr, they take the whole weekend, and then yeah, but no, but you can go do spots at. There's a million places in L.A. That's what I'm not doing. I admit myself. Well, then go and go do it. Go hang out, and then Thursday, Friday, Saturday, you can work Seattle, San Francisco, Arizona, Las Vegas. All these places are within, within whatever. You know, for some reason, I feel like I can walk up to Rich Voss because. I don't know. He just seems cool. He's probably the worst Maybe one. I don't think He's I the could meanest. I walk up to you. He's a person. I, I, would, I would be able Listen, to... Listen, if somebody's a comic, I will fucking talk to them. Me too. And, always, and Rich always even makes fun of me for it. Because I... But I don't help the, comics. The comics are the only people that I feel comfortable talking to. So I if you came up and were like, hey, blah, 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 and then you were like, I'm a comic, I would instantly relax. And you're part yeah. of the There are certain people that I, yeah. when I first started... I know you got to take I know you got to take other calls, but I just want to call this motherfucker out, this guy, Ari Shapur. I know you're friends with him. I did a showcase. I got a showcase of the comedy store, and uh-huh. he was the MC. And I was talking about my military career, and I was, you know, being a little, I don't know if it was like Lenny Bruce or something, but uh, it was just, it wasn't like happy comedy. And this motherfucker gets up after my showcase and says, I'm sorry to the whole audience. And it took me so much not to go, I went up to him, I said, motherfucker, if you ever do that again when I'm on stage, I'm going to fucking kill you. I just couldn't. I see. That's my problem. I, that's probably why I'm never going to make. I'm it. not sure I understand what happened. Uh, what happened is this guy went on, well, no, I went and then up, Ari went on and trashed him. Oh. I didn't do like a fucking happy fucking set about jerking off. I mean, I'm in my 40s. I'm not going to be like him or Bobby Lee is very funny down there. But you know, Ari Shaffer, he thinks you know he just comes off. He's just a cut. He didn't. After my set, it wasn't bad. He didn't have to go. I'm sorry. That's just. A, I can't take that shit. You're well, if you don't like him, like, messages. I'm right. just fucking. You, if you don't like somebody, you don't like him. What the fuck? I like him. He doesn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? I don't like Bonnie. A lot of people like Bonnie. That's how it goes. Yeah. Opie with Jim Norton. When I mean, you grow up like Pat and I did, <laughs> just doing some uh, the drug dealing and stuff. I sold hash to a girl named Tanya once. Did you really? It's my drug dealing experience. For real? Yeah. One time, a girl with giant breasts named Tanya. I sold her like a ten dollar piece of hash. Were you? Uh, were you? Uh, were you in the business there? That was my beginning and end of my drug. That was day. it. That was it. So you didn't really have a trap or anything? Nope. No. No. Nothing. No. No trap. No. What was your drug name for one day? J Rock. <laughs> <laughs> I was J Rock. I was slinging hash. <laughs> slinging hash for yeah. one one day. Put it in a little tin foil. So you didn't. You never sold the whole set. No, I didn't sell a whole set. <laughs> no, just one time. Yeah, just J Rock in the house sold a little bit of hash to Tanya with big tits. And that was it. That was it. Why did your why why did your uh, your drugging end? I didn't your want drug that life. End. I didn't want that life, son. No. No, I saw what was going to happen to my kids, <laughs> and I said I got to get out of this life because who knows where this leads. <laughs> right. Did you really sell hash one time? One time, it's been a one deal, one day deal. Why? What? What's the backstory? I think she wanted some, and I could get it, or I had some that I wanted to smoke, but I was so attracted to her and her giant tits that uh, I just decided to sell it to her. Right. It was ten or seven dollars. I don't remember. Probably ten bucks. I smoked uh, hash as a freshman at Geneseo. I, I I don't have a recollection anymore, but I remember at the time I really liked it. I yeah. liked it more than pot for whatever reason. It had a weird taste to it. Sweeter smell. Yeah. You, so you did hash as well. Yeah. How, you know, how, how hard were your drugs? Nah, I you know hash, cocaine, uh, cocaine. pop. You know, I, I liked alcohol the best. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, back in my days of, you know, <laughs> as J Rock. Yeah, as J Rock. Slinging, you know. Yeah. I knew that this life couldn't last. Did you do it on a corner at least? I don't remember where I gave her the uh, the uh, the drugs. <laughs> I don't remember where we did the deal. Why are your eyes getting wide? She might have paid me in advance. Yeah. I think she paid me in advance. You, you wanted to get some, right? Yeah, I, at that age, I, didn't even, I was still a virgin. I wanted her just to like me. Mm-hmm. She did not. She just grabbed uh, the hash and ran, and you never saw her again? No, she was in my class. I think she was nice. I would see her on school. 
But, um, you know, I don't remember anything else about her. She probably smoked it with a guy she was fucking. Not me. That sucks. No. So. But, you know, my life was probably too dangerous for her. <laughs> of course. She probably didn't want to get mixed up with the likes of J-Rock. <laughs> she wanted uh, something different for her herself and her unborn kids. Yeah, she wanted her future to be brighter than sure, mine was. Headed course. down the path I was headed down. I got it. I, I got my it. tango. Like, she knew. She knew? Yeah. One look at you and she knew. Yeah, she knew I was trouble. This isn't for me. Absolutely not. She knew that J-Rock was headed down a dangerous road. Will there be a J-Rock book? Probably, but nobody would believe my stories. You should you should do a J Rock book, and it's, it has to be two hundred and fifty pages on selling hash one time to a girl you wanted to have sex with. Yeah, that was you. You just wanted a date and hug, right? But I was just I, I could spend like chapters on just the unimportant details. We know a few people in Hollywood. Why don't we you know write up a treatment for a movie? Fuck yeah, J Rock. <laughs> Fucking J Rock. Hand her the thing. I, I could even like just we film different ways of me handing off the drugs. Like, do I hand it to her with my palm open, or do I just kind of cup it and slip it to her? In the hallway. I don't remember where we had, the deal went down. You, well, you got to know that detail for the movie. I know I do. I'll have okay. to make it up. All right. <laughs> I'll do something like whatever. Yeah. I'll make it clandestine. <laughs> you know, like I called it a fucking a bomb threat when they were all outside. Me and her did the deal. And the then gym. you did the one deal, one deal yeah. only. In the movie, I fuck her. You do? Oh, yeah, in the movie. Is that the ending? Yeah. Nice. That's the movie ends with me kneeling nice. behind her, slamming her pussy, right. and like, like fucking putting my fist up in the air while I'm wearing a burgundy fur kango. Beautiful. It's going to be a big movie. Well, that's a perfect ending. Yeah, Who plays you, you think? Who plays J-Rock in the movie? Caprio, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Johnny Depp. Right. Yeah. And who plays the broad? Scarlett Johansson. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 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 so I think she'll play the J-Rock story. <laughs> okay. Sam Roberts Friday Show. I feel like less of a person than than I should. I was up at 3 o'clock in the morning. Sam, <laughs> come on, dude. I didn't even need a phone. I was up at 3 o'clock in the morning. Okay, my show starts at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Damn. I was up at 3 o'clock in the morning at the Apple Store website, hitting that reload button. Like, what, what's going on? I'm disappointed. What's going on? My Lord. I mean, just so I can pre-order a phone, no. I know by the time I hold it in my hand, I'll go, this is preposterously big. This is way too big. Which one you got? The big giant one? I'm, the yeah, yeah I'm, I, I want the big one. The 6 Plus. The Apple Store website didn't load up on time. So it's like 3 o'clock in the morning. It's probably crashed. And everybody was like, oh, well, it's midnight, but it's midnight Cupertino time. Right. <laughs> just that I know what Cupertino is. No, I even I know that. I'm not terribly bright. Yeah. Yeah. Because I'd agree with that. Did you go to sleep or did you, or did you, like, did you no. stay up all night or did you set an alarm? I went to sleep and set an alarm. I interrupted my sleep. Wow. Well, 3 a.m. I was on xvideos.com. I was not <laughs> trying to buy no dumbass phone as damn sure ain't going to be. Yo, the one I got now uh -huh. is a piece of shit. It is. <laughs> so now you're killing yourself, waiting online, waiting to re, you know, pre order. Yeah. Looking dumb like yeah. Asian. Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. And when you get it, the shit don't work. There's no fucking, there's no reception. People hack in, they find all my nude photos. Yeah, right. It's like, come on, man. This is all a fuck. It's like, they're, they're digital drug dealers over there. They are. I watched that video when they launched this phone, and I said, it's worth staying up till 3 o'clock in the morning if it means I will more quickly have the option of going down to Subway and just tapping my phone on the cash register. <laughs> Don't worry, no wallet for me. I got the Apple wallet. Tap, tap. Fucker. Thanks for the BLT. Like, what? Can I tell you something? I went down to Subway today mm -hmm. and used a credit card. Yeah. It was still super fast. <laughs> they just had to swipe the card. Yeah. They said, do you want a receipt? I was like, no. I'm good. That's what I'm, cool. but, but that's what I'm saying. They always say it's faster, blah, blah, blah. But yeah. right now, my shit is frozen. I got so much <laughs> sex shit. I got mad but sex But that's videos. your fault. You know how much times I film bitches when I'm fucking up? Now, <laughs> it's frozen. I can't even call my moms. You can't get, 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 my, get my part ready tonight. Your mom's like, you never call me anymore, who kid? And you say, I'm... Because my shit is frozen. It's I, bullshit I, as Apple and phone. And you know whatever phone this, you know, this phone that you were waiting online for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah on the internet. Yes, on the internet. I mean, you know that there's going to be a brand new charger that you need. So all your other chargers you're going to have to throw. So if you do get this phone, you can kiss those old chargers goodbye. What are you doing? Who's that? Is that Shaniqua? Alright, he got his phone off, uh... 
Can't believe you came. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so that's what's uh, yeah. You see what I'm saying? So yeah. I'm filming all this fucking sex shit every time I'm in Vegas. You know I fuck bitches every time. Every time. How much? And you're married, crazy. correct? Yeah. I'm Do fuck. It doesn't matter. It yeah. just doesn't matter. This has been OP Radio Accelerated. Looking back at all that was this week in the world of OP Radio at OP Radio and at Jim Norton on Twitter. And listen to all your favorite shows only here on OP Radio. Sirius 206, XM 103.